All right, so it's 11.15 p.m., August 3rd. We're going to read um, October 30th, 2015's post that I wrote, Sundial of the Psyche. This picture is by Robert Flood, who I looked in, like, I've read that he was associated with Francis Bacon in the translation and editing of the King James Version of the Bible. Um, but I've also, it's like, you'd think there'd be a little more information about that, but he definitely probably, just judging by their works, he probably worked close alongside Francis Bacon, or they definitely contacted each other. And John D, I know, and Francis Bacon, like John D taught Francis Bacon about the Hebrew alphabet. I think it was April, or no, August 12th. 1582, or August 11th, maybe, somewhere around there. Um, I've just been reading a lot and trying to piece together all the like little bits of who did what when. Um, the whole Sh Francis Bacon and Shakespeare controversy is it's funny because it's so obvious, but yet people are so in denial about it. Like, it's, it's, a, it's one of those, it's like almost like a micro, or I mean, back then it was probably like the made like a big conspiracy, but the whole question of how all this other obvious stuff cannot be seen or recognized. Um, it's a similar sort of thing, I think. But uh, so yeah, this sundial of the psyche, I'm going to end up reading some other stuff. Like I said, the computation of six at six, at least like some, a little bit of it. Um, I actually finally got that book, which is weird because I never thought I would. And uh, there's something definitely like going on with this liar, this liar like thing, L Y R E, not L I A R, uh, this liar like connectory thing. Like when you, t when I read about something or get into it, like there's connections. Um, like manifestations, resonances, and then this is post 60. And I didn't, when I was writing these, I did not count the numbers or anything. I think I've even like deleted a few, and so it scoot like scoots them. But I even talk about 60 in here, so and this whole the whole base 60 thing, that's why I have this uh synergetics pulled up by Buckminster Fuller. I actually have both books. Um, I I don't know why. Like the one of the bookstores by my house had a lot of his books. Like they don't anymore because I got them, but uh, they're all there. Not all of them. There's still some of some obscure ones that I don't have. But um, even though this, I freaking hate PDFs. Like as much as I love having the access, I don't like the editing of this. So I would definitely recommend getting the books as usual, as I usually say. But um, I could have swore I had it all the way at to the definition of synergetics um, or synergy. I'll get there. Um, but yeah, he talks about the 60 thing. Oh shit, I didn't mean to close that. Um, the I keep bringing this up in the last like three or four, two or three or four videos um but i haven't really read from it i just hope other people will so you'll know what i'm talking about but the meaning of the monus hieroglyphica and the other there's like a few other pdfs by this guy um i think his name is jim uh yeah jim egan but the reason i have this up and i'm talking about it is because it has everything to, everything to do with the cycles of how numbers like work cycles and fields um and in a lot of ways how buddhism and hinduism and taoism like certain eastern conceptions and concepts i guess uh parallel the mathematical like and the processes that are kind of described by this guy um so he 
this guy talks about the works of a few different people and kind of synthesizes it. Like Buckminster Fuller, especially. But this other guy, Bob Marshall, who talked about... Like, obviously, when you get into numbers, like, people get intimidated, I guess, by the fact that there's seemingly endless. But it's the pattern... It's the natural patterns that arise out of the field. And obviously, prime numbers have been, like, perplexing. Um, but even in here, it shows that there are patterns in, in the prime primes or primes and prime patterns. Um, and then again, figure at numbers and the figures that sometimes the primes make are in, important. Um, this number 252 is particularly important. And then again, 108, which obviously comes up in like Hinduism and the mala beads, like it just showed. But uh, again, anyway, like I'm just trying to go th through some of this. Um, the circle, though, the conventional circle of 360 degrees multiplied by 7. See, there's something about that. Because obviously all the other numbers divide evenly into 360, which seems, again, like an arbitrary like de designation for the circle. But there's something to it. And what I think it's all slowly getting to, like at least if you can conceptualize it and whatnot, what Buckminster Fuller tries to talk about with um, his base 60 system, it, it does have to do with like an incorporation of the understanding of time in and space, space and time or space time. And necessarily is going to be a, like a, syn um, a synthesis. So in a process. But so yeah, you'd have to like really read this. Um, this syndex it makes me think of like the memex. Um, but anyway, uh, John D. Like aside from obviously he wrote the pref one of the prefaces to Euclid's Elements. Um, so aside from his like occult background and connection which I think overshadows some of his other stuff. Like, it's just funny because the maps, he was a cartographer and was interested in the maps and like what the world was, looked like, and, you know, was. Um, and then the numerical fields, it's, it's just funny how way before there was ever computers, the digital aspect of things um was already like being picked up on and uh it's just crazy because when again when you tie in like this knowledge of this sort of these fields and the patterns and the resonances and then you can look into what each one actually corresponds with like it's almost like each one obviously the database it would be like every cell and yet each one is like a database um or a chamber or a cell but uh yeah there's some interesting numbers or like interesting things in this whole number thing and it pivots around some process happening i can't say like it's hard to pinpoint it because the one two and three and then the three four and five four five or Four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine. There's something happening like in the numbers. And six, seven, eight, nine. I think it was that last number I just mentioned in the last video, which is 2,520 doubled. 5040 is, um, yeah, 10 divided by 9 divided by 8 by 7. 7 times 8 times 9 times 10. And so it's basically where that se that seven, there's something to do with the seven being that fractional, even though they call it the perfect number, um, it causes the, when you divide it like seven and 22, for example, that pi approximation, 14, 28, 57, those come up in a lot of ways. It's basically the not three, six, and nine. And uh, the numbers that are not three, six, 
excluding three, six, and nine. And so there's something to all of this, like me talking about it is just like without really knowing what it's leading to makes it, I don't know. I know it makes it difficult to fucking understand. <laughs> Trust me, I know. But I know that there's something to it. Like I know it's all coming together. Um, the more I read all this and just re go back over it all. Um, Cause what this whole thing has to do with in like these larger numbers, it's pr ratios. And then ultimately like quantum, I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's weird, but that what that thing about 5,040 said about Plato, it's, I don't know, tells me that, yeah, it's like there's these processes at work on ma a scale of magnitudes. Um, so, yeah, I could just sit here and go on and on, but the 2,520, I mentioned that in the last post or whatever video and I didn't really go into it very much but I was actually reading E.W. Bullinger's uh, numbers in scripture and <clears throat> I was trying to like see if I could put references in my database for all the numbers but um got so much to do um he actually knows about this number it's mentioned somewhere in there <laughs> I don't I don't remember where but he mentions it and so it's just crazy like he knew someone he knows that there's something to that number it came up and then this guy is like I don't want to say freaking out about it but he's like there's something about this number and what it is though two fuck 20 uh the quarter and a half you know not half quarter and a whatever um, 25.2 as 252 is interesting. Um, obviously, because it's all just the, the ratios, but the fifth layer of closest packing of the spheres contains 252 spheres. So yeah, I kind of jumped way too into this, but there's definitely, there's definitely some interesting stuff to the, it's the cyclo, he calls it cyclo retrocity or just retrocity, um, the the reflection, the fact that the numbers reflecting have relations, like, um, and not just like sometimes it's not simple, sometimes it's in, into uh, intricate. But when you consider this whole thing, like it kind of does indicate that like we are tapping into something that's already there. Not like we're just creating it because it's almost like it's revealing itself mathematics that is in the various, like <laughs> the higher order processes, I guess, like in under sub the sub processes. But anyway, yeah. So the 3993, 1331. That's interesting. Um, see, I like I said, it's I could sit there and like I'm not even in d deeply like reading into this because I've already read a lot of it, but I'm just trying to remember like okay, what was it? I just know that that other book that I also haven't really shown but I've talked about and mentioned, The Ancient Secret, this In Search of the Holy Grail. Like a lot of it has to do with, in a sense, the same concept, but in a mythological lens and the whole concept of the lens being that like reflective, whatever mineral it is, like whether it's a glass, crystal, um, in a sense, the body and materiality and therefore the, the light of the mind. Like there's this mirror, not just a mirroring, but a lensing. And that whole, like what this showed, it really uses Buckminster Fuller's tie, bow tie, but then also the camera obscura concept, like the, his bow tie as a symbol for the camera, camera obscura concept. I don't know if I'll be able to find it. 
but uh what that is is just that well and then again the le the lens and the laser and then the whole concept of the silver screen and uh this technology the this the celluloid dream itself like is all concomitant in the sense again the fourth or the final hey the fourth aspect of tetragrammaton being the f fourth dimension um i keep like coming back to that and thinking what the hell does all this mean what does it represent what what is like the f uh you know the eon of mayot represent and like i don't think it's necessarily some like as much as they want it to be some far off thing like it's just funny i can't i can't help but think that it's like mayot is the field uh you know very much the matrix or the hold but um in that the, basically yeah like we're slowly just learning about it and see, obviously yeah maybe by the time we do fully understand it, it's going to be probably like an eon or so about an eon or so but um yeah it's just crazy how much the ancient ties in or lead leads up to and is it, like not just leads up to it and there you know now we're here it's like interlocking inter like i uh, i don't know how to expl explain it but like quantum overlay or what's it called uh imposition quantum imposition and the the past is very is like very much embedded in the present and that's why it's critical like what you know the function of the will essentially the whole what i've been trying to ex explain as what i see as 666's representation of being the magnetic energy center and the like obviously it's it's weird of a it's a weird concept but it is the mind or hufren in greek it's even buddhismos like i found etc 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 like it's all these things um and it just goes to show though that it's like that itself is a superimposition but there's cer certainly a process going on i don't know and so it's like that whole thing to me is like it's funny it's like a mirror a mirroring process it's very i don't know it's hard to find like the edges of things and yet they they're there like you know <laughs> Zeno's paradox but uh so yeah this freaking thing is deep like that's what I was trying to find that Bucky Buckminster Fuller tie thing and the double diamond or the double cone formula is also it comes up in a lot of different aspects of you know kenneth grant and really like the golden dawn concept or conception of rituals and whatnot anyway uh so yeah that's what i wanted to try to slowly t bring back up but um again there's so much to it and like for when you look at robert flood or robertus deflectibus uh his like sketches and drawings and I don't know, you know, and like obviously some of these other people's, like they were pretty freaking advanced with, you know, for what they had. Can't, probably like candlelight, you know. Here I am with freaking neon everywhere or whatever it is, fluorescent. Um, and I haven't even started this, so it's because I saw the mathematical circle and I was like, okay, I need to bring up that thing about the circle. So yeah, I went into that big old thing. I didn't even show you all the crazy ways in which 360, you know, can like do these weird things. But, you know, I, I think I probably already have. So just go watch all the... <laughs> anyway, I just need to read this. So the mathematical circle is a most apt symbol for balance and perfection, being as every point on the edge of its circumference is equally distant from the center. The circle, which again, so the mathematic like... The circle, and the funny thing about mathematics is how a lot of these things technically don't exist 
like the the perfect circle doesn't exist, but yet it's the this sort of like you know standard or whatever. It's just funny to me, like these concepts. The circle is the basis of geometric unfoldment as well as the Kabbalistic doctrine of emanations. Therefore, as such, it should contain mathematical keys to these dilemmas. These I have found and will present here in as a in as a basic a, a way as possible, in as basic a way as possible. So, uh, the more recent readers of this publication may better understand the systems being utilized, namely those of the Kabbalah and Gematria, namely Hebrew English, that is the formula or the Hebrew formula applied to English transliterated letters, which again is apparently too, too too big of a stretch of the imagination, but. The circle, when again you consider, well, I'll say this because I'll, I'll keep saying it just because even though I've said it, the Gimel and the Cheth, like Gimel, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, even though it's G, but yet Camel is C, and it's that's what Gimel means. If you consider Gimel and Cheth as being potential values for C when you like cal calculate things, um, especially given that circ like C's can make different sounds. The circle with the tau and then a cheth and a gimel, um, or gimel and cheth, whichever. Hey, hey, gimel, uh, yod, resh, cheth, lamed, hey, it's 666. And so again, even though it's 360, 666, which we'll see, is related to the base 60 sis system, or really base si 6, Sex, uh, sexagesimal and sexa and six is this pretty much the same thing, but you know, six times six, three sixty, or well, thirty six. The basis of three sixty. Um, the circle was given three hundred and sixty degrees by the Babylonians, who used a sexagesimal base sixty mode of reckoning, which we still carry on today, despite our use of a decimal base ten mode for most other things. The number 360 or 360 uh, is gematria value of the 21st Hebrew letter Shin. So again, it stands out as being primal or uh, almost like illustrative or indicative of the, the tarot card itself and its representations, um, the eon and judgment, in which is attributed to fire and means tooth or sharp representing the destructive forces of time and change. Shin is actually the root of the word uh, shin, shinva, or shinwa, meaning change. The three main vav-looking parts of shin represent the three apparent states or directions of time and space, and as the fire of spirit, which again is six, six, six or spirit of fire, or, and again, the four elements like have different values except for fire and water are, are equivalent. So spirit of water as well is the triple flame at the heart of matter extending as space time energy. Note that the basic value of Shin is 300 equating its power with Ruach Elohim, the life breath of the creative powers or spirit of God, the Phoenicus or Phoenix, which eternally regenerates itself. As a symbol of the crystallization of spirit into Tau, matter, and earth, uh, Shin represents the original sin of the fall and restriction, the word of sin is restriction, uh, of the spiritual spark as an ember of the source into the material plane stemming from the need of expansion or need for expansion and transmutation, or change, i.e. magic. The fall implies the first line of descent, the 180 degree angle, which represents the axis, which equals 180, of the circle. 180 is also the number of Helios, a name of the sun, which is the brightest circle seen by man and by whose light he measures all other celestial phenomena. If you divide the circle of 360 again at another 180 degrees, you obtain the cross or mark of the beast symbol signified by X, the letter which signifies the four 90 degree angles, and also itself has the value of 90 as Zadi. At a 90 degree angle from the ground is the sky, the zone of Helios's rulership. 
adding another, so Helios Hyperion, um, adding another 90 degrees to the axis of 180 gives 270, the number of star, as well as Tantra, and there's a lot of like Hindu things relating to 270, um, and the circle itself, showing that the, the path of the circle itself is created along the revolution of the stellar pathway of the great circle of 360 degrees. Um, which reminds me, like, because I brought this up, Artu, Ritu, which is the basis, apparently, of the word ritual, or the root. Ritus are basically these, like, periods or days, essentially, or, like, they're like kalas in the sense that the kalas are the days, um, which I mentioned in uh, not the last post, but the post before that. <laughs> uh, basically, the Ritus, which are related to six, um, fixed in appointed times for sacrifice or yajna or ritual, etc. Obviously, they spell it with an I here to pronounce it, but Ritu are, with a tau is 606. And so Ritus is 666. So that's pretty important. Because <laughs> again, considering the anachalypsis is, um, you know, what he said, what Godfrey Higgins says about the days of the week and time itself and 666 being the reckoning, uh, the number of reckoning, um, and the basis of this whole calendar and all this sundial of the psyche itself, again, a friend, it's, there's a lot of, I'm going to show how this is a develop, there's some development here that leads into the spectral energy of the mind itself and the sciences of, um, the, you know, again, these magnitudes and fields and energies and, um, the whole electric bridge. But anyway, uh, adding another 90, blah, blah, blah. So I got to that. Uh, so circles are the basic stellar pattern of radiation. And so again, radiant and being three parts of the full circle, 270 being the trikaya, the three bodies of the Tathagata Garbha, the Buddha matrix, and corresponding to the ophanim, the wheels of the Kurla cell, the vril, the full chakra system, Kurla essentially meaning circle or wheel, i.e. Kala chakra and Vril being the substance of plasma, relating again to um, Krilu, as well as Virya and Urja, orgasm essentially, um, and therefore Orgon. The three bodies are the physical, mental, intellectual, or Ruach, and spiritual, supernal levels of being. Tathagata Garbha means the womb, or embryo, Garbha, of the thus gone, Tathagata. Remember, Buddha's Tathagata Garbha is 333. The other number dealing especially with time, 666, like, it's just funny how these concepts, like, will magnetically, it seems like, resonate with this sort of grid. Like, it's almost like a, an underlying magnetic field, similar to cymatics, which again is 777. Um, but 333, like, these... Each one of the Kabbalah's chambers, each one of the chamber numbers, um, is a sort of magnitude or a density, it seems like, like subsisting the other ones, um, which, will, again, I'll get into because that'll come up when the Kabbalah of Nine Chambers is brought up in uh, the computation of 666. But anyway, um, so basically it's just crazy, again, that the English version of, again, not only Hebrew, but Sanskrit, Pali, sometimes even Tibetan, um, like Srog, Life Force, which is, again, it's like the Vril, S-R-O-G in Tibetan, uh, phonetic transliteration to English, is 333. So, again, the Tathagata Garbha, the, you know, the field. Um, 270 is yet also, so, again, 270 is just like three-fourths of the circle. So, um, the psychico, the Buddha matrix opening of or, so O-A-N Resh, um, or, which also, like, it has another, I think it has another darker meaning, but, um, 
it's also essentially or. Uh, reversed, yeah, so darkness, evil, reversed, the last 90 degrees, re being related to the left hand of the tree and the darkness of Bina, whose understanding gives discernment between Lux and Nox, Tenebrae, through the perspective angle. So again, the ca camera obscura comes to mind, because again, this whole light and dark, it's funny, it is a full moon right now. <laughs> I'm trying to get on this like full moon rhythm where I do these. I want to do them quicker, but the role of the circle in magic is of great value, being the central symbol of which most ceremonial and even low magical rituals are based upon. The circle is generally attributed to the goddess or feminine aspect of nature, but it is both and neither male or female. It could equally be said to represent Nuit, Hadit, and Heru Raha. It symbolizes the vast and unmeasurable expansion of the body of Nuit at the center of Hadit, which is omnipresent throughout it. And so, yeah, it's like a, a nuclear, um, I don't know, like anti-cosmic force. Or it's not anti-cosmic because it's creating really everything, but if you were to try to circle in on the whatever is really back behind the processes of creation. It's like, it's really hard to, you know, Kether, for example, like comes to mind, but even behind that, like the Ain, Ain, Sof, and Or, they, it's, you can't, concept, that's why they're not really conceptualizable. Maybe the Ain, Sof, Or, the Limitless Light, but the other ones are kind of like, just these like vacuums. Um, that nonetheless are still everywhere pre like present in the sense that it's what's perpetuating this fucking existence for whatever reason. Like, I don't know really what <laughs> that's one of the things I'm trying to figure out here is like, what the fuck, what the hell are you doing, bitch? Like, you know, the 793 thing comes to mind. Like she's, she's up to something up there. But anyway, um, symbolizes the vast unmeasurable expansion of the body of Nui, blah, blah, blah. Thus, 360 as a value of the self is of prime importance, being as it is, so again, the rings, the ring, uh, being as it is indicative of the magician's circle of protection from clefothic forces from beyond, one of the primary usages of a magical circle via banishing. Note that Horus is 341, the value of the three mother letters, so again, self, Aleph, Mem, and Shin, which formulate the three-dimensional rays. Taken as a metathesis, the hours then correlate to the clock of 360. The ve so again, because Horus is 341 plus 19, uh, Tef, Hey, Hey, then correlate to the clock of 360. The veil of the circle of the self is the same veil of Isis, spoken of by Blavatsky, and others, which when, uh, when rendered, admit forces wholly other into the zone of being. Because again, the my my theory is that the present moment and that ve that theatrum of the the retina of the known and the visible is but a curtain. It's but of it's ve there's multiple veils like, um, and who knows like other. That just means other s circles or magnetic energy centers are, you know, other people have them. There's just probably other ones out there. Like <laughs> humans probably are not the only magnetic energy beings, you know. Um, this isn't probably the only magnetic, you know, electromagnetic spectrum or vi like zone of the spectrum. It is for this reason that it is significant then that the Hebrew Shatan or Satan, Prince of Darkness and Chaos, is valued at 359, the broken circle. Satan represents the fallen light of the soul, um, which has disconnected from its source, or so the essentially the fire, the electricity grounding, or bro not gr ungrounded, the beginning and the end defunct. So a break in the in the circle, uh, the circuit. The uh, lost word or key then is the singular aleph, the self, which, when placed in the slot, bridges the gap of the missing cornerstone. 
the stone fallen as lightning from heaven. Note that the Hebrew cornerstone, Fana Larash, is three uh, or six six six, um, which is funny because the head of the dragon is as well, and not only the head of the dragon, but I think it's fire dragon, the fire dragon, Haash Dracon, because Ash Dracoon with the ha for the the. Then also Hadrakanosh, uh, the head of the dragon, or Draconis. But anyway, the circle in its higher form as sits, sits, sits shows its connection with this gnosis, and thus the sits, sits, sits mentioned in Revelation is also thus a form of the golden cup, because literally the golden cup is sits, sits, sits. Revelation 17.4, a form of the Holy Grail. So again, it's also the robe of glory. So the, even though the golden cup, like people want to think it's a literal cup or grail, it's symbolic of essentially this uh, dimensional, interdimensional, you could say gateway, but it's, again, that might conjure the wrong idea, but it is a vortex. Again, the... Uh, Post 55, where I read the Dragon Legacy, the whole concept of in really the, what is it, post 51? Uh, the whole concept of the middle pillar, all that, again, it, con it connects to the camera obscura, the whole ancient secret of the Holy Grail, blah, blah, blah. So the circle and the cup are both indicative. <laughs> I shouldn't do that. I know it's bad, but I mean, there's just so much and Really, they're all meta. Like it's not that they're all metaphors for well, for what it means that you can cross apply the sciences essentially for whatever it is, you know. But anyway, the circle and the cup are both indicative of the soul shell cell, i.e., the transcosmic akash awareness. As Kenneth Grant calls it. Uh, that is the self, and six hundred and sixty-six has been conclusively shown to represent this by focusing all of these currents and concepts into one singular formula. Again, like a lens. A formula hinted at millennia ago before half of this wisdom was its stant, and before the language of this exegesis had evolved. So yeah, again, before any of this was ever ever like even able to be nicely wrapped up and with a nice little bow on it here on here on the wonderful world of youtube <laughs> yet another connection with the circle and the grail is the idea of the knights at the round table so again in the whole night uh rex arturus or king arthur being 777 comes to mind because again it's like the breaking out of that six 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 honestly the revelation. Uh, so, yeah, the Knights of the Round Table and Manjusri Sword. What else? The Flaming Sword. It's obvious um, that, you know, the mythology is pretty much there in the code. Anyway, 666 is the Stone of the Round Table. It's also the Stone of Abbey Agnes. Um, and again, everything else I've freaking found and said and will say. Uh, the exit, oh, and the exacts are 60 stone, which Kenneth Grant talks a lot about. I'm not sure if he knew that one though, even though it's like spot on. Again, the 60 stone symbol of the Holy Grail, which to most is lost, though everywhere present. The magical significance of the circle in regards to practical ritual is quite mundane and basic. Repetition is practice, and practice makes perfect. Or at least better. Maybe not. Who knows? <laughs> Reenact to some, you know, you'd be surprised. Reenactments, calculated proceedings, daily and nightly routines, habits and behavior patterns, they all go to create the overall quality of mental and physical environment. Again, they weave reality. It's mostly mental. Therefore, the modulation of these factors will greatly adjust the output and feedback. The circle is the portal or a port or porta, which is, you know, the Latin, liber porta lucius, rather meaning gateway. Um, in Old English, port, portal, door, gate, entrance, from Old English, port, 
gate entrance from the Latin porta, city gate, gate door. And it's funny because this whole door and gate in port, Portland is 444. And uh, I think what, cruise ship, cruise ship, and they go to the Portland. Uh, but 444 is Damascus, which symbolically in the whole like Gematria, Dogmatic Kabbalah, whatever you want to call it. It, Damascus is symbolic of the body, but also the city and the relationship between the body and the city. And therefore, again, the obviously the king and the whole divine king of England, the whole concept of the divine king, uh, the body of the king is the, the city, essentially. Um, and so it's just funny, like the whole hierarchy hierarchy, the externalization of the H-I-E-R-A-R-C-Y uh, -E so wait, hierarchy with a chef 444, the externalization of the hierarchy, like I'm starting to see there's some shit going, and I get I, I know the whole Portland thing, it's irrelevant with some of this stuff, it's just that I see these things come up like hot points, like as Michael Berteau calls them, um, the way patterns start to emerge, like they pry their way in. It's like a portal, I swear to God. The portal is to any possible point in space time, much as the, oh yeah, and the whole 444 thing, found out about this guy named uh, Amy Michelle, or a Aime Michelle, because I was reading... Um, See the pulse of the universe. Uh, yeah, the pulse of the universe. Harmonic 288 by Bruce Cathy, and he talks about how like there's this guy who has two other books, The Secret of the Flying Saucers, I think, and then The Flying Saucers and the Straight Line Mystery, and he talks about how he like mapped out this thing. I think he, I forgot what he called it, the orthotenic grid system or something. Um. I don't know. The whole thing was crazy. It just to me, I'm not like so much just focused on what they're saying from then at that time. I'm almost looking at it from now and wondering like, what could they really have been setting up, you know, like with the grid, so to speak, before we really even had the, cons the public understanding of what, you know, they've been doing surveillance wise for so long. And, uh, it just makes me wonder, like, it's so hard to figure out what's really going on with, you know, what's natural, I guess, and what's engineered, I guess. I don't know. It's very weird. Either way, uh, the portal is to any possible point in space time, much as the zero, which is everywhere and nowhere, the eye of Amun. The mirror of the seer, or the mirrored seer, which conversely is 999, the pleroma of the zero, reflects the infinity in the zero, and in the process of zero equals two, becomes zero cubed, bringing it back to the original Ain Sof Or, or triple zero. Though the zero is an oval, and the circle is 360 degrees, the 360th degree is also the zero point. And the fact that 107 is the number of so many various connections to the zero, even zero and i.e. oval, the magic egg, bitsa in Hebrew, meaning egg, the ma'ion formula of Frater Achad, and meden, uh, the Greek word for zero, etc., shows that the final he of tetragrammaton, which is attributed to the dark daughter aspect, implying the shape of the diamond and all its significance, see the diamond of perfection, is aligned with the Akasha itself, an ancient analog of the idea of plasma, the fourth state of matter equated with thought itself. So again, so therefore, thought, the tenuous, um, you know, you could say vibration or uh, spectral en energy, essentially, or optical energy, biophotons, <laughs> and the plasma, which again is what delineates essentially the, the development of the whatever it is in an egg, I say whatever it is, I guess, for, you know, whatever is developing in the egg, um, 
which again is all about the whole blueprint and the code, therefore, of that. It's essentially all concomitant, is what I'm trying to get at, in that that zero point from the beginning of the circle is kind of, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but it re relates to the daughter aspect of why really the 107 is the father, mother, and son, Ab, Ima, Bin, but the final He is implied in the field or in the process. That's why it's the daughter and the daughter being the open end. <clears throat> so remembering that also, or that one, remembering also that 107 is the formula of, so again, like I said, a, Ab, father, I'm a bin, I'm a mother, bin, son, triad, which veils the daughter as the encompasser and precipitator of the matrix of manifestation, the fourth dimension. Almost as if we're looking like, you know, backwards or something or have a dimensional um, mis, misguidance. Again, that's what the symbolism of the tarot kind of implies, the hangman and the inversion, various really inversions along the tree. This could also be figured as yang and yin and their counterparts, the yang aspect of yang and the yin aspect of yin, balanced in the yang of yin, yin of yang, which is balance. The Tau Circle of 360, which the Tao Circle is 360, is the golden flower of Chinese mysticism, composed of the light of consciousness, or the light of the mind. The consciousness is O, oh, and centered not in one singular place, but distributed more or less evenly in 360 around each of the three dimensional planes. Note that 360 extended into three dimensions is 1080, which when centered with a point, so again, a three-dimensional soul symbol, essentially, or solar power symbol, solar and power, both 361, which is that symbol, which, so when centered with a point, gives 1081, the number of Tiferet, so the sixth uh, power zone, or Sephiroth and a form more akin to the sphere rather than the circle with the point at its center. The egg slash circle of light is thus the golden flower of beauty, or the egg essentially, the egg essentially being the seed, with Sahasrara as the upper flower portion, and Muladhara the lower root portion. 107 and 360 are connected in yet another way via... Freder Achad in his role as conduit for the incoming of the Eon of Mayot, or Ma'at, as some people might call it. 107 and 360 are connected in yet another way via Freder Achad in his role as conduit for the incoming of the Eon of Ma'at. Amalantra gave Achad, or Akkad, the title of Arcteon in the Amalantra working, which has the value of 360. And he was also told, along with Groli, to find the egg which Achad did in 1948 on his birthday, April 2nd, when he realized that the 107 of Bitsa, in Hebrew, meaning egg, veils the Ma'ayon in Al chapter 1, verse 1, in Al chapter 1, verse 66, the first and last verses of uh, the chapter of Nuit in the Book of the Law. He also noted that 107, the egg, and 150, the nest, Ken, equated to manifestation. O, or Ayin, taken as Vav, which is sometimes customary in Hebrew transliteration, see also Liber O, or Liber 6, whence the value of Ma'ayon as 107, or 821 when in full with Ayin, um, in non final, particular caveats that don't allow for much, but particular nuances. The 13 fold formula of manifestation which he took to be indicative of the manifestation of, not of Nuit, but the daughter aspect, Mayot, or Ma'at, with her dark side, Mayut. No, Mayot plus Mayut is also 107, the dark daughter, or the final He, and also New Mayot, the space of space, or the space behind, beyond space, the space holding a terrestrial or... Uh, mundane space, which is the continuum and menstruum of new Isis, i.e. the radiations from beyond, so the transplutonic new Isis. 
from beyond Pluto or Uranus or Pluto and Uranus, um, hell and heaven essentially, or the pylon of universe A. And here's Frederick Chod's seal, the eon of truth and justice with the letters manifestation 438, the whole stone and the whole, the whole and the perfect stone. Note that 438 is the number also of perfection, which when, or the perfect ion, which when added to manifestation using the flame of Shin totals 999, the value of the eon of truth and justice, as well as the incoming of the eon of Mayot. So those formulas, which he related, like he said, basically, uh, the incoming of the eon of Mayot was the lesser cycle, which he was like inaugurating when he wrote it down, basically, on April 2nd of uh, 1948. And then he said there would be some time in the future that the eon of truth and justice or the greater cycle of Mayot would begin. But I don't know, like Liber Pene Prenumbra and Soror 722 was also born the same year. Um, it seems like it's been a straight flow since around that, since probably before then, actually. So <laughs> I don't know. But to me, Horus and the egg, it's like almost like the egg is Horus's egg. But again, Kenneth Grant says, well, what's in the egg? And the eon of Maya is in the egg. So the whole eagle, uh, Naka or Nasher symbolism of 555 is also relevant. And 111, like the whole cabal of nine chambers. And so I'm still like mapping this out in my own mind. But I see that there's definitely something to something is it like there's some pulse some cosmic pulse you know the pulse of the universe 2015 is the year of the eon of mayot literally i found that and then so it was also the 111th year of the eon of horus and the year in which uh, this gnosis is being revealed in full by the child of liber al and that formula or that phrase the child of liber al is 821 which is August 21st is my birthday. And then um, Ma Ion, like I found all these weird personal relate, like relationships that were obvious and stood out like a lot of this did. So anyway, yeah, with the 107 or gold key mentioned in the Amalantra working. The importance of the Mayosh and final hay aspect lay in its connection with the mechanics of the fourth dimension and fourth state of both matter and consciousness, the half-coil of Kundalini representing the in-between state of Turiya associated by Kenneth Grant with the mauve zone, the purple beyond purple, or light higher than eyesight, i.e. outside of the visible spectrum and manifest states of being and mentation, an avenue of research left untouched by, well, most materialists, at least in the uh, public domain, in mainstream academics who refuse or are incapable of such deep inquiry, which requires a necessary amount of personal surrender of the base ego state, which most people, yes, cling to as if it's like the only real, the only thing, and it's all like fabrications and um, distraction. Distraction is six six six. Um, so it's pretty apt, but anyway, uh, and preconceived or indoctrinated notions. The Mayoshan current is, however, one of the more pure, concise, and powerful of those currently at stand, along with one, along which one may expand and develop without too much containment, limitation, and ill influence, as compared to some. And again, you know that might be debated by people who think everything about Crowley and related to any of this and six 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 it's all evil and the devil, blah blah blah. Get get your pitchforks ready, Cletus. But um, you know. To me, it's like it breaks out of the geographical, temporal limitations of it makes you like feel like you're like looking back and like, wow, if only, you know, we had the Internet, you know, to look and see the stupidity of some things and not. But again, even with the Internet, you got people like rather destroy everything than do anything to work on it like 
to learn anything god forbid sorry i digress but the focus on and connection to mathematics allows it to be more apprehendable to those who would be more oppositional to such forms of occult material as well as to show because again the whole occult field and like it's most it's based on motivation what is your motivation you know and so therefore it's just generally not great but uh motivation as well as to show the not too dissimilar nature of the fields after all the word mathematics is said to have derived from mayot or maat the measurer i was trying to find evidence of the oldest usage or occurrence of the number 666 and as to whether the egyptians happen to have been aware of it and again obviously not the arabic 666 but the 660 600 the determinant um and if like again if it was common and as to whether the egyptians happened to have been aware of it and the fact they were well aware of the 36 deacons of the zodiac as expressed in the dendera zodiac carving which equals 666 showing shows that they probably did since it's not difficult to realize that the sum of one through 36 or six times six is 666 the reason i find this number so important is because it acts as a cell or shell itself a container rather for a wealth of significant connected words phrases formulae and symbols most of which are not even part of the same language period system or region showing its common universality as such being also the number of perfection in english gematria it is also or it, so the base 60 or no the base six i mean it is a supreme maoshan formula along with its reflection 999 it is the maoshan aspect of 666 which provides the deepest and most profound insight into its positive side which more than balances it reconciles millennia of fear and apprehension surrounding it and in a way not hitherto mentioned or possibly even discovered until recently again because a lot of the concepts weren't formulated the words the general semantics of it weren't developed and yet they just happened you know, you know nicely correspond nicely correspond with our Neuralink interface here pretty soon Grant associates the number 666 with the great circle of 360 in the commentary to the 666th and 667th verses of Liber Akbish, of the Book of the Spider, in the Ninth Arch, which gives a good summary of his own awareness of this gnosis. So 666 to uh, verse 2 of the chapter, the children of Isis will attend. I think it says, I think chapter one is, or verse one is, invoke now by the sign of Aosic. But I don't, <laughs> I can't remember the commentary. But uh, the children of Isis, and again, remember Isis is nature. So the sh he associates them with the beetles, but the beetles being the shells and the cycle, Kephra rolling the, sometimes the moon, uh, earth, you know, um, Either way, it's the cycle going around underneath, you know, in the darkness or whatever. <clears throat> so the children of Isis attended in the tangential sense described in Against the Light and in Hecate's Fountain. The oracle resumes the satanic trinity of Typhon, Apophis, Bez, the forces of the Sethian current, the other side, which are brought through into terrestrial manifestation from a non-human source represented by the beast. Therion sits at six. The Cirrus, Pythoness, or Scarlet Woman, Ashi Shani, also equals sits at six. Which is funny because, again, the Scarlet Woman is, uh, I forgot exactly the Greek, it's something Kokina, Kokin, um, it's probably down here, but it sits at seven. Yeah, Ha Kokina Gina. So that this is identical with the primal current dedicated to the goddess is confirmed in the weight of the gold that came to Solomon in a single year, i.e. in one circle of time, was 603 score and six. 666 is a devotee of the goddess. He is anti-god, i.e. anti-theos. Begley uh, notes that 
of the 3,125 nouns in the New Testament, euporia alone equals three, or 666. The euporia were the ill-gotten gains of Demetrius, who made shrines of silver for the goddess Diana, showing thus the abhorrence in the devotees of the primal goddess were held by the later adherents of a paternalistic society. The number of the primal goddess is five, he, on uh, ha, being spelled out six. See comment to 776. Uh, the ancient Greek Kabbalists maintained that 666 denoted the quality of materialization, five, or manifestation, appertaining to the solar divinity, six. O Serapis and Teton in Greek, each having the value 666. But of paramount importance here is the fact that 666 expresses the sum of the numerical series 1 through 36, and that 36 represents the sapphire stone symbolic of the Eon of Mayot, the perfect stone. And so again, that corner stone in the six, especially with Buckminster Fuller's whole uh, base 60 or base six system being the cornerstone, it's just kind of funny. Or perfection, um, see comment to the next verse. It is further significant that the concubine offspring of Le and Re or Leah and Rachel is 666, but these names are revived in the magical mystical drama of Crowley and of Helen Vaughn. So, again, in the Book of the Spider, a lot of the people are like in different time periods, but they're the whole story is connected and happening simultaneously, apparently like across the web of time. And that's why, again, it's like quantum superimposition or whatever you want to call it. Uh, see Machin, the hidden, or the great god Pan. Both women were children of Isis. The great circle of 360 degrees is explained in the next verse. 667, three. They came through the intersections of the web. So the interstices. In between the twilight zone, in the junctions of the great circle. Hmm, the between spaces. The satanic triad, see comment to the previous verse, manifests through the five which is six, i.e. via Ha Kokina Jaine, uh, the scarlet woman. She brings the three and the six, the full circle, 360, via the stone or egg of perfection. The perfect ion and the ma ion represented by the star sapphire. The twilight zone in the junctions of the Great Circle refers to the network of Marmas and Sandhyas which lace the Triconas of the Sri Chakra. See Grant, Beyond the Mav Zone, chapters 3, 4, and 5 for explanation of this and other tantric terms. The verse number is key to the central formula pertaining to Sri Tripura Sundari, who is the beauteous goddess represented by the Sri Chakra. And that actually reminds me that the book, the myth, uh, the myth of invariance. I forgot who the author is, but the myth of invariance talks about Shiva's drum and it being divided into this, the hexagram or the hexa, hexagon essentially, or six sides, and it also relates to time. So I need to look more into that. But there's definitely this whole six thing. Like again, with this sixty being the number of this. Um, there's something to this, like the diamond and the hexagram. I mean, I already knew 666. It slowly, I realized that the the diamond or the head, you can think of the hexagram, but, you know, pull it out and it's the diamond. Like, in a sense, 666 makes me think of that. But anyway, this uh, the connection with the Sri Chakra is important, being as it is a yantra of the universe at whose marmas or intersections flow the kalas of new Isis to regenerate the world with each cosmic pulsation. So what is it with these cosmic pulses? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, between the degrees or intersections of the web, between the twilight zone, twilight is the between state of day and night or waking and dream, i.e. the mauve zone, come through the children of Isis, figured as beetles, Kephra, the subconscious, or again, shells, who carry the solar orb rays into conscious manifestation. 
the o as the stone or egg of perfection thus manifested in physical form on april second two thousand and eleven the one hundred and seventh year of the eon of horus as a totemic omen of the revival of the maotian current and the precision of coincidence the coincidence is too much to deny but the coincidence is beside the many points that have been brought into view as a result so again and like what i've found is that these stones of the goddess are actually considered kalas themselves they're kalas of the goddess um and the whole concept the omphalos there's a book by philip goss which i don't even ne necessarily agree with but because he <laughs> i don't know just look into omphalos by philip goss g-o-s-s-e but i was reading it and i saw that he had the original in like in greek o and then omphalos o omphalos or the omphalos the navel stone the um essentially the betel stone is also 666 so like again if you've been keeping up with this like it's like what the fuck is going on here i don't know really trust me i really don't i'm sitting here watching i'm like just as perplexed you know i am perplexed to it <clears throat> that the current is still active and unfolding should be apparent and those who will to participate shall receive their signs in time as well if they have, if they still have yet to the concepts presented here are intended to be gateways be it the egg the mirror the diamond etc and the o is another cognate symbol through which deep contemplation and meditation can yield such signs and or epiphanies the seven expansions of the fundament forming the 36 points of material expansion of the bride of malkuth the o so yeah um that makes me think of the myths of invariance too or the myth of invariance uh, it's a crazy like that book is kind of out there i wish I, I need to stop bringing up so many books that people won't know what i'm talking about but the myth of invariance has these different little like i don't know how to explain it because it's so many different things coming together like it's looking at the rig veda um plato tone like the whole tonal stuff i mean i it's interesting to me but <laughs> i'm trying to still like just get dip my toes into some of this stuff um i should probably pull this up in the pdf thing and just want to see what i missed so buckminster fuller synergy like his book synergetics he's he's almost like as as revered as he is you know um he speaks like a like a crackpot in some of his books like i have nine chains to the moon and he like capitalizes all these words in there it's like it's just funny like it's just weird but i think nine chains to the moon is really important and it's weird that it's hard to find and it's kind of really important though but yeah he, his whole concept like it's not all just mathematical it's really mental it's very much all about a development of the mind and the ability to you know contemplate and abstract visionary geometry is really what it is and that that term came to me visionary geometry and i was like huh i wonder what that equals and of course it's it can it can be 999 with uh s as shin but uh let's see i wanted to bring up the quest or the definitions he has of synergy and synergetics synergy means behavior of whole systems unpredicted by the behavior of their parts taken separately synergy means behavior of uh, behavior of integral into or aggregate whole systems unpredicted by behaviors of any of their components or sub assemblies of their components taken separately from the whole a stone by itself does not predict its mass interaction for and by another stone there is nothing in the separate behavior or in the dimensional or chemical characteristics of any one single metallic or non-metallic massive entity which by itself suggests that it will not only attract but also be attracted by another neighboring massive entity 
The behavior of these two together is unpredicted by either one by itself. There is nothing that a single massive sphere will or can ever do by itself that says it will both exert and yield attractively with a neighboring massive sphere, and that it yields progressively every time the distance between the two is halved, the attraction will be fourfolded. This unpredicted, only mutual behavior is synergy. Synergy is the only word in any language having this meaning. The phenomenon of, or the phenomenon synergy is one of the family of general, uh, generalized principles that only cooperates amongst the myriad of special case experiences. Mind alone discerns the complex behavioral relationships to be cooperative between and not consisting in any one of the myriad of brain identified special case experiences. So again, he has a way of speaking that almost makes you forget what the fuck he's even talking about. <laughs> do I do that? The words synergy, synergy, and energy, and energy, are com uh, companions. Energy studies are familiar. Energy relates to differentiating out sub uh, differentiating out sub factions of nature, studying objects isolated out of the whole complex of the universe. For instance, so, uh, studying soil minerals without consideration of hydraulics or of plant genetics. But synergy represents the integrated behaviors instead of all the differentiated behaviors of nature's galaxy systems and galaxy of galaxies. And so again, a lot of synergetics and, uh, has to do with is being able to mentally conceptualize things so you can see the, like, the synergy between like the relationships essentially that may not be visible to the eye but should be recognizable by the mind if your mind is you know thinking like if you can if you're if you have the datum from which to uh you know understand that's where the understanding comes in and all that but uh chemist uh ch chemists Chemists discovered that they had uh, had to recognize synergy because they had found that every time they tried to isolate one element out of a complex or to separate atoms out or molecules out of compounds, the isolated parts and their separate behaviors never explained the associated behaviors at all. It always failed to do so. They had to deal with the wholes in order to be able to discover the group proclivities as well as integral characteristics of parts. The chemists found the universe already in complex association and working very well. Every time they tried to take it apart or separate it out, the separate parts were physically divested of their associative potentials. So, and so again, this makes me think of dynamic systems theory. Uh, so the chemist, or chemists had to recognize that there were associated behaviors of holes unpredicted by parts. They found there was an old word for it, synergy. Because synergy alone explains the eternally regenerative integrity of universe, because synergy is the only word having its unique meaning. And again, it makes me think of synchronicity, but again, the a-causal connecting principle, a-causal. Uh, and because decades of querying university audiences around the world have disclosed only a small percentage of familiar with the word synergy, we may conclude that society does not understand nature. And yet, his, uh, he goes on, like, there's a lot to this book. I just wish it was better formatted. Um, it's kind of deep, but let's see. Here's where I wanted to get. No, wait. Synergetics, the definition of synergetics, promulgates a system of mensuration employing 60 degree vectorial coordination uh, comprehensive to both physics and chemistry and to both arithmetic and geometry and rational whole numbers. Synergetics originates in the assumption that dimension must be physical, that conceptuality is, uh, is metaphysical and independent of size, and that a triangle is a triangle independent of size. Since physical universe is entirely energetic, all dimension must be energetic. Synergetics is energetic geometry since it identifies energy with number. Energetic geometry employs 60 degree coordination because that is nature's way to closest pack spheres. 
Synergetics provides geometrical conceptuality in respect to energy quanta. In synergetics, the energy as mass is constant, and non-limit frequency is variable. Vectors and tensors constitute all elementary definition. And synergetics shows how we may measure our experiences geometrically and topologically, and how we may employ geometry and topology to coordinate all information regarding our experiences, both metaphysical and physical. And this is important considering, again, the sort of those all those various things I brought up about even recording optically the brain states and whatnot, and life log, memex, the various renditions and the programs now, um, Project Brainwave, Neurogress, Neuralink, etc. Um, some of these people know all about this stuff. It's not like they don't, but it's just they're not teaching people. Like there's a there is in a sense a breakaway civilization, but because the masses are not being you know up updated or whatever you want to say, like that's why all this stuff is is centuries behind. Um, and so the technology that they probably possess is all, it'll resemble like alien, an alien super civilization, but, and there may be an alien, I'm not saying there might, there's not an, probably an alien super civilization or multiple, but at the same time, there's also power tripping fucking retards. So, the quantized physical case is entropic while the metaphysical generalized or so wait. Information can be either conceptually metaphysical or quantitatively special case physical experiencing, or it can be both. The quantized physical case is entropic while the metaphysical generalized is, uh, conceptioning induced by the generalized content of the information is syntropic. There's the resulting mind-appreciated uh, mind syntropy evolves to anticipatorily terminate the entropically accelerated disorder. So again, he's got a lot. It's very verbose, very hard to have to sit there and contemplate what the hell is he saying. But um, I get, for the most part, what he's saying. I just don't know every little detail quite yet. I don't know. this. It To me... I brought this up because I knew the the base sixty connection, and I saw that this would have some sixty references in it. But it also Buckminster Fuller, like I've talked about him a little bit, and I know I'll get into him more with some other posts. But um, he's super important for understanding the basically the mathematics of more than just the three dimensional field because time. And if you look into, again, Nine Chains to the Moon, some of his predictions and, like, visions and ideas, the, the, the Dymaxian house, the four-dimensional, all uh, his four-dimensional theories, which some of them's in this, uh, Synergetics 1 and 2. But um, it's very much like a back, like a skeleton to... Um, the simulation situation of like populations and uh, etc. You know, human terrain system sort of stuff. S E A S, etc. Um, and obviously the ritus, like the time, t t like to me the interstices or the he has this whole thing about the spectrum and measure measurement mensuration right here resolvability limits and how again it's like the visual limits of now you see it now you don't yes no yes no something nothing something nothing dot dash dot, uh, dot dash are relative size scale discernibility spoken of technically as resolution these resolvability limits of the human eye may be pictured as in figure 100.031 uh, the finest smooth surface, intercolor cross-blending continuum photogravure printing is accomplished with a Bende screen that uses 200 unique color dots per square inch of printed surface. Uh, blah, blah, blah. A point, to point, a point to able something may be much too small to be optically resolved 
into its constituent polyhedral characteristics, yet be unitarily differentiated as a black speck against a white background. Because a speck existed yet uh, defied their discernment of any feature, mathematicians of the pre-microscope era mistakenly assumed a speck to be self-evidently unitary, indivisible, and geometrically employable as a non-dimensional point. Uh, see sections 262. Two, yeah, I think he talks about the mathematical point a lot, which is important. Um, the, <laughs> it's funny. The pl uh, plurality of points become the or became the building blocks with which the mathematicians of the day before microscopes imaginatively constructed their lines. Lines became the one-dimensional substanceless logs that they floored together in their two-dimensional planar thicklessness rafts. Finally, they stacked these planar rafts one upon another to build a solid three-dimensional cube, but having none of the essential characteristics of four-dimensional reality, i.e. having neither temperature, weight, nor longevity. So, again, it's what when I read this, I start seeing, like, in my mind, like, how he's talking about, obviously, our, the limitations of certain aspects of in thinking of, in, of science. Um, he understands that there's, like, a living aspect to it and there's multiple interpenetrating fields you could say or data datas or datums whatever you want to call it streams of data um i say streams because they're fluctuating you know uh and so again it's just like i guess <laughs> i guess some people's minds can't operate that so it's like too much it's like asking too much and therefore this sort of thing. That's why I was like looking into, you know, synergetics and what's been talked about re recently. And it's like, there's people out there, but one guy was like, Oh, it hasn't, why isn't it caught on? And it's clear it like hasn't. And I think the reason why is because it's like, people want simple answers and simple, this simple, that oversimplifications, reduction, reductivism, reductionism, whatever you want to call it. And yet, really, like, reality kind of expects a little more out of you. You know, reality, I say reality, but the reality of any given situation implies a little more than, than you know, that. Than what you already may know or what may want to know. Um, I don't remember exactly where I came across this book probably just searching for references to 666 and like Google books or whatever books.google.com. Um, and apparently they're now selling a paperback Amazon itself. It's probably like a print on demand. I don't know. I wouldn't say don't, I'm not saying don't buy it if, but I'd say be careful because some of those print on demand things really suck and they don't check the formatting or anything first. But, um, this book, I ended up finding like on Thrift Books, I think it was, or World of Books, one of the two. And I, this was the only other one I knew of that I've seen sold. Um, and the one I have is like brown. But I was like, holy shit, how crazy uh, that, you know, it was there like right when, I don't know, the timing is interesting. Um, but, so yeah, it mentions the Kabbalah of Nine Chambers, and, uh, let's see, I wanted to bring up this section from Morals and Dogma also, which I found interesting. He says, the first Masonic legislator whose memory is preserved to us by history was Buddha, who, about a thousand years before the Christian era, reformed the religion of Manus. He called to the priesthood all men without distinction of caste who felt themselves inspired by God to instruct men. Those who so associated themselves formed a society of prophets under the name of Samanians. They, uh, they recognized the existence of a single uncreated God in whose bosom everything everything grows, is developed and transformed. The worship of this God reposed upon the obedience of all the beings. Uh, he created. 
His feasts were those of the solstices. Um, the doctrines of Buddha perver or pervaded India, China, and Japan. The priests of Brahma, the Brahmins, professing a dark and bloody creed, often with sacrifice. And I'm slowly starting to read the sacred books of the East. Um, and it's funny because it starts out talking about with the Kandodya Kondo Upan uh, Upanishad that basically Om, like meditation on Om and Om itself is supposed to be how the Puranas or certain texts begin and uh, sacred books of the East itself, that formula is 670, which is Om, a form of Om. And uh, I found that crazy, like when I started that. And, um, but yeah, this whole thing, it's crazy how, I mean, really, again, I mentioned all those other books that talk about Buddhism, Harvard, uh, Hargrave Jennings, um, for that Ferguson tree and serpent worship book, like it all is parallel. And yet again, Chris, Christians whose religion is relatively new and I'm not anti, like, I think Chris, Jesus, I think the whole thing is very convoluted and complex in that modern day Christians are just so, I don't know, un, you know, they're just, they are too quick to like call everything satanic and in a small, um, limited outlook on things. And I don't know, it's pretty sad, but, uh, the priests, but yeah, yeah. Uh, the Brahmins, they, Buddha can't kind of changed things and said, Oh, look, it doesn't have to be this way. Like this external worship, uh, with ritual and all that to the Brahmins essentially. And, uh, similar to how Jesus kind of reformulated things or reformed things in a way with the Jews. But, um, anyway, uh, let's see. Doctrines of blah, blah, blah. So, okay. Prof professing a dark and bloody creed. Br uh, brutalized by superstition, united together against Buddhism, and with the aid of despotism, exterminated its followers. But their blood fertilized the new doctrine, which produced a new society under the name of gymnosophists, uh, or gymnosophists. And a large number fleeing to Ireland planted their doctrines there. Hmm, which makes me think of the Tuatha de Danan and whatnot. And there erected the round tower, some of which still stand solid and unshaken as at first visible monuments of the remotest ages. The word of God written in astral characters by the planetary divinities and communicated by the demigods as a profound mystery to the, uh, the Phoenician cosmology. So yeah, like there's a lot to be gained from morals and dogma. Um, and I don't really even know what chapter this is, but um, Night of the Rose Craw, so the 18th. But um, anyway, let's pull this up, the computation of 666. And it's like, you'd expect, because it says it's the two witnesses of Christ, I think, or the two servants of Christ. Christ. Um, it's not too, like, paranoid Christian like you'd expect, like, I mean, it's somewhat of it is like they interpret, because back then, like here in the 1800s and the 1900s, even, and still to today, again, there's this sort of like fear-based looking into anything dealing with paganism or hermeticism. It's like all evil and satanic. And, but if, the, from what I've get, gotten from reading, like a lot of this is that, I don't know, they're not too you know, like bashy or bigoted or whatever you want to call it. I don't know. I'll read the preface though. Uh, this book aims at two things. A, the presentment of Christ as the seed of the woman and B, to draw aside the curtain and expose the schemes of the enemy now marshalling his forces for the last great conflict. One, the seed of the woman. The eighth chapter of Proverbs connects Christ as the divine wisdom with the creation, for without him was not anything made that was that was made. John chapter 1 verse 3. 
He is uh, there actually identified with God's wisdom in creation. To that wisdom, there is not only a religious side, but one purely philosophical and scientific. For, in the word of God, religion and science are not regarded as disconnected. Such thoughts are of man, they are not of God's thoughts. Another thing that comes to mind is just how I've tried, I know it's going to take, take a while to really get to, but I've tried cracking open and getting into, well, I've gotten into Emanuel Swedenborg as a whole, and I think he, there's a lot to be gained from him. I'm not going to like jump on the bandwagon and fully you know, become a Swedenborgian like some people uh, do, but I think there's a lot to be gained from it because he looks at, things from a, a, a very different view and more open-minded view, I guess, um, enlightened view almost. Like in Arcana Coelestia uh, or Celestia or whatever, uh, he talks about the whole like hidden, or not necessarily the hidden teaching of the Bible, but the deeper like between the lines sort of things and uh, I don't know. There's just a lot to all of that, like similar to, again, the ancient Indian and sacred books of the East and whatnot. The, uh, there's a lot of actually like cutting edge stuff in there that is still, and it's like, I don't know. It's crazy. Some of the, I, whenever I was going through some of the sacred books of the East though, I was like, holy shit, like this stuff require like to, to really, I mean, there's a lot of, like, as much as the Christians, again, like to, like, consider themselves the, like, the forerunners of, like, you know, good living, I guess, right living, righteousness and all that. Like, some of the stuff in the sacred books of the East is, like, the solution to a lot of the problems we see going on. Um And it's it's crazy. And again, I'm not talking necessarily about Again, Max Mueller, he kind of, it's funny, like in his introduction and all that, he's like bashing the shit he spent all that time editing. But I guess some of it, he's like, right, like a lot of it is superstitious and outdated in some aspects, but like the, the sacrifices and all that. But again, there's like some, there's a deeper st stream of thought in all of that, that I think gets i guess forgotten or uh veiled whatever anyway sorry the treatment of this book uh the of this subject in this in the book as far as regards the philosophical aspect of it is based upon the geometrical philosophy and this geometrical philosophy finding its first cognate exponent in the movements of heavenly bodies we further urge that in the account of the creation genesis chapter 1 14 uh, the way in which the constellation figures were designed has been revealed to us, and that they were given as a guide to God's purposes therein. Furthermore, that a geometrical figuration of the words of Scripture runs through the accounts of the world's creation, renovation, and regeneration, just as appropriately uh, as God's language seems to form, seem, uh, assumes the form of verse in lieu of prose in certain other portions. Further, the numbers running through the whole Bible, whether as grand cycles of time into which God has been pleased to fit human history, or as expressive of generations of men, assume the peculiar mathematical features of that remarkable phenomenon known as the sun's passage through the twelve signs of the zodiac, the object being the point to the being to point to the Lamb and to the pyramidal city, the pyramidal city which Scripture concludes on the foundations of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. To take a new departure, we carry the war into the enemy's country. If the Lord be with us, we will not fear Goliath. It is the custom in the present day for Christians to spend time in parrying the, assault, uh, in par parrying the assaults of a pseudo-philosophy calling itself science, the philosophy of if. These assaults are intended to prove the Bible to be false by means of science. 
we reply that the bible attacks these would-be philosophers on their own ground and we charge them with neglect of the fundamental fact of science the sun's passage through the twelve signs of the zodiac and affirm that a descent from generals to particulars as taught in god's word can alone hand us a complete philosophy and that the meaning of all that experimental science has taught us will be found brought to a focus and in many particulars by su or by much simpler methods than those usually employed during the 19th century. Thus, we maintain that the lack of a link between religion and science is solely due to the neglect by modern philosophers of a fact known to every Chaldean and Egyptian sage. We believe that this aspect of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ can alone deal with certain arguments of the uh, solar mythologist agnostics who have been attacking the Bible from the days of Voltaire and Dupuis, uh, uh, Dupuis, I'm not, I'm not familiar with him, but down to the uh, down to those of Miss Mr. S. Lang and Mr. Stuart Ross, and leaves them hopelessly stranded. Also, that the combined accounts of the creation and the flood, and the rebellion at Babel, give a complete explanation of the origin of the pernicious systems of initiation and astrology, which have never lost their hold on a world they more particularly enthralled for over 2,000 years B.C. In short, we maintain that the whole work of the devil in denial and falsehood combined stands condemned and exposed by the philosophy of Genesis and all that has been founded thereon throughout Holy Scripture. 2. The Seed of the Serpent We wish to bring before Christians an enormous problem, well known to the skeptic and the philosopher, but of which they are little cognizant, known as the great secret of secrets, and which has been the subject of much speculation and thought amongst learned men for centuries. We allude to the secret of the mysteries. Chaldea, Egypt, Greece, the Gnostics, the Rosicrucians, and the Freemasons show us an uninterrupted chain of men holding tenaciously a secret so profound that they have never divulged it. We claim to expose it, and this claim is based on the application to the subject of a simple method that no one seems to have tried. <laughs> there is one great enigma given us in the Apocalypse, the computation of the number 666. We believe this secret to bring out into a very startling light the character of the attempt of Satan at the Lord's temptation both at the beginning of his ministry and in Gethsemane, that Satan was bringing forward the doctrine of his own unity with Christ, and having failed in that, he will seek to persuade mankind that it succeeded, and will produce the Antichrist for that express purpose. And further, that he will couple that an unexampled and unheard of piece of wickedness by representing the living one as a particular emblem which he will cause to be set up in the sanctuary at Jerusalem. And so it's funny because, again, Hashem Yeheshua is um, the name, the name Jesus is 666, and also Yod Heh Vav Heh Shamash, um, numerous renditions of Jesus actually relate to 666. And not that that's a bad thing, it's just, it, again, it's the solar principle, the soul itself in a way, the magnetic energy center, the, the mind or the nuos, essentially, the human nuosphere, really, um, the, int the integral, you know, field. But anyway, now man was created directly responsible to God for his social status, and this responsibility was afterwards embodied in the covenant God made with Noah. A conspiracy broke out 120 years later at Babel, and a restraint was placed upon it by God, which will be withdrawn when the purposes for which it uh, was placed have been accomplished. But a secret society has existed from the days of Nimrod down to the present moment, whose hidden intrigues have influenced the course of history, and whose ultimate aim is the execution of the scheme of the original conspirators. To the first part of this work it is unnecessary to refer particularly, the divisions speak for themselves and show that vast organizations occupy the field ready for advance, their teachings coming directly into coll uh, collision with God's holy word. It is God's way to let such systems work out their aims and arrive at the summit of their ambition, 
then break them down by the manifestation of his power. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 8. The most skeptical as to any cause of alarm are the professedly Christian teachers. Complacent in their supposed progress, they are rejoicing at their being rich, increased with goods, and having need of nothing. But those who have to do with the affairs of this world see differently, and they are right. Christianity, according to the agnostic, is a feat, and in recognized organs of public opinion it is boastfully argued, we are living in an age at once of democracy and of free thought. Any organism which does not adjust itself to these conditions is doomed to decay. The adjusting is going on apace, and from the prophetic student's view, the decay is proceeding with equal celerity. Another thing which gives great satisfaction is that beautiful rites, in, allu in allusion to maple, dating back to our pagan ancestors, have within the last few years reacquired something of the popularity they had when England was married. Another well-known essayist says, The theory of revelation breaks down because an inspired revelation cannot contain falsehoods, and many of the statements in the Bible are dem uh, demonstrably untrue, generally as regards the facts of the universe, and especially as regards the origin of man. This is Mr. S. Lang's conclusion. He may have it so, we stand upon the word of God and declare against all opposers, let God be true and every man a liar. Not only are these evidences of the uh, working of error and departure from the faith, which must lead at last to the foundations being destroyed, as far as man imagines a vain thing, but also alongside there are indications of upheaval in the political sphere. Events are shaping themselves for an outbreak which taxes the skill and requires the sagacity of rulers and statements to avert. It is an admitted fact, notwithstanding the frequent asservations of peace, peace that a war, uh, peace that a war cloud hangs over Europe, frequently disturbing such complacent dreams. The coming struggle is the common subject of debate in the daily press. A crisis is at hand, so it is said by those who are not given to speak in a flippant spirit of such things or with a light heart raise a cry of alarm, the charge of pessimism is brought against those who's, uh, who base their conclusions on God's word, but the statements herewith given are from men occupying the highest positions and consequently able in some measure to forecast events. The following speech of Lord Wolseley uh, was reported in the papers of January 1889, uh, those who study the map of Europe and the condition of things in Europe must feel that there is hanging over us a war cloud greater than any which has hung over Europe before. It means when it bursts, and burst it will, as surely as the sun will rise tomorrow, it means a war of extinction, of devastation, between great armed nations whose populations are armed and trained to fight. Also, the German emperor is reported to have addressed his army, April 1891, in these words. These are serious times in which we live, and we may have to expect worse in the years to come. This, then, is the outlook, according to experts, and they do but affirm what God has already declared shall be uh, the closing up of this age. The same question of the mastership of the fourth great world power of Daniel's prophecy, the power that murdered Christ, raised by Napoleon I, is again pressing for solution. Two kingdoms in the eastern portion floating the two-headed eagle, the symbol of the divided empire, each with its head assuming the lofty title of Caesar, Russia, and Austria, stand posed for combat, while in the western, the single-headed emblem, the emblem of lordship over the whole, marks the banners alike of the German Caesar and of the angry French Republic, which, la uh, which latter people may any day again place themselves under the aegis of an imperator. Count its men and uh, men at arms, behold its weapons, then say if Daniel's prediction uttered 2,500 years ago that it would be diverse from all that had gone before, terrible and dreadful, and strong exceedingly, was demonstrably untrue. 
In conclusion, we would state that each of us, having first work at this, uh, worked at this subject alone, it is now some years since we were led to the study, uh, led to study it and confer together, and as joint testimonies were in former days specially blessed by God, we have not hesitated in adopting the same method. It is sent forth with one desire, that it may bring honor and glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed and only potentate, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. The Authors, from September 1891. So, that was how many years until, what, 1918? 27? Almost a cycle of Saturn. So let's see. Uh, I wish I could, I mean, I could, but it would take forever. And I'm just trying, like maybe one day or who knows. I would like to read each chapter. The Hermetic Philosophy, Paganism and Theosophy, Freemasonry, Romanism, the Asherah, and the appendices of part one, and then part two, the mystery of God and the mystery of lawlessness, being an endeavor to interpret the celestial signs and to read the lesson of the flood by means of the apocalypse. The mystery of God evangelized, uh, evangelized to the prophets, the mystery of lawlessness, the unity of paganism, the sun of righteousness, the constellations in the shadow of the cross, the fish and the seed of corn, the cosmic character of the ark, initiation in its origin, astrology and its origin, eternal life, the mountain, the apparata, and note on the so-called historical interpretation of the apocalypse, um, and some further developments of the geometrical philosophy, and then on the or, and then on the evidence of design in the number 666 and its relation to the number 2520. So there's that number again, which obviously that's probably why E.W. Bullinger um, knew about it, but he doesn't really go into much about it, so um, maybe I, should, no, I probably shouldn't read this, but uh, it's good to sort of, if you have the time, go read. It's not even a long chapter, apparently. Um, the unity of scripture is so it's reading an unbroken circle returning into itself. So I actually forgot what chapter what chapter I wanted to read. You know, it's I think in part two. I think it's here where actually I found that reference to um, Albert Pike. So it says uh, also in the Traditions of Freemasonry by Pearson, page two forty. The Masonic legend stands by itself, unsupported by history or other than its own traditions, yet we readily recognize in Hiram Abiff the Osiris of the Egyptians, the Mithras of the Persians, the Bacchus of the Greeks, the Dionysus of the Fraternity of the Artificers, and the Attis of the Phrygians, whose passion, death, and resurrection were celebrated by these people respectively. For many ages and everywhere, Mas Masons have celebrated the death of Hiram Abiff. Everywhere among the ancient nations, there existed a similar allegory. The Egyptian rite was a dramatic representation. This myth is the antitype of the temple legend. Osiris and the Tyrian architect, i.e. Hiram Abiff, are one and the same. Not a mortal individual, but an immortal principle. So it's like the Yod and then being reborn in the, the Vav, similar to the dual hay. Taken from the Freemason's Guide by Sickles, referring to the Master Mason's degree, page 196. The mysteries were introduced, so says tradition, into India by Brahma, into China and Japan by Buddha, into Egypt by Thoth, the son of Mizraim, into Persia by Zeradusht, uh, into Greece by Melampus or Cadmus, into Boeotia by Prometheus and his son, into Crete by Minos, into Samothracia by Eumospos or Dardanus, into Messene by Cacon, into Thebes by Methopus, into Athens by Erechtheus, into Etruria by Philostratus, into the city of Irene by Lycus, into Thras by Orpheus, into Italy by the uh, Pulaski, into Cyprus by Cyrus, into Gaul and Britain by Gomer, into Scandinavia by Siege or Odin, into Mexico by Vitzlaputzli, into Peru by Manco Capac and his wife, and into Judea by Hiram Abiff. Traditions of Freemasonry, page 233. 
The legend, that is, of Osiris was purely astronomical. Osiris was the sun, Isis the moon. Typhon was the symbol of winter, which destroys the fecundating and fertilizing power of the sun, thus, as it were, depriving him of life. This was the catastrophe celebrated in the mysteries, and the aspirant was made to pass fictitiously through the sufferings and death of Osiris. Lexicon of Freemasonry, page 130. In the Traditions of Freemasonry by Pearson, page 34, this question of Masonic sun worship is placed beyond the possibility of a doubt. Pearson says, Bazot tells us in his Man uh, Manuel de Freemasonry, Manual of Freemasonry, page 154, that the venerations which Masons entertain for the East confirms an opinion previously unannounced that the religious system of Masonry, mark that, comes from the East and has reference to the primitive religion whose uh, uh, first occupation was the worship of the sun. Also, in the Symbolism of Freemasonry, pages 27 and 28, among the Egyptians, too, the chief deity, Osiris, was but another name for the sun, while his arch enemy, so again, the sun reborn as Ra or Horus, while his arch enemy and destroyer, Typhon, was the typification of night and darkness. And again, in the Symbolism of Freemasonry by Mackey, page 20, one thing at least, he says, is incapable of refutation, and that is that we are indebted to the Tyrian Masons for the introduction of the symbol of Hiram Abiff. The idea of the symbol, although modified by the Jewish Masons, is not Jewish in its inception. It was evidently borrowed from the pagan mysteries where Bacchus, Adonis, Persephone, and a host of other apotheosized beings play that same role that or played the same role that Hiram does in the Masonic Mysteries. In the Manual of the Lodge by Mackey, page 24, we read, The circumambulation, the circle, among the pagan nations referred to the great doctrine of Sabaeism, or sun worship. Freemasonry alone has preserved the primitive meaning, which was a symbolic allusion to the sun as the source of physical light and the most wonderful work of the great uh, grand architect of the universe. The Lodge represents the world. The three principal officers represent the sun in their three uh, principal positions, at rising, at meridian, and at setting. The circumambulation, therefore, alludes to the apparent course of the solar orb through these points around the world. But here again, what General Grand High Priest Mackey says on page 148. This rite of entrusting is, of course, divided into several parts or periods, for the apparetta, or secret things of masonry are not to be given at once, but in gradual progression. It begins, however, that the communication of light, which, although but a preparation for the development of the mysteries which are to follow, must be considered as one of the most important symbols in the whole science of Masonic symbolism. And now on the subject of the three pillars, to which reference has already been made, the following explanation is given in the Traditions of Freemasonry by Pearson, page 56. In the ancient mysteries, these three pillars represented the great emblematical triad of deity. As with us, they represent the three principal officers of the Lodge. The three corresponding pillars of the Hindu mysteries were also known by the names of wisdom, strength, and beauty, and placed east, west, and south, crowned with three human heads. We have it then on the evidence of one of the best, if not actually the best informed Mason in America, that this emblem of the three pillars has not only been borrowed from the mysteries of Hindustan, Hindustan, but that they really retain or actually retain the same names and positions in the Masonic institution that they formerly did or do now in the secret initiations of Brahma. Ragon, uh, an illustrious and learned Belgian Mason, reproaches the English Masons with having materialized and dishonored Masonry, once based upon the ancient mysteries by adopting, owing to a, mis a mistaken notion of the origin of the craft, the name of Freemasonry and Freemasons. The mistake is due, he says, to, the, uh, to those who connect Masonry with the building of Solomon's Temple, deriving its origin from it. He derides the idea. The Frank Mason, which is not a Macon Libre or Freemason, well knew when adopting the title that it was no question of building a wall, but that of being initiated into the ancient mysteries veiled under the name of Frank Maconnerie, or uh, French for Freemasonry. 
that his work was only to be the continuation or the renovation of the ancient mysteries, and that he was to become a mason after the manner of Apollo or Amphion. And do not we know that the ancient initiated poets, when speaking of the foundation of a city, meant thereby the establishment of a doctrine? Genius, uh, the genie Loki, it keeps coming to mind, coming up. Exactly so, but uh, this is just the point that this chapter is seeking to establish. That Freemasons had ever anything to do with the building of Solomon's temple is a heavy tax upon one's credul uh, credulity. Though I could hardly expect so clean a confirmation of this from such a source, still, as I have all along kept before me the desire to let them speak for themselves, on the principle of out of thine own mouth will I judge thee. I am grateful for the admission. It proves that the charges are not made up out of a fertile imagination. So now, having got to the, uh, this very frank avowal from headquarters, we are better prepared to consider the two emblems which follow, reading them in the light of the closing portion of the next chapter. That part is devoted to the consideration of the worship of uh, the Asherah by the Israelites, not forgetting that of which we have just been advised, the end of Freemasons had in view the establishment of a doctrine. In the Manual of the Lodge, page 56, the point within a circle is an interesting and important symbol in Freemasonry, but it has been so debased in the interpretation of it in the modern lectures that the sooner that interpretation is forgotten by the Masonic student, the better it will be. The symbol is really a beautiful but somewhat abs uh, abstruse allusion to the old sun worship and introduces, for us, or introduces us for the first time to that modification of it known uh, among the ancients as the worship of the phallus. In the Lexicon of Freemasonry, page 353, the phallus was the wooden image of the membrum of Eryl, which, being affixed to a pole, formed a part of uh, most of the pagan mysteries and was worshipped as the emblem of the male generative principle. The phallic worship was first established in Egypt. From Egypt, it was introduced into Greece, and its exhibition formed a part of the Dionysian Mysteries. In the Indian Mysteries, it was called the Lingam, and it was always found in the most holy place in the temple. It was adopted by the idolatrous Israelites and took it from the Moabites when in the wilderness of Sin, um, under the name of Baal Peor. Mr. Ronain gives, a, in a tabulated form, a comparison between the Mysteries and Masonry, proving without question their identity. To the unbiased reader, the evidence will be sufficient to establish the fact that they are one and the same. In the Egyptian legend of Osiris, we notice the following principal details. First, there is the uh, possession of some valuable thing. Osiris possessed a kingdom. Second, there is a conspiracy. Typhon and his fellows conspire against Osiris. Three, there is a conflict. Typhon and his fellows had a conflict with Osiris. Fourth, there is a death. Osiris is slain and enclosed in a chest. Fifth, the death is by the hand of a brother. Osiris is slain by his brother Typhon. Sixth, the body is buried at the foot of a tamarind tree. Seventh, there is a first search. Isis searches for her husband's body. Eighth, she interrogates everyone whom she meets. Ninth, the search is accidentally successful. Isis finds the body and disposes of it. Tenth, there is a second search. Isis searches for the scattered remnants of the body of Osiris a second time. Eleventh, there is a finding. Isis finds all the parts of the body but one. Twelfth, there is a loss. One part of the body is missing. Thirteen, there is a substitution. Isis substitutes the phallus for the missing part. In the Masonic legend, first, there is the valuable possession. Hiram possessed the master's word. Second, there is a conspiracy. Fifteen fellow crafts conspire against Hiram. So three plus five plus seven. Third, there is a conflict. Uh, three ruffians attack Hiram Abiff at high twelve. Fourth, there is a death. Hiram is slain by Jubilum. So again, this makes me think of the King Kill 33. Fifth, the death is by the hand of a brother. Hiram is slain by his brother Jubilum. Sixth, the body is buried at the foot of a tamarind or acacia tree. Seventh, there is a first search. Twelve fellow crafts search for the ruffians. Eighth, they interrogate everyone whom they meet. Nine, 
uh, this search is accidentally successful, the ruffians are found in the cleft of a rock and disposed of. Tenth, there is a, a second search. Three fellow crafts go in search of the body. Eleventh, there is a finding. The body is found in a grave dug due east to west, or east and west. Twelfth, there is a loss. The master's word is lost. Thirteenth, there is a substitution. The first word spoken after the body is raised is substituted. In America, where the power of the lodge is felt to be a growing and grinding tyranny, it compels some in that country to speak out with reserve. One witness is here presented. John D. Caldwell of Ohio, a gentleman distinguished by holding both civil and Masonic offices, said to me, We respect such men as you are, for we know you are honest, and you must be uh, aware we are disintegrating your churches. The idea was new to me at the time, but let us see if facts do not sustain Mr. Caldwell's uh, statements, statement that the lodges are destroying the churches. In Boston, there are secret lodges of all kinds, 571. Churches, 223. In Chicago, lodges, 1001. Churches, 310. St. Louis, lodges, 729. Churches, 220. Washington, D.C., lodges, 316. Churches, 181. New Orleans lodges 270, churches 178. The average throughout the United States is about two and a half secret societies to one church. Mr. Caldwell was correct. The lodges are disintegrating the churches. They absorb our young men by the thousands and their money by millions. And as a rule, the men who love the lodge do not love the prayer meeting. The ceremonies of all the false religions on earth are Satan's substitutes for Christ and his atonement, to still not satisfy the longings of a sinful man for religion, and to keep Christ out of sight, so he will not know Christ and the Father, which, uh, which, and on which only is life eternal. Thus, the secret lodge system is a mere expansion and spread of the idolatries of Asia and Africa into Christian countries, with names and forms changed. Devils are growing active and aggressive, for their time grows short. The lodges contain all the idolatry which can be practiced in Christian lands. The indictment which some three millions of American Christians bring against the lodge is that, uh, is that it is Antichrist, that it hides Christ under its ceremonies, that it cuts his name from those portions of the Bible which it quotes in its lectures, that it drops him from its prayers when Jews, deists, and pagans are present are present to object, in short, that it joins the conspiracy of Satan's idolatries all over our globe to cheat men out of eternal life, by depriving them of the knowledge of the true God in Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Christian Sinosher, uh, November 21st, 1889. It will thus be seen that Masonry is no mere copy or feeble mimicry of the religious system that Jehovah chastised when he brought Israel out of its midst with an outstretched arm. It is the very same thing, and though hiding its secret under uh, pretense of philanthropy, is in league with other systems, and is heaping up wrath against the day foretold by John in the island of Patmos. And I saw and hearkened to one eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe! For those that dwell on the earth, in consequence of the remaining voices of the trumpet of the three messengers that are about to be sounding, and it is in this final woe that will close the career of apostate Christianity. So I just wanted to read that because I think it's good. Um, it gives a good insight into where they're coming from. And again, what's been going on, like occult symbology teaches that to, to burn bricks for a city means to train disciples for magic, a hewn stone signifying a full initiate. Petra, the Greek, and Kephas, the Aramaic word for stone, having the same meaning, interpreter of the mysteries, a hierophant, or an aerophant. The supreme initiation was referred to as the burning with great burning. Thus, the bricks are fallen, but we will build anew with hewn stone, of Isaiah becomes clear. For the true interpretation of the four last verses of the genetic allegory about the supposed confusion of tongues, we may turn to the legendary version of the Yazidis, and read verses 5, 6, 7, and 8 in Genesis, chapter 11, esoterically. And Adonai, the Lord, came down and said, Behold, the people is one. The people are united in thought and deed, and they have one lip, or doctrine. 
and now they begin to spread it, and nothing will be restrained from them. They will have full magic powers, and get all they want by such power. Kriyasakti. That they have, that they have imagined. And now, what are the Yazidis in their version, and what is Adonai? Odd, or Ad, or Odd, or Had, is the Lord, their ancestral god, and the Yazidis are a heretical Musulman sect scattered over Armenia, Syria, and especially Mosul, the very site of Babel. See the Chaldean account of Genesis. Who are known under the strange name of devil worshippers. Their confession of faith is very original. They recognize two powers or gods, Allah and Ad, or Adonai, but identify the latter with Shaitan or Satan. This is but natural, since Satan is also a son of God. See Job. As stated in the Hibbert Lectures, page 346 and 347, Satan, the adversary, was the minister and angel of God. Hence, when questioned on the cause of their curious worship of one who has become the embodiment of evil and the dark spirit of the earth, they explain the reason in a most logical, if irreverent, manner. They tell you that Allah, being all good, would not harm the smallest of his creatures. Ergo, he has no need of prayers or burnt offerings of the first limbs of the flock and the fat thereof. But that their odd, or devil, being all bad, cruel, jealous, revengeful, and proud, they have in self-preservation to propitiate uh, him with sacrifices and burnt offerings swelling, smelling sweet in his nostrils, and to coax and flatter him. Ask any sheikh of the Yazidis of Mosul what they have to say as to the confusion of tongues or speech when Allah came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had build, uh, builded, and they will tell you it is not Allah but Ad, the god Shaitan, who did it. The jealous genius of the earth became envious of the powers and sanctity of man, as the god Vishnu becomes jealous of the great powers of the yogis, even when they were daityas. And therefore this deity of matter and consupiscence confused their brains, tempted and made the builders fall into his nets, and thus having lost their purity, they lost their wit, their knowledge, and magic powers, intermarried and became scattered upon the face of the earth. Huh. I just wanted to read what that said. This says, so wait, from the secret doctrine of the Jews, whose realism, if judged by the dead letter, was as practical and gross in the days of Moses as it is now, in the course of their estrangement from the gods of their pagan neighbors, consummated a national and Levitical polity by the device of setting forth their Holy of Holies as the most solemn sign of their monotheism, exoterically while seeing in it but a universal phallic symbol, esoterically. When the esoteric meaning of this recess is made clear, however, the profane will be able to better understand why David danced uncovered before the Ark of the Covenant, and was so anxious to appear vile for the sake of his Lord, and base in his own sight. Iachus, again, is Iao, or Iao, or Jehovah, and Baal, or Adon, like Bacchus, was a phallic god. The dance performed by David round the ark was the circle dance said to have been prescribed by the Amazons for the mysteries. Such was the dance of the daughters of Shiloh and the leaping of the prophets of Baal. It was simply a characteristic of the Sabaean worship, for it denoted the motion of the planets around the sun. The ark in which are preserved the germs of all living things necessary to repeople the earth represents the survival of life and the supremacy of spirit over matter through the conflict of the opposing powers of nature. The Ark is the sacred Arga of the Hindus, and thus the relation in which it stands to Noah's Ark may be easily inferred when we learn that the Arga was an oblong vessel, similar to the Yoni, used by high priests as the sacrificial chalice in the worship of Isis Astarte and Venus Aphrodite, all of whom were goddesses of the generative powers of nature or of matter, hence representing symbolically the ark containing the germs of all living things. The Jews, previous to as well as after their metamorphosis of Jehovah into a male god, worshipped Ashtoreth, which made Isaiah declare, Your new moons and feasts my soul hateth, saying which he was evidently just, saying which he was evidently unjust. Ashtoreth, was in one sense an impersonal symbol of nature, the ship of life carrying throughout the boundless sidereal ocean uh, the germs of all being, and when she was not identified with Venus like every other queen of heaven, to whom cakes and buns were offered in sacrifice, 
Ashtoreth became the reflection of the Chaldean, Nua, the uh, universal mother, female Noah, considered as one with the ark, so like Nui, and of the female triad, Anna, Belita, and Davikina. Now she is the uh, Mary, the virgin in the Latin church, represented as standing on the crescent moon and at times on the globe to vary the program. The pillar and circle, I-O, um, the binary, uh, Linga Mignoni, now constituting the first decimal number and which, with Pythagoras, was the perfect number contained in the Tetractus, became later a preeminently phallic number amongst the Jews, etc. This discovery connects Jehovah still more with all other creative and generative gods, solar and lunar, and especially with King Soma, the Hindu Dies Lunas, etc. Jehovah, from the two words of which his name is composed, makes up the original idea of male-female as birth originator for the Yod, or is that Bob? I think it's Yod, was the Membrum Virile, and Hona was Eve. As various writers have shown, and as brutally stated in Hargrave Jennings' Phallicism, we know from the Jewish records that the Ark contained a table of stone. That stone was phallic and yet identical with the sacred name of Jehovah, which written in unpointed Hebrew with four letters is yod Hey vav Hey, or J-H-V-H, the H being an aspirate and the same as E. This process leaves us two letters, yod vav in the form of U. Then, if we place I in the U, we have the Holy of Holies. We have also the Linga and Yoni and Arga of the Hindus, the Ishvara and the Supreme Lord. And here we have the whole secret of its mystic and arc-celestial arc import, confirmed in itself by being identical with the Lingyoni of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, so chapter 4, The Son of Righteousness. All persons who have had any instruction in scripture are aware that a great spiritual lesson is taught us in the biblical account of the flood. They know that it teaches the destruction of the world and our race as punishment for sin, that the righteousness of Noah is the type of the righteousness of Christ redeeming the human race, and that the drying up of the waters points onwards towards the renewed earth which is to follow the last judgment. With these premises, we can now proceed to examine the details, and the result of our doing so will be to find that Noah enacted in a wondrous drama the whole mystery of God, as a sign or token of what was to come to pass, that is to say, 1. Baptism, 2. Temptation, 3. Renunciation, 4. Crucifixion, 5. Burial, six resurrection and seven ascension were all enacted and eight the espousal and nine the enthronement crown the whole that these types should all have been carried out and so understood at the time will seem so startling to many of my readers that i am compelled to follow up the above by putting uh, before them the following equally startling facts that I am compelled to follow up the above by putting before them the following equally startling facts, on which blatantly infidelity lays the greatest stress in its controversy with our holy faith, and I will ask in what way it can possibly be answered except by admitting that Noah must in some way have enacted the whole of the above mysteries by way of type. For many centuries before Christ, as far as we have any in ancient uninspired history, the myth of uh, Addis and Cybele, uh, sun god and moon goddess, respectively to Phrygia, had enjoyed a continued existence. Briefly, it ran thus. Addis, one, made a voyage in a ship. Two, he was nailed to a tree and represented by a lamb. Three, he, uh, he was three days and three nights in the grave. Four, he rose again from the dead at the vernal equinox. And five, he was both seed of the woman, Cybele, and her bridegroom. And Indra, the sun god of Tibet, was actually uh, was actually depicted as nailed to a cross and having five wounds. The infidel, who refuses to believe the events detailed in the Gospels, and pretends that Christ and the Apostles are a mere figure of the sun in his passage through the twelve signs of the zodiac, consistently accounts for 
this by alleging that Christianity is a copy, a mere type script, of the suffering of Addis, Osiris, Bacchus, Orpheus, Indra, et hoc genus omni. Paul replies, and we do likewise with this one crushing argument. The resurrection of Christ, according to the scriptures, is a fact. Um, the evidence of this is everywhere assumed in these pages. Nothing in history is more pa uh, patent, patent, and nothing could be more easily proved if tried before one of our law courts in the ordinary way. Those who would wish to acquaint themselves with it are commended to the perusal of a shilling pamphlet by H. Sinclair Paterson, M.D., entitled Christ and Criticism. J.F. Shaw and Company, uh, Pater Noster wrote. But how then account for the origin of these myths? Two alternatives are possible. The first is that paganism is a prophecy of Christ. The second, that the myths are perverted copies of some very ancient prophecy of Christ. As every Christian must per, uh, perforce reject the former of these alternatives, the latter only remains. My task is thus facilitated, and it merely rests with me to show that Noah is that grand type. Now, one of the main features in the account given us in Genesis is the minute care observed in recording dates and instructing us as to the calendar. The calendar depends naturally upon the movements of the heavenly bodies. In order to understand the nature and intent of this first mention of a regular calendar in Scripture, we must turn to the divine record given us in their creation in the first chapter of Genesis. I find in Scripture a, pr a principle of interpretation which I believe, if conscientiously adopted, will serve as an unfailing guide as to the mind of God as contained therein. The very first words of any subject of which the Holy Ghost is going to treat are the keystone to the whole matter. In no passage is this so important as in the first chapter of Genesis, because the chapter is the beginning of the commencing book of Scripture, and is therefore the keystone of the whole matter contained in the Bible. Further, as that whole matter is summed up in the mystery of Christ, if we are to understand the whole nature of his work, it is quite necessary that we should study his connection with the account of the creation. Now, the first statement made in Scripture is this, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was brooding upon the face of the waters. Here, then, are the four elements of creation, heaven or air, and earth, spirit, or fire and water, for the Spirit of God, as a creative agency, has not disdained to assume the form of fire, but I anticipate. Uh, to proceed, these four elements were worshipped by the ancients who allegorized them into the four horses of the sun, uh, by the hymn of Mar uh, Martianus Capella in chapter 3, Ante. Uh, not that they believed them to be the elements in the same sense that elements are spoken of in chemistry, but as exercising the generative power of the universe. Remembering what Paul tells us at the outset of the epistles, that is, working upon the same principle of interpretation as that just above enunciated, the ancients forgot God, not liking to keep him in remembrance, but as they kept a great deal of the outward form which encased his primordial teachings, we may lawfully draw from their uh, beliefs, as a similar cosmogony to that uh, related by Moses will have been handed them to see how they will have understood the divine account of creation. So it's funny because the darkness on the face of the deep, that just reminds me, I literally saw it in just my mind when I was going over that, the relation that I found that that verse, uh, G Genesis 1-1, in, uh, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, it's 2,701 in Hebrew, which has numerous um, properties to it, first of all, especially in relation to the cornerstone of 666. But um, the 333, when you subtract Jesus Christ in Greek, which again kind of symbolizes that because of it's the New Testament and all that, uh, that relation, when you subtract 2368 from 2701, it's 333. So there's that 
that connection, which has numerous things to it, but just the, the face of God, in a sense, being those new, just the numerous things that 333 has to do with, um, even again, being Quran's on and the face of the, the, deep, the Chosek, the darkness, and O Abyssos, the deep. Anyway, uh, that being so, we may connect the statement that the spirit was brooding upon the, uh, the waters with the belief that these four elements generated the material universe and that the world was hatched from an egg. Having eliminated the divine character from the spirit of God, they became fire worshippers. Likewise, they associated together the heaven with the element of air, uh, for God called the firmament heaven. They apportioned these four elements to the two sexes. Fire was male, water female, and these made a pair. So too, heaven, or air, was usually male, and earth, the consort, was correspondingly female. Fire and water were respectively Osiris and Isis, the children of heaven and earth, who, while yet in their mother's womb, produced the infant savior, their son, Horus. Thus does a strange legend 4,000 years old testify at once to primeval belief in the cosmogony of Moses, and to the truth of Paul's statement that the Gentiles shut God out of his own creation. Nor is there any reason why, seeing that God has extended the principle of sex to the vegetable creation, in a less marked manner to that in which we find in the animal, it should not exist in a still more... Er, it sh it should not exist in a still more recondite form in nature beyond. God has uh, hidden nothing from his children that it behooves them to know, even to the manner of the incarnation. Following uh, our principle of interpretation, we turn to the beginning of the Gospels in order to rightly comprehend the nature of the manhood of Christ. He was born of the Spirit of God and of a virgin, for he was conceived of the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. Water was worshipped by the ancients in the form of the virgin goddess. Trace this still further, and you will see God is faithful to the same principle in the new creation, which in the old was found very good. The Gospel of John, which is especially the Gospel that portrays Christ as the Logos of creation, in the beginning was the Word, it commences, first shows us that the outset, uh, at the outset, Christ fulfilling all righteousness, baptized of water and the Spirit of God resting upon him, um, and then stating that to be the nature of the new birth or regeneration. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now Adam was not born of water, but of the other female element, uh, earth. The first man is of the earth, earthy, nor was Adam's body of the Spirit. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a living, a life-giving spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, Christ, we are told, is the beginning of the creation of God, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. This is not the first creation. The first man, Adam, was not the beginning of the creation in Genesis, but his appearance with that of uh, his consort was very last, the very last step in it. In Christ, the process is reversed. He begins the creation, and after a consort is found for him, comes the fullness of times to head up all things in Christ, the things in the heaven, the things in the heavens and the things upon earth. Ephesians chapter 1, 13 through 14. It is unfortunate that in the late, uh, that of late years the Christian church has relegated the consideration of the analogy between Christ uh, and his character of the Son of Righteousness and the Logos of ancient beliefs to agnostic solar mythologists, that is, to men who, having willfully rejected the gospel, are trying to prove that the Bible arose out of a lie, and whose efforts Paul distinctly connects with the coming righteous judgment of God on them. Vis, a belief in the lie itself, and a worship of the original liar, Satan, incarnate, and antichrist. No history is more tra uh, translucent than that of Rome in the Augustan age, no people were more practical than those who stamped out the Fourth Empire, its character at the outset. Up to 8030, no Roman historian mentions the existence of Christians. Twenty-five years later, the whole course of human thought has been transformed by a single fact, and Roman history is thenceforward full of accounts of the doctrines and actions of Christian men. It was not a theory that convulsed the world, but a fact, and that fact was one quite new to its experience. A man had risen from the dead. 
The evidence of that is embodied in the New Testament, and it occurred in the manner predicted in the Old, and under circumstances that entirely precluded collusion both on the part of that people who held the Old Testament scriptures in their hands at the time, and on that of men who were subscribing to belief in that unique miracle. The evidence of the fact that men of those days, days known as the Golden Age of Civilization, when the practical intelligence of the Roman united with the subtle, theoretical mind and ideality of the Greek believed in the New Testament statement of the resurrection of Jesus, is to be found in the clear and succinct writings of those great and uh, voracious historians that distinguished the period. In AD 64, only 34 years later, Christians, that is, believers in the aforesaid miracle, were so important a body that Nero, anxious to escape the effects of having ordered the burning of the world's metropolis, could only do so by decreeing Christianity a crime punishable with death, for in that alone would the citizens support him. In the implicitness of Christian belief in the fact, uh, a belief of intelligent men in intelligent days is attested by their having submitted to the penalty rather than renounce their creed a thing which no intelligent man would have done on behalf of any other creed. The mere supposition that Christianity leans upon its evidence is absolutely incorrect, incontrovertible though uh, that evidence is. It is quite unphilosophical. Christianity distinctly asserts that a new subjective power is acquired by the individual at conversion, that a new birth then takes place, which is of the Spirit of God, while at the same time the natural mind and the natural body with sin in them, though not on them, remain as long as this present life lasts. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 11-14 But when the Holy Spirit descended on them, they were different men. So, too, the Bible, a dry and even disagreeable book to the, un uh, to the unbeliever, becomes to the converted man the only book that gives complete satisfaction. Nor are men left without analogy for such change in their own lives. The boy of twelve, fretful at the respect that is paid the female sex, within six short years has endowed them with every grace, the willing victim of their influence, not through any change in them, but from his own acquisition of a new subjective character. Even as regards the mere question of evidence, there is one fatal weakness in the selection of a point for attack in the Christian armory on the part of the solar mythologist class of infidels. <laughs> Christians do not contend that we have any evidence whatever before us in this present year of grace beyond the authority of the Bible for the origin of worlds. If they did, they would themselves upset the authority by placing themselves in flat contradiction to the epistle of Hebrews. In so far as these men's proof of the analogy between the words of the early chapters of Genesis and certain theories of pagan philosophy is concerned, as an attack on the Bible, it is a labor utterly thrown away as the onus of proof that there never was what scripture asserts to be the case, from Adam to Moses, a string of men who looked for the seed of the woman coming to bruise the serpent's head, rests with them, and such proof is upon the face of the matter altogether beyond research. Nevertheless, it is always a mistake to leave the strong arguments of your opponents unanswered, even though they merely affect, as in this instance, a side issue. And in turning aside from facts regarding the analogy between Christ and the Son, important truths are lost sight of by the Church. Let us hear what Jean-Marie Rigon says at, uh, on this point in his McConry Occult, the chapter on the Son. It is not alone in that grand star refulgent in the heavens that is comprised all that the ancients tell us of the sun. By this word, Arafins and philosophers understood the latent cause of creation, of all vegetation, of all motion. Their sun is that life-giving fire, that principle of heat expanded throughout all nature, and without which matter would have remained eternally buried in chaos. Here is the explanation of their first principles upon the allegorical formation of the world, which we find in the Hermetic philosophy. One single force, one single principle, one single active cause, could never have given energy and life to the universe. The generation of bodies is a result of the action and reaction of their constituent parts. She works by fermentation, and fermentation supposes, on the face of it, two powers, 
the Arafins believed then, or at least pretended to believe, that two principal, uh, primitive principles had worked out the development from chaos. And as they noticed that everything in the universe is only water or fire, humid or warm, they named these two principles, the one fiery male, active, form, heaven, or sun, and the other, humid, female, passive, water, earth, or moon. These are the uh, Osiris and Isis of the Egyptians, the Elion and Beruth of Synconiathon, <laughs> and the Uranus and Gay of the same author. You may recognize them under the names of Odin and Frigga, and of Ask and El uh, Emla among the peoples of the north. Of Adam and Eve amongst the Hebrews, in short, there is no theogony in which they are not clearly marked out. But, blinded as this man shows himself to be in his mixing up of the belief of the Hebrews and those of the nations of paganism, we may accept what he says regarding the analogy between the teachings of Genesis 1 and the pagan doctrines respecting the sun. If we stop at the right place, we may find him of use. Christians have tried to interpret the words of Genesis uh, 2. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth in quite a different sense to all the other ten instances in which the phrase, these are the generations, occurs in the same book. There appears to be no solid ground for the distinction. Ragon accepts the word generation here in its literal sense, and it seems difficult to escape from such reasoning. Adam was born of the earth, so too we are told the waters brought forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, etc., and that the earth brought forth grass, herb, yielding seed after its kind. The language is clear enough, and the female sex is plainly attributed to both the water and the earth. The Osiris myth lends a corroborative and equally unwilling testimony to the truth of God. While yet in their mother's womb, the seed god Osiris and his wife Isis yielded seed, just as at creation every tree emerged from mother earth, bearing fruit, wherein is the seed thereof. Ragon finds in Genesis 1 and 2 three distinct creations of sun and corresponding moon in their triads. I use the words sun and moon here, of course, in the same sense in which he correctly says the ancients used them. He thus divides the passage in that terse style which the language of his nation enables him to do with such clearness, and which I here literally translate. First triad, fire, water, air, earth. Fire, first day, creation of light. Water, second day, fermentation of the waters, their division into upper and lower. And air, the firmament is created. Earth, third day, formation of the earth, its vegetability. Second triad, fire, first or fourth day, fermentation of the sun. Water, second or fifth day, fermentation of the waters and of the air, creation of birds and fishes, so air. Earth, third or sixth day, fermentation of the earth, creation of animals and man. Moses, again, takes up in the following chapter the creation of man to form the third triad. Adam is animated by the fire or sun. He receives a companion distinction of the two principles. The first triad shows the vegetable kingdom complete, the second the animal. It appears, then, that man is, as evolutionists assert, an ascent from the mineral to the top of the animal creation, by generation. Not that it was spontaneous, as they pretend, but it took, pla but it took place by divine command, man himself and his consort being, however, specially molded by the divine hand. Nor was the appointed period millions of years, but a double period of three nicthimera, evening mornings or days and nights. It is remarkable, too, that Adam's creation occurring in the second of these periods was only, as it were, the completion of the head of the animal creation, and not separated into a third. The third period of the three nicthimera was reserved for a later date, for a creation when man would be born, not physical nor of earth, but a spiritual man, that is, born directly of water and the Spirit of God, and those were the three days and nights when Christ was in that grave, or emerging from which God said of him, This day have I begotten thee, he being the first fruits of them which sleep. Hebrew chapter 1, verse 5, and 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty. Adam was no regenerator. The creation in Adam fell. Satan waited till it was complete in Adam before he interfered. 
Then he struck the copestone at the top of the edifice and spoilt the whole building. Another had to be built, and the copestone of that he found nothing in. That edifice is not built upwards, but downwards. It is absolutely safe from Satan. Immediately on Satan's act, we hear the principle of generation again mentioned in this connection. Sin is regarded as a generation of Satan, one in which all mankind are born, one out of which we must come if we would have something beyond that of what Adam forfeited, and it must come by a new birth. Attention was to be concentrated on the advent of a new seed, which was to be at enmity with the seed of the serpent. Of this seed of the woman, Noah was the earnest and not Adam. Noah was led by the Spirit, the Comforter, into the ark, that on emerging from the waters he might be figuratively born as a little child, from the door or side of the ark, as it were, born of water and the Spirit. It is Noah, therefore, that we have particularly to consider as setting forth in type the work of the Redeemer. The ancients saw in the flood that one of the productive elements, water, was used for the destruction of creation, and their traditions distinctly point to their belief that there would be another destruction by the corresponding productive element, fire, just as the two are connected together in Peter's epistle. In the 14th and 15th verses of Genesis chapter 1, there is a statement on which I feel compelled to lay very great stress, as its neglect lies at the core of the infidel case. It tells us that the heavenly bodies, the lights, i.e. the sun, moon, and stars, were given us for five distinct purposes. One, to divide the day from the night. Two, for signs. Three, for seasons. Four, for days and years. Five, to give light upon the earth. That our seasons and our calendar are derived from them, all know. The earth could not produce its harvests without them. Neither could we safely dispense with the use of such accurate clocks as they are in our computation of time. But what is the meaning of the word signs here? Of what were they to be the signs? A sign is the symbol, emblem, or token of something else. Of what, then, were the symbols, emblems, or tokens? To reply to this, we must compare Scripture with Scripture. But some may say, and rightly too, that the Scriptures teem with signs, and the meaning is not always exactly the same. Which Scripture, then, shall we select for the analogy? There cannot be a doubt as to which to select. One book and one only in the Bible is said to be a book of signs, and its appropriateness for comparison with Genesis is beyond question. For if Genesis shows us paradise lost, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ which depicts paradise regained. If Genesis is the book which brings the serpent on to the scene, he never shows himself in propria persona. Till we come to the apocalypse, true to his picture of himself with his tail in his mouth, a circle continually turning round and round upon itself, but at last transfixed by the everlasting God. It is the apocalypse which shows us, by signs, the mysteries of God, in which shows the discomfiture of the mysteries of paganism, which were also taught by signs. The signs in the Apocalypse are manifestly taken from the heavenly bodies, the sun, moon, and stars. The signs used in all pagan rites are notoriously drawn from the same source. The word esaminen in Revelation uh, chapter 1 has quite lost its force in the translation signified given in our Bibles. The verb is from the same root as semion, a sign, token, or portent used in the climactic twelfth chapter of this book in the primary meaning of the verb liddell and scott is to show by signs we are thus to understand that this revelation or apocalypse was both sent to john and shown him by signs the fact that it was shown him by signs governs the whole book and explains its peculiar character the verb semeno it is true acquired the common meaning signify but when it comes to be seen how clearly the sun, moon, and stars relate to the whole character of the book, and how difficult it is for any one to show any other use for which God to, uh, could have given the signs, it seems fatal to correct exegesis to uh, give the esemenon any other but the primary meaning connected with Simeon. The Apocalypse is not a book of law or gospel, but a book of destiny. 
The keynote of it is Jesus Christ as the Son of Man, and he is, therefore, placed throughout as his farthest distance from God, who is spoken of as his God, while he himself is placed in the third place in the Trinity. It represents man triumphant over the serpent, just as the signs do. So, too, the ancients understood the heavens to be the book of destiny, a thought they corrupted into astrology, and these points will be discussed more fully in chapters 9 and 11, with reference to that pseudoscience and to a rapture of saints. Meanwhile, it may be as well to remark that the apostle, in using language familiar to his hearers, who in every day confronted in that center the emblems of the mysteries, and were consequently well fitted to confront every species of astrotheology, proceeds in the same order throughout the prophecy as used by astrologers in every age, viz. 1. The seven stars, 2. The door, 3. The destiny of the child, and 4. The square of the twelve houses divided into four triplicities. No one, I presume, will deny that the above is a simple outline of the machinery of the apocalypse. And if we do not grasp the machinery and outline of the book, I would ask how we can possibly expect to understand the details and obtain that blessing promised to us who read, hear, and keep its sayings. Indeed, the triune character of God's dealings with man is thus presented in the Bible. 1. The Old Testament is the book of the kingdom, or law. 2. The New Testament is the book of the gospel, or mercy. And 3. The Apocalypse is the book of the judgment, or destiny. It is too often forgotten that God deals with man not only by the law in the gospel, but he predestinated those whom he chose before the foundation of the world, and their names will be found in the register roll of the new Jerusalem the book of the Lamb is slain from that foundation. Not only are law and mercy in harmony under the divine system, but predestination also. Further, as it is clear from the words which follow in our text, say Genesis chapter 1, 15 through 18, that the purpose for which the heavenly bodies were given was to give light by day and by night, and that when God had formed them, he found everything very good. That particular purpose did not contemplate turning the sun into darkness, the moon into blood, and the stars falling to earth, the very powers of the heavens being shaken. No man was going to be created that he might triumph over Satan and occupy Satan's place in the heaven, uh, heavenlies after their cleansing. It is God's strange work where the devil triumphs over men here below, and the voice from the midheaven goes forth. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil is gone down among you, having great wrath, knowing that he hath but little time. I cannot therefore apply Genesis 1, 14 8, uh, through 18 to the phrase, And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars. The very center and pith of the apocalypse is that passage known as the contents of the little book, the period of the seventh trumpet extending from chapters uh, from 10 through 19. And there in chapter 12 we read, the, the italics are mine, And a great sign was seen in heaven, a woman arrayed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with the child, and she crieth uh, out, travailing in birth and in pain to be delivered. And there was seen another sign in heaven, and behold, a great dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his head seven diadems. And his tail draweth the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was about to be delivered, that when she was delivered he might devour her child. And she was delivered of a son, a man-child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and his throne. With one shriek, the infidel world says, Here is Isis, Ceres, Flora, Diana, Astarte, Semiramis, or by whatever name you may please to call the great universal goddess of paganism, Mirio Nima, as she is sometimes called, the great mother, the queen of heaven, the virgin of popery. She was taken, say they, from the constellations or signs as they are called. In short, they cry, Your Christ is a myth, for they illustrate the truth of Paul's prediction, in 2 Timothy um, 4, 3-4. through 4. 
simply the sun that warms our earth in spring and summer and gives us our harvests, disappearing in autumn and winter and losing his fertilizing power, reappearing in the next year as a little child, and in spring rising into strength as it were a young man with his vigor renewed. Now their reasoning is false. The fallacy arises out of their denial of Genesis. They reject revelation and can therefore learn nothing about the origin of the human race previous to the scattering from Babel. Solar worship is with them the origin of all religions. As to the origin of solar worship itself, that is, of paganism, they can but speculate. They refuse to know God and think, like the child who folds his face in his hands, that their own willful blindness prevents their being seen by God. But they are not wrong when they compare the starry picture of the woman and child fleeing from the face of the serpent with the same thing seen by John, because God gave the sun, moon, and stars for signs. It appears quite certain that this use of the planisphere is what is meant by the permission to use them for signs, so the Chaldean cosmo uh, cosmogony itself, as found in the tablets, expresses it. Blasphemous and wicked as that document is, it can be used as many other wicked document has been to illustrate divine truth, for an unwilling witness is often the most valuable. The statement appended does not look like a contradiction or an uh, alteration, but rather an elaboration of the statement in Genesis 1.14. Thus, it was delightful all that was fixed by the great God, stars, their appearance, and figures of animals he arranged, to fix the year through the observation of their constellations, twelve months or signs, of stars, in three rows he arranged, from the day when the year commences unto the close. Chaldean account of Genesis. It is quite as clear, then, that they understood that the signs were the figures of animals, as it is that they saw uh, their use in determining the seasons in their calendar. It is of great assistance to the doctrine of Christianity in regard to its defense against the arguments of its adversaries, if a firm grasp be obtained of the character of the calendar God committed to Noah. Viewed in connection with the account of the creation, it will display to us not merely the origin of solar worship, i.e. of paganism, but the reason why Christ is called the Son of Righteousness, and how it is that in the Apocalypse the woman, who is evidently clad in the righteousness of Christ, is said to be arrayed with the Son, the words of righteousness, not being expressed in the text but understood. Now, from the facts that the flood commenced in the second month of the seventeenth day of the month, that the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days, and that after the end of 150 days the waters decreased, and the ark rested in the seventh month of the seventeenth day of the month of uh, upon the mountains of Ararat, it follows that five of those months were equal to 150 days, and that therefore the duration of each month was exactly 30 days. Again, the whole period that Noah was in the ark extended from the 600th year of Noah's life. In the second month, on the seventeenth day of the month, to the six hundred and first uh, year. The second month, on the seven and twentieth day of this, the month. He was therefore in the ark just three hundred and seventy days, or twelve months and thirty days each, uh, say one year of three sixty days and ten days over. His stay in the ark marked out three distinct classes of year in the following manner. First, it was evident from the twelve months of the thirty days each that the calendar he was using was that uh, which the Babylonians and early Egyptians employed, and which depended for its divisions upon the sun's passage through the twelve signs of the zodiac. The ancients divided the circle into three hundred and sixty degrees, a division which I shall later endeavor to show was entirely based on the operations of nature, and which we to this day preserve. Our whole systems of astronomy, geography, and geometry maintain this division. In treating of this 360-day year, I shall therefore call it the zodiacal year. Nebuchadnezzar was using the same calendar when God gave him the kingdom, and the predictions of Daniel in the Apocalypse clearly prove that the times of the Gentiles are to be similarly computed. For the 42 months of anti-Christian persecution are equal to the 100 or 1,260 days, which comprise the half of the final of Hebdomad of years of Daniel, 
in uh, chapter 9, 24 through 27. And therefore, in such a calculation, there must be 12 months, each 30 days to the year. It was this same chronology of the flood that Daniel employed with respect to the coming of Messiah as prince, for as Dr. R. Anderson may be considered to have conclusively established, the 69 hebdomads of years of that prophecy occupied 173,880 days, i.e. seven times uh, 69 zodiacal years to the very day. Secondly, the whole period that Noah was uh, in the ark occupied 370 days, and this is also a kind of year. I shall call it the Diluvian year. Like the foregoing, it was a form of year originally stamped by God upon creation. So wait, creation is Osh, which is A and Shin as well in Hebrew. So. Uh, our year is formed by the forward passage of the sun through the 12 signs of the zodiac, and this occupies about 365 and one over four, uh, one fourth days, more accurately, 365.2425 days, uh, say a solar year. But in every year, the sun's passage through the 12 signs is retarded by about 20 minutes. This 20 minutes must, of course, be repeated very often indeed before it can be uh, become a whole year, and thus bring the sun back to his original position in the heavens so as to harmonize with that period of time we call the solar year. In fact, the labors of astronomers who have worked by observation to ascertain what period this compromise or comprises for some 2,000 years and more place it at between 25,820 and 25,900 years, or more than four times the existence of the world. Of course, no such period has ever been completed, but as it is the most important cycle in all astronomy, that science has always had to uh, take the fullest account of it. And it is absolutely certain that existence was regarded by the Chaldean astronomers and astrotheologists as the very foundation of the solar system. It is now known as the precession of the equinoxes. In that period, the sun marches backward through all the, uh, the 12 signs. Now the difference between the zodiacal year and the solar year is about five and one fourth days, or more accurately, 5.2425 days. This difference is called by astronomers the epact. In the whole period of the precession of the equinoxes, this epact is about five and one fourth days, has uh, grown to 370 solar years. Now the proportion of this epact to the diluvian year being 370 years to 370 days is exactly that of a year to a day. God, therefore, here at the flood, has set his seal upon that system, which he again thought fit to use in the book of Numbers, and again in Ezekiel, of giving a year for a day. Uh, Numbers uh, 14, uh, verse 34, and Ezekiel 9, verse 6. Paganism knew of it, for the system of panegyries employed by the later Egyptians, each uh, panegyri, panegyri being 365 years or a year for a day shows that they took full account of it. How they employed it to a yet deeper purpose it will be my task to show later on when we discuss the mysteries. Even the period of procession of the equinoxes they called the year of years as well as the great year of the gods. True scientific obser uh, observation True, scientific observation has never yet told us the exact period of the procession of the equinoxes. There is a difference of 80 years between the different calculations made by astronomers. But, as God seems to point to the employment of it in his word, or rather in the calculations left us to make uh, therefrom, perhaps we shall find that the material given us in the Bible will serve to bring out all we uh, require to know regarding it. For God has revealed us much greater things than science, and in one calculation at least, the most important one in the whole Bible, Revelation 13, uh, verse 18. He teaches us that wisdom and understanding depend upon a knowledge of Christ, and it may be that he will give unto babes what he has withheld from the proud and the learned. When therefore he has deigned to give us the sketch of the whole cosmogony of heaven and earth, and to see in Genesis, it can hardly be presumptuous to look into that book for that material to supplement what his providence has done for us in the so-called discoveries of Kepler, Newton, Herschel, and others. 
I believe that Mr. H. Grattan Guinness will prove to be the discoverer of the exact period of the precession of the equinoxes. He singled out a mean between the two numbers, 25,827 and 25,900 years, which shows between man and the sun the same exact proportion of a year to a day, and this, though not recognized by the scientific men of our day, as having any real foundation in nature, not only appears to have been recognized by the deep medicine men of Memphis and Thebes, the wisdom of the ancients, but actually to have been regarded by them as a foundation truth of nature, so that it lay at the root of all the religion of that very religious nation. Their god, Osiris, was at once man and the sun. Their wisdom was so profound that even God allows them the qualification of wise in his word, and took care that his servant, Moses, should learn the whole of it. Now, Noah, the type of Christ, who is in scripture called the sun and the man, in the account of the flood represented not merely the sun's passage through the twelve signs of the zodiac, forward through the year, and backward through the processional cycle, but he was a man representing Christ, the son of righteousness, assisted by the working of his spirit in the twelve apostles for the regeneration of the world. And of the flood history and types, the myth of Osiris, and all other myths are obvious perversions, perversions not merely for the sake of turning men away from the truth, but, as Paul's epistles plainly teach, having for their object the development out of them of the man of sin. For the sun-man that paganism has worshipped has always been associated with the serpent, who is one with him in its mythology, and who eventually rises from the waves of the abyss after a long sojourn there, as that mythology everywhere shadows forth, his soul remaining in hell, and every bone of his body broken up into pieces and scattered to the winds. This sun-man will eventually be incarnate in Antichrist, and the dragon will give him his power and his throne and great authority. Mr. Guinness, who it may here be fair to observe, is, however, no believer in the personality of Antichrist, takes the statement of the psalmist that man's normal lifetime from birth to death is seventy years, and carefully compares that with sound medical evidence and corroboration thereof, and adds to that the forty weeks that comprise the normal existence of man previous to birth, and working it out into days finds a total of 25,847 days. Perceiving the analogy of the year and day principle between this period and the lifetime of the sun of 25,820 to 25,900 years, he suggests that the correct period of the procession of the equinoxes to be 25,847 years. His conclusion accords with scripture. It accords with the wisdom of the Egyptians who mourned for the dead, who were held to become Osiris. Seventy days being the period we are treating of, the period of the normal lifetime of man, on that very principle, the year and day system, Genesis 1-3. And modern scientific investigation has no objection to offer to it. That the history of the flood seems to have been intended, among other things, to demonstrate this principle of a connection between the year and the day I've already stated. The evidence certainly looks overwhelming. Let us call yet one more witness. All admit that Noah's entry into the ark constitutes a foreshadowing of the death of Christ, and all know that the resting of the ark on Ararat on the 17th Nisan, the very day of the Lord's resurrection, as well as his final emergence from it 220 days later, were intended as a prefigurement of his resurrection. But probably few know what was really the truth, viz., that upon this very year and day principle, the very time of Christ's stay in the grave was divinely set forth. Noah was worshipped in paganism as the fish and as Dagon, a word derived from dog or dag, fish, and on, son, of whose fish head the bishop's mitre is a survival, was simply a pagan perversion of Noah as passing through the waters, just as the mermaid is a superstition of those imaginations which regarded the ark as a female fish. We may take it that one of the types given us by Noah was that of a fish as an emblem of Christ in the grave, for the sign that the Lord gives us. For the sign that the Lord gives of his resurrection is that of Jonah, three days and three nights in the fish's belly. Now the period between the death of the Lord Jesus and his glorious resurrection is computed to have occupied just forty of our hours. 
but the three nicthamera, or day and nights, are, according to oriental methods of reckoning, counted as the Friday, the Saturday, and the Sunday, and although the Friday and the Sunday were both only fractional, the Saturday, or Sabbath, being actually the only entire day and night, as by oriental reckoning fractions are excluded, they are looked upon as if all three were entire. Now, George Stanley Faber, one of the profoundest Christian writers of the present century, and who has proved to demonstration in his Origin of Pagan Idolatry, that the whole system of paganism is derived from the history of the flood, writes something regarding the mystery so important to the subject of the year and day principle that it may be as well to quote it in full. Seeing that the flood was a dramatic foreshadowing of the mis uh, working of the mystery of God, the rites of paganism, i.e. the mysteries, mysteries, alas, of Satan, were a dramatic representation of the mystery of lawlessness, the resurrection of Antichrist from the great abyss of waters, and his stamping his followers with the brand of the serpent. He writes as follows, the italics are mine. The mysteries, therefore, described the great father as being either shut up in an ark or set afloat on the surface of the waters or as being enclosed within one of the many symbols of the Diluvian ship. They represented him as remaining in his state either during a natural year or during the mystical great year of the gods, the procession of the equinoxes, or as a single day viewed as the type of a year. Again, the mysteries, in short, treated of a grand and total regeneration which alike respected the whole world, the great demiurgic parent, and every individual parent or member of the world, hence the golden figure of a serpent, from the faculty which that animal possesses of shedding its skin and coming forth in renovated youth, was placed in the bosom of the initiated as a token that they had experienced the regeneration of the mysteries. Now, as the initiate had to mimic the drama which Noah alone, by divine authority enacted, he was shut up in a coffin, or in darkness an imitation of Noah's entry into the ark, which typified the descent of Christ into the tomb. It ought to be more widely known that Christ himself descended not only into Hades or Sheol, but into the pit of the great watery abyss of Abaddon, Romans 10.7. The beautiful 69th Psalm, seven times quoted in the New Testament, and the 88th state this, and the 130th in collateral. Hence, he is compared to the ark, and baptism is uh, the likeness of his death. His prayer to be saved from the deep mine goes to prove that the waters of the his prayer to be saved from the deep mire goes to prove that the waters of the chaos out of which the cosmos was formed. So that brings a whole another connection to the three three three, Jesus Christ and Genesis one one and which overwhelmed it at the flood, are still in existence. Abyssos, so yeah, O oh, Abyssos. In Luke 8, 31 is rendered the deep and the abyss. So Faber writes, the aspirants were usually compelled to remain in this dismal state of darkness and discomfort, no less a period than three days, computed after the Oriental manner. That is to say, they entered into the artificial Hades the evening of the first day and were not liberated till the morning of the third day. The genuine period of confinement, therefore, during the progress through the smaller mysteries was three oriental days. In these days, when we uh, recollect the manifest character of Osiris, related to the period during which Noah was shut up in the ark, for putting each day for a year, according to the mystic eastern mode of reckoning, we shall find that he entered into the ark towards the close of one year and remained in it a complete second year, and quitted in the commencement of the third year. Item, uh, page 156. The learned author of the work quoted from then shows how God turned upon the Egyptians this three days darkness of their mystic rites in the plague he then sent. How utterly they were confounded. The 17th Nisan was approaching, and that great sundial, the great pyramid of Giza, was marking the period was marking the period for the resurrection of their own god, for Osiris was fabled to rise on 17th Nisan, the day of the ark's resting, when, lo, the waters drowned them, and Israel, relying on the blood of the Lamb, passed unscathed through them under the leadership of him who the Egyptians themselves had taken out of the ark, the Lord, who had told Noah to follow him into the ark, 
having preceded them through the glassy walls of the Red Sea. The history of the flood, therefore, in connection with the account of the creation, not merely establishes the year and day principle, but shows why Osiris and Attis were fabled to be th uh, three nicthamera, or day and nights, in the tomb. The earth itself at creation was three nicthamera in the waters of the chaos. Genesis 1, uh, verses 1 through 13. Adam and Noah in the theosophy of paganism were merged into one personality, a subject I must, however, reserve for later development. And just as vegetation was completed in three nicthamera, or nicthemera, in the animal creation in a like period, so a similar period was connected with Noah as the son of a new creation. I have thus enumerated two out of three forms of year marked out by the history of Noah's stay in the Ark at the Flood. A third form of year is obviously the mean between these two, the year of 365 days, used by the later Egyptians and called the vague year, and which is the basis of the Julian, Gregorian, and solar years. The intention, however, is to demonstrate it as the basis for the true solar year midst fractions being always omitted in scripture. All who know anything of our present calendar are aware that we reckon 365 days to the year in general, and 366 days for every fourth year, reckoning every century one leap year as an ordinary year of 365 days. The ancients probably originally worked their 360 to 370 day year into a 365 day year, and thus used it, as we do, by intercalating one day in four and then omitting, as we do, some of the intercalary days at stated intervals. Thus, the author of an anonymous work called Palmoni, published by Longmans in the year 1851, writes, apropos, of the calendar of the flood, the sum of the days of Noah was in the ark is 370, which is alone sufficient to refute the theory of those who, knowing no such year as one of 370 days, nevertheless argue that the diluvian months contained 30 days. And the chief result given out by this view would be that the year of deluge was an old Egyptian year, plus an intercalation of 10 days, making a 370-day cycle. The origin of this cycle might be found, if it were allowable to suppose at some time or other that the epigomenae were placed in alternate years at the beginning and at the end of the year, thus 360 plus 5 plus 5, or 370 plus 360. What he means is this. According to Herodotus, the Egyptians reckoned in this day 12 months of 30 days to their year, and then threw in the five days epact at the end of the year. They might therefore, in more ancient times, times which would approximate the date of the dispersion from Babel, and therefore more nearly approach the period immediately following the institution of this calendar at the flood, have added the five days to the end of one year, and then commenced the ensuring year with the five days epact, thus giving between two years of 360 days an intermediate period of ten days, subdivided into two smaller periods of five days each. I have thus endeavored to show that Noah's calendar takes account of three distinct forms of year, all astronomical in their essence and having a distinctly marked connection, not merely with the sun's forward march through the twelve signs of the zodiac in the common year, but with his backward halting through those same twelve signs in the great year, or procession of the equinoxes. We have thus seen him as a type of Christ, both as the man whose death and resurrection salvation is brought to mankind, and as the son of righteousness bringing healing in his wings. In between the sun and the man, we have seen that a year has been given for a day and a day for a year, the normal lifetime of a man bearing upon that principle, the same relationship to the great year of the procession of the equinoxes as a day does to a year and vice versa. But the connection does not end here. The subject is of such vast importance that I must ask the reader's patient indulgence, while I essay to point out its further developments, in connection both with the mystery of God incarnate in Christ, the Word made flesh, and with Satan's wicked and blasphemous counterpart, the mystery of lawlessness, which is to be incarnate in his own logos, the man of sin. It will be noticed that if the two systems of 360 days and 370 days to the year 
instituted at the flood were allowed to run on, the latter would continually outstrip the former. It will be interesting then to determine at what period these two forms of year will harmonize so as to form a complete cycle out of the two of them. It can be easily determined by ascertaining what is their least common multiple, that is, the smallest number which can be a multiple of both 360 and 370. That figure is 13,320. It contains 360 37 times and 370 36 times. Now, 13,320 is also 15 times 888 and 20 times 666. That is, it is also a multiple of both 888 and 666. These two numbers, 888 and 666, have a meaning in scripture and a corresponding application in astronomy of the utmost importance in the discernment of the inner character of these mysteries. We know that from the words of God himself, the latter is called the number of the beast, i.e. of the Antichrist, and said to be the number of his name. The latter phrase implies that in one or all of the three languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, the three, be it observed, in which the words were inscribed on the cross, in which letters stand for figures, that man's name will contain the number 666. But very much more than a mere means of identifying the Antichrist is comprised in the text of Revelation 13:18, from which it is taken. The introductory words, here is wisdom, would seem to imply that God is propounding a deep enigma. And when he continues by connecting wisdom and understanding with numbers pertaining to the Antichrist, we are irresistibly drawn to the closing paragraph of the book of Daniel, the prophet who was told, the wise shall understand. The understanding one is directed to compute the number of the beast. The Greek word used, sepixo, or sepizo, has the force of the phrase to make calculations, and differs from the ordinary Greek word for to count, which is arithmio. It means primarily to use the cephos, or the abacus. So it makes me think of isopsophia, isopsophy, upon which the ancients made their calculations. Now, as astronomy lies at the basis of all cognate mathematics, and as most of the leading numbers in scripture are astronomical, and this one, as I shall presently show, is so preeminently, and as it is distinctly predicted that men shall turn their ears away from the truth and turn them aside unto myths, Greek mythoi, and all myths are solar myths, God forewarns us to be careful, as the number 666 is a number of a man, and that is to be the reason of the computation. The Greek does not read, for it is the number of a man, but for it is a number of a man. The correction is important, as the man whose number the beast assumes may have more than one number, and the beast is selected the most suitable to his own purpose. The warning is apparently to the effect that solar worship, which will culminate in the worship of the dragon and the beast, proceeds really from the worship of a man who actually existed, and we have to find out whom it fits. Let it be particularly noted that Antichrist himself, although really a man, the man of sin, is never called so in the Apocalypse. He is always the beast in the book of Revelation. It therefore appears that a man must be someone else, and the riddle then will be to find out who that someone else is. The word itself seems to give us a hint as to the solution. We shall find that the man, Noah, appears to fit all the requirements of the enigma. That is to say, Satan purloins from Noah one of his numbers for purposes of perversion. The origin of every pagan god was Noah in the ark, worshipped as the sun passing through the twelve signs of the zodiac, with that blasphemous and wicked appendage of the sign of the serpent, and the name of nearly every pagan god was somehow made to spell out 666. We have a suggestion of this in the Greek word nuos, used to express understanding in the text, for Noah was worshipped as the divine intelligence, and the word nuos is derived in part, as Faber points out, from the very name of Noah. Thus will the folly and inconsistency of human wickedness be manifest. Mankind first worship Noah, then they brand themselves for four thousand years with all the symbolography of the flood, then they deny that there was ever such a man as Noah, 
then finally they worship a man who, in crowning onto himself all that same symbolography, and whose pride discovers that the devil made it a point to himself, actually as a number of Noah, the number of almost every pagan god, 666, with him wherever he goes, and stamps it on every coin, and on the foreheads and right hands of his followers. Per contra, 888 is the number formed by the sum of the letters of the name Jesus. Per contra, 888 is the number formed by the sum of the letters of the name Isus, or Jesus. Now, 666 is not said to be the number of Noah's name. 58 and not 666 was the number of Noah's name. But that number, 666, as well as the number 888, is connected with Noah, and both are found in the grand cycle of the procession of the equinoxes. The following will show how, in addition to the instance of LCM of the 360 days and 370 days of the period he was in the ark, Noah was connected with these two numbers. The figuration of the name of Noah is 58, Shem is 340, and Japhet is 490. Total, omitting the name of the apostate Ham, is 888, which is the very number of the name of Jesus. Again, the figuration of the name of Noah is 58. Ham, if we're allowed the last letter to be reckoned with the final mem, is 608, totaling again 666. The two mysteries are thus contrasted at the flood, but the number 666 is not of itself a bad number, and we must not, under the circumstances, be surprised to see it appear elsewhere more than once as a number of Noah. Thus, the figuration of the name of Noah is 58, the number of persons in the ark were 8, and the number of years of Noah at the time of the flood were 600. Total, 666. It will be noticed that one of these three figures is a cycle of time, another a number of persons placed together in scripture in a particular connection, whilst the third is the figuration of a man's name. I submit the following arguments in support of my position. 1. All the three figures are in the word of God. 2. All are in the account of the flood. 3. They make up the only number the scriptures bid us to compute. And 4. The whole inquiry is an investigation into paganism. In 600, 608, and 666 are, as a matter of fact, the precise series of figures that paganism employed and emphasized. So, again, Anachalypsis and the canon come up because... As I said in post 58, um, the 58 and the 608 are it's numerous uh, ways of looking at that. Is again the uh, Ha Abin and the Freya, um, the fire and the stone, etc. Five God's dealings with man are usually tripartite, and these happening to be the precise three methods in which He employs number the movements of heavenly bodies based on geometrical laws, the total persons he places together in a particular connection, and the figuration of words, particularly as the very number we are enjoined to compute is itself a trinity in unity of sixes. 6. I can show precedent for associating together apparently incongruous figures. If I am in error and the analogy is the mere result of chance, I am so in very good company. Irenaeus, who lived at the time when the mysteries were in repute, and was probably an ex initiate, who was himself the disciple of John's disciple Polycarp, took this very number of the years of Noah at the time of the flood and connected it with the cubits of the image of Nebuchadnezzar. He noticed that the six hundred of Noah's lifetime, the sixty of the height of the image, and the six of its breadth, the chai, the zai, and the sigma or didyma of the text, Irenaeus, or his confreres, uh, will probably have known that the Emperor Nero claimed to be the 10th Avatar, that 600 was one of the Nero's or Avatar cycles, and that paganism connected the deluge with the setting up of an image on behalf of its logos. Seeing that similar myths to the legend of Li Yul, which connects the flood and a great image to come in the last days, will have been common enough in this time and he had before him various data which have since been entirely lost to the world. Moreover, he says that witnesses personally acquainted with John testify in favor of this reading. 
for the use of the letter M as a final to express 600 in the name of Ham, we appear to have no precedent in Scripture. Is that a sufficient ground for rejecting all thought that God intended us to contrast the 888, which is the number of Jesus given us by him in the joint figuration of Noah and his faithful sons with the 666, which is the number of Antichrist, which seems to exist in the joint figurations of Noah and his apostate son? I submit the following considerations. It is not God's intention that we should always look inwards towards the scriptures to apply their sayings, but to look outwards from them into the world around us. Antichrist is not going to hide this number 666 from us. He is going to blazon it forth. And if it happened to exist in his name in Hebrew, I should look for it occurring in the Hebrew of his own day, rather than that of days gone by. As Mr. Groves points out in his Echoes, Pharaoh is his greatest antitype, and we may suppose he will wish to associate himself not only with the land of Ham, but with Ham himself. Cassini points out that the mem final is placed in the middle of a word in the book of Isaiah, Lambda Ba, and as nothing occurs in the Bible by accident, some reason must exist for this. Whether or not we know what that reason is. Directly, we make use of this license, we perceive that in Minu, the name by which, with slight alterations, Noah was called all over the world, in Europe, Asia, and Africa, Minos, Mena, Menu, apparently derived from Himnu, the number 666, springs into light. Apparently derived from Himnu, the number 666 springs to light, and applying the same to the Hebrew letter M itself, sometimes called Muin. It also reads 666. Mem final vav yad nun. I believe that when a letter expressed two numbers, the ancients applied them indiscriminately to make up the names of their gods and even borrowed from foreign languages, that the brotherhood of the whole human race might be set forth in opposition to the confusion of tongues. Groves employs the M throughout his work as 600. It occurring at the beginning of a word seems to me of special interest. For the Hebrew letters being derived from the signs of the zodiac, through which the sun marched both backwards and forwards, are already shown, will probably have led to the system of Boustrophedon reading that prevailed among ancient nations. In that way, the word muin, or muin, which seems to me clearly to be the same as muni, Menevis in Memphis, and minu, minos, plainly reads 666 in modern Hebrew which is presumably the Hebrew of Antichrist's day. The Muni or Muni of the legend of Li Yul seems also the same. Some persons are under the impression that 666 is a very wicked number. They forget that God made mathematics, that mathematics includes the number 666, and that God at creation saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The sense of the condemnation in the apocalypse is the use that it is put to, not the number itself, when the branding of the forehead or the right hand, when the branding of the forehead or the right hand with that number becomes a token of blasphemous defiance of Almighty God, then, and under those circumstances, there is mischief in the number. And I may here mention that whenever I find this number appear alone, that is, unconnected with either 777 or 888 in Scripture, in scripture, the sense is usually a sinister one, as in the remarkable passage in which the Lord's disciples express fear of shipwreck, say, Apollo, Apollimitha, or Metha, we perish, Polymetha or Apollometha, in Matthew 8, chapter, or chapter 8, verse 25, we perish, and in the figuration of the slave offspring of Leah and Rachel. Leah, 36, plus Zilpah, 122, plus Gad, 7, plus Asher, 501, and Bilhah, and Bilhah, 42, plus Dan, 54, plus Naphtali, 570. An arrangement which, showing seven names thus divided into four and three, the unusual division of seven, I dare not suppose to have found its way into the word of God by accident, or in any other way but by express intention of God himself. But the most remarkable instance of the connection of Noah with the number 666 
arises out of the divinely recorded derivation of his name. His name, written in Hebrew, Nun Cheth, uh, Nach, or Na, seems to have had the pronunciation Nu. The word used in Genesis 29 expressing comfort is Imnu, the last syllable of which is usually written Nu, the last two syllables changing the U into the H in accordance with the change adopted in scripture from this word to Noah's name as just explained, would be hum, or hymna. And this hymna can easily be shown to have been freely adopted by paganism to represent Noah as 666, which is its nota numerica, and reads Ham 608, Noah 58. The first king of Egypt is said to be Minu or Minos, Memphinal, Memphinal 600, Yod 10, Nun 50, and Vav 6, total 666, or Mina, Mina 651, a number I shall allude to later, which becomes by a transversion of syllables, not uncommon in hieroglyph, Amen, a name for the Egyptian god meaning the hidden one. Sace's Ancient Empires of the East, page 65. Because Noah was hidden in the ark, Amon or Amon, or Hemon, i.e. Ham Noah. The sacred song of Hymnus, English hymn, is also from Hymna, and as Noah was regarded as espoused by baptism to the ark, held to be the emblem of the earth and sea, the female elements, he was Hymen, the god of wedlock. A number of a man in Revelation 13.18 seems certainly to point to this scripture. Genesis verse 29, if it be thus plainly established that the sun god of paganism, whose number is always sits at six, is the Hebrew hymna, the comforter, and when that precious gift that came at Pentecost is withdrawn, all those who dwell upon the earth whose names are not in the Lamb's register roll will be espoused to Antichrist in the forehead baptism that he will introduce. Antichrist is the beast from the sea, and the false prophet the beast from the earth, arising to dispute with Christ his possession of those elements, Revelation 13, 11, and in 10, 1 through 2, it will be a baptism into his death into eternal torment. By Boustrophedon reading, Amen, or Amun, becomes Numa, and by hieroglyphic inversion, menu becomes numen, a word that means god or oracle. Omen is equivalent to amen, and amun re, amenoph, and amoneth, Egyptian gods, are all 666 in Coptic and in Greek. Finally, Noah was 666 years when Eber, the father who gave his name to the Hebrew nation, was born. It will be noticed that the Epsilon is here used and not the Eta. Groves, who writes learnedly on the use of the E in numeration, supposes the long E to be of posterior date to the short one, as in the case of the letter O, but this does not seem probable. I rather think, however, that as the pronunciation differed so slightly in making up the names of their gods, the priests reserved to themselves a convenient latitude in the case of this letter. Baal Zephon is also the hidden sun, the Phoenician Amun Re. In being 666 in Greek, probably Groves is right in his theory as to the use of the Omicron in it in place of the Omega. But we have already seen the connection between Noah and his calendar with the signs of the zodiac in God's creation, which before the fall was pronounced very good. Let us therefore once more turn to the first chapter of Genesis and see how God has figured the words he then spoke. For he created all things by the words of it, or the word of his mouth. We shall find both these numbers, 666 and 888, there, and what God then did was very good. One of the great difficulties we have to deal with in these subjects arises from the fact that the Kabbalists, had also perceived that the figurations of the Pentateuch were connected with a similar system existing in nature, and such is the disgust which their lucubrations 
on the subject have produced, that it is extremely difficult to sever the whole matter from their evil teachings. There uh, are two things, however, that should prevent us as Christians from being dismayed at the fact of their having employed them. It was not the Kabbalists who placed their figurations in the books of Moses, but God himself, and who shall dare to challenge the expediency of what God has done. Two, facts of themselves are often fallacious, and figures still more so. Indeed, it is a proverb that nothing is so false as facts except figures. The Kabbalists, not knowing the Son of God, were blinded regarding the meaning of the Old Testament. Need we share their blindness? Or must we deny palpable facts actually found in the Word in fear of doing so? So, the intermediate number, 777, is there also. Thus, the work of the first day, the creation of light, gives the following curious numerical result. And God said, which is in Liber 777, well, uh, Sefer Sephiroth, so 500, but that it's 343, or 7 times 7 times 7, let there be light, 232, and there was light, 238, being 813, and saw, 217, God, 86, the 401, light, 212, that it was 30, good, 17, 963, and and divided, 52, God, 86, the 62, light, 212, from the 68, darkness, Chosek, 333 also 813. So 1776 and 1776. A and C are numerically identical. Either of them added to B gives the number 1776, which is the double of 888. And B and C each consist of six words in Hebrew, of which one is doubled. A picture designed, as I conceive, to present the twelve signs of the zodiac, divided at the equinoxes, which separate the long days from the long nights, the light from the darkness, one of which in each hemisphere, Gemini and Pisces, was doubled, i.e. represented by two figures instead of one, the former a man and a woman, the latter two fishes. Next we have the same number, 888, in the creation of the firmament. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. As for Nota Numerica, 4,440, or five times 888. So also in the appointment of the heavenly bodies for signs and for seasons and for days and years. The very verse we have seen so pregnant with instruction in our subject. These remarkable trines appear. Thus, and God said is 7 times 7 times 7, or 343, let there be lights, 666, in the firmament of heaven, 777. The work of the third day in creation of vegetation is given in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, amounts to 15,984, which is a multiple of both 888 and 666, for it is 18 times the former and 24 times the latter. Here, too, God connects man with light in the same marvelous way that he connects Christ, the last Adam, with the Son in the numerical system of creation. Thus compare, and God said, 343, let us make man in our own image, 470, 813, with, and God said, 343, let there be light, and there was light, 470, being also 813. Nay, the very book of Genesis is divided into as many parts as there are signs in the zodiac by the phrase, Now these are the generations whose nota numerica is 888, the number of Jesus, who is Christ, the regenerator. Vale tau uluf, or vav alef lamed he, tau, vav lamed deleth, vav tau. Again, we have among the twelve patriarchs between whom, between whom and the twelve signs a very obvious connection exists, 
the following interesting combinations. 2. Simeon, 466, and Levi, 46, being 512, or 8 times 8 times 8, while Reuben, Simeon, and Levi equal 777, i.e. 3 times the number of Reuben. And 1. Reuben, 259, 4. Judah, 30, Zebulon, 95, Issachar, 830, Dan, 54, Gad, 7, Asher, 501, Naphtali, 570, Joseph, 156, and Benjamin, 162, making 2,664 the LCM of 888 and 666, totaling 3,176. The slave offspring of Bilhah and Zilpah were each shown to give 666, so that the numbers 666, 777, and 888 each appear in the figurations of the tribes. Then the words constantly in the Lord's mouth, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Amen, Amen, Lego, you mean, or umen, um, amount to 1536, or 1536, or 8 times 8 times 8 times 3, evidently a cosmogonic number, being the number of years from creation to the commencement of the building of the ark. I could fill a large volume with these evidences of the supernatural character of the Bible in number, and the analogy with astronomy, that is, the analogy between two works of the same divine author, the Word and the universe. But let these instances of figuration suffice for our purpose, crowning them with the remarkable trine which the words on the cross set forth. For Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, is 7,215. Oidus estin Isus o Nazareos o Basilius ton Judeon, that is, 13 times 555, or 5 times 666 plus 777, the word for cross, staros, cross being moreover 777. If, as infidels suggest, Moses, while suppressing idolatry, found himself unable to lead the Israelites away from the imagery of the celestial signs and geometrical numbers, they will require to explain how it is that he actually figured his words with these very numbers, which it must have been easy enough to avoid, as nothing but the most consummate skill could have so inserted them in the Pentateuch in their proper place, that is, where creation and renovation are concerned, say, numbers of geometry, for purposes of geology, with such ease and grace that the wording in no single instance appears strained. Let us now proceed to the connection of 888 and 666 with astronomy. We shall find them both in the procession of the equinoxes, and the latter in the eclipse cycles. The ancients, as far as we have any positive information, had not the telescope. The antediluvians may have had it for all we know. The postdiluvians had not. But God did not, for all that, leave them without the means of making all the computations they really required. The movements of the moon can be observed so well with the naked eye that, in the course of a single night, her course through the starry heavens can be distinctly tracked. She is the great timepiece of nature, a chronometer direct from the hands of God himself. So correct is she that the eclipses are predicted by astronomers within a minute of their occurrence, for they are all either the result of the moon's interposition between us and the sun, or the moon herself being eclipsed, whatever be the cause of the latter phenomenon. And the four great ellipse cycles, to which I shall presently have occasion to allude, are at the foundation of all the calculations of astronomers under all systems. From the prophecy of 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 3 through 10, it is quite plain to me that some wrong system of worlds is to be used in the last days as a lever for rebellion against God. But, important as that part of the system is, to say much about it in this issue might withdraw attention from the character of the apostasy itself in the secret springs I am endeavoring to expose. Suffice it to say, for the present, that I cannot regard as conclusive any system which its promulgators teach me is based upon circumstantial and cumulative evidence alone, and which they ask me to accept on the mere ground that they themselves find it impossible 
to imagine any other to fit a certain series of astronomical phenomena. Before I can do that, I must have either proper philosophical verification, or it must be shown to me to have been in the mind of the inspired writer of the first chapter of Genesis. History tells us that was exactly what they did. They took the moon as their great clock. They called the moon the numberer. And to show what great stress they laid upon this fact, it should be particularly noted that number in the abstract was a principle that lay at the root of their religious philosophy, and they called number the father of gods and men. Athanasius Kircher, in the dedication to the Emperor Ferdinand III of the mathematical portion of his great work, Oedipus Egyptiacus, written in the middle of the 17th century, a work treating in the most learned way of the arithmetical and geometrical symbols and enigmas of the ancients, traces the whole to the families who immediately followed the flood, and pursues it through Chaldea into Egypt, taking thither by Semiramis, uh, the wife of Nimrod, and there written in stone monuments to be handed down to posterity. And there he declares to us that none was conceded the office of priest or religious teacher without he showed himself thoroughly imbued with the mathematical genius as the recondite mystery of their sacred theosophy was confused within arithmetical and geometrical symbolography. For this, the advance of science during the last few years has proved there was a basis in nature. For the great physical forces, heat, light, sound, and electricity, are now known to be really the same power with simply the number of vibrations in a given space of time varying that is, the relations of force to substance, whenever action takes place, depend on a great law of number. The moon was called the sun's boat. She was held to be identical with the ark, hence the well-known symbol of the lunette. In those latitudes, the crescent often assumes the above shape, like a boat. And just as the ark with Noah in it, who was the sun, passed through the twelve signs of the zodiac during that significant year. So did they recognize the moon as marking out number in the sun's passage in the heavens through the twelve signs in the processional cycle. They saw that she marked out the three Noachian numbers, 360, 888, and 666. Here is the proof. So wait, one, there is a harmony in the order of nature beyond that we can account for. It is enough to record the phenomenon. We need not seek to explain the cause of it. Here is the proof. The period of 25,847 year days of the sun man need not, for the purposes of Mr. Guinness, be exact as days to the hour, nor as years to the month. The ancients dispensed with fractions to avoid mixed numbers, and 25,846 to 25,848 year days is quite near enough the mark. We may therefore quite fairly regard it as 25,846 and three-fourth year days. In years, therefore, as the processional cycle, I select 25,846 years, in nine lunations, i.e. lunar months, as the mean. The lunar month comprises accurately 29.53059 days, and the solar year is, according to the Gregorian reckoning, 365.2425 days, a figure which is sufficiently accurate for the purpose. Reducing, therefore, 25,846 years and nine lunations to lunations, we find that it consists of 319,680 lunations. Next, let us arrange these 319,680 lunations according to the division of the heavens into the 12 signs of each 30 degrees, and we shall see how perfectly in accordance with nature this division of the circle has been. For 888 lunations make one degree, 30 times 888 equals 26,640 lunations, which make one sign, and 12 times 30, being 360 times 888, is 319,680 lunations, making one processional cycle. 
Further, the period of twelve lunar months constitutes a form of year I have not hitherto mentioned. It is called the lunar year, and when we come to discuss the Hebrew calendar and the eclipse cycles, we shall see that that form of year also is an institution direct from the hand of God himself. At present, all I will say is that it follows from the foregoing calculation that not only do 26,640 lunations constitute one sign, but as 12 lunations go to the lunar year, the total period of 319,680 lunations which comprise the cycle may also be expressed as 26,640 lunar years. The total period of 319,680 lunation amounts, as it will be noticed, to 360 times 888, and thus 888, which is the number of the name of the Lord Jesus, or Jesus, and which appears in Genesis 1 as connected with the creation of light and life, or generation, represents the degree of this circle connected with the light of the sun and the life of man, and is the great unit of the foregoing arithmetical table. In a subordinate position to these two numbers is the number 666, which has not appeared in the table, that number which I have also shown is connected with Noah. It will be noticed that the number 13,320, which in days constitutes the great harmonizing cycle of the zodiacal, or 360-day year, with the Diluvian, or 370-day year, before alluded to, is exactly half of the number 26,640, which expressed in lunar years constitutes the processional cycle. It may be called the number of the hemisphere. The mean selected by Mr. Guinness for the reasons he gives, and adopted in this work, which gives 888 lunations for the degree in this great cycle, is so close even to the extremes of 25,900 and 25,827 years that it does not differ from either of them by more than two lunations. I shall later show that 888 is an important geometrical figure. While it does not appear that 890 or 889 or 887 have any specific geometrical character, any of these three numbers is so near to 888 and at once to suggest that 888 is the most likely figure to expect in such an important place at the hands of a creator who made all things in perfect harmony and beauty. It is not contended that we have uh, inductive proof of the accuracy of the mean, that is, that the period consists of 360 times 888 lunations, neither more nor less, but it is urged that suggestions of this class bearing in themselves a high degree of probability of their correctness, are often of great value. As would appear from the following remarks of one of the greatest reasoners this century has produced, with reference to the method employed by Kepler in achieving his great discovery of the ellipticity of planetary motion. In the first place, we may observe that the leading thought which suggest, uh, suggested and animated all Kepler's attempts was true, in the first place, we may observe that the leading thought which suggested and animated all Kepler's attempts was true, and we may add sagacious and philosophical, namely that there must be some numerical or geometrical relations among the times, distances, and velocities of the revolving bodies of the solar system. This settled and constant conviction of an important truth regulated all the conjectures, apparently so capricious and fanciful which he made and examined respecting particular relations in the system. In the next place, we may venture to say that advances in knowledge are not commonly made without previous exercise of some boldness and license in guessing. The discovery of new truths requires, undoubtedly, minds careful and scrupulous in examining what is suggested, but it requires no less, such as are quick and fertile in suggesting. Wells' Inductive Sciences, 1847, Next, we ought to take account of the fact that the 40 days' reign occupy a peculiar position in these mysteries. In the divine mystery, they find the counterpart in the 40 days' fast of the Lord Jesus on entering upon his ministry. In the satanic, they are the 40 days' weeping of Tammuz, 
for Adonis, for Osiris, in the forty days of Lent of the Papists and the Ritualists. We may then perhaps divide the cycle of 26,640 lunar years into forty parts, and when we do so, we find that each such fortieth part consists of exactly 666 lunar years. As tending to prove that this actually was done by the ancients, we must consider the cherubim and the division of the circle to the four winds of heaven. I shall refer to it more fully when we come to the subject of the four-square projection of the heavenly circle or planisphere. Suffice it for the moment to depict the circle as so divided by the ancients. Thus, 6,660 lunar years are seen in each quarter of the circle, and the pagan wafer, which the Church of Rome has taken over, and which even in Protestant England is eaten on Good Friday, was taken from this emblem of the sun ripening the harvest, circular, in accordance with his shape and the moons. From the above emblem, too, was apparently derived the celebrated cycle of the Chaldeans called the Saras. For this, I submit the following line of argument. Professor Max Muller, writing in the 19th century, for October 1885 on the subject of solar myths, states that the root word of all mythology in his opinion, is Sar, the ripening corn. Before concluding this essay, however, we shall see that the word Nahash, serpent, may fairly challenge competition with it. It is probable, too, that the Hebrew Zero, or Zro, is the original word corresponding to the Chaldean Sar. But let these matters pass for the present. About the termination us, in Saras, I shall have more to say in the next chapter. This connects the circular emblem crossed in the center, our discussion on the cross I must also defer to the next chapter, with the word Saras. The following extract from Higgins' Anacalypsis will show the connection of the Saras with the division of the circle into four times 6,660. General Valancey says, the Saras, according to Barosis, consisted of 6,660 days. Sincilus and Abidinus tell us that it was a period of 3,600 years, but Suidus, an author contemporary with uh, Sincilus, says that Saris was a period of lunar months amounting to 18 years and a half, or 222 moons. Pliny mentions a period of 223 lunar months, which Dr. Halley thinks is a false reading, and proposes the amendment by reading 18 years and six intercalary months which agrees with Suidus. But it is not the simple Saras, but the tenfold Saras that makes this number, as will appear from the numerical or celestial alphabet. General Valancey gives the following proof. Shin, Ayin, Resh, Vav, and Zadi times 10, 6,660. And 360 times 18 being 6,480 plus 180, being 6,660, or 222 times 30. It is not necessary to observe the whole statement, and I must observe uh, that what General Valancey calls a lunar month is not a lunar month, but a zodiacal or 30-day month. His proof, then, is sufficiently clear. For 18 and a half zodiacal, or 360-day years, are 6,660 days. And this number, 6,660, is exactly ten times the nota numerica of the word Saras in its original Chaldee. I hope, therefore, the reader will now consider the proof complete that the calendar committed to Noah at the flood displays him as a great type of Christ as the Son Man, the Son of Righteousness, the Man of God, a Son passing through the twelve signs of the Zodiac as a great type of the Christ who sent twelve apostles into the world that the Holy Ghost, through them, might form his church from the great regeneration that will be manifested at the time of the end. In God's creation numbers given in Genesis, we have seen number as at the root of all science, completely vindicating the ultra-scientific character of the much despised and neglected Pentateuch, and prominent amongst those figurations are the Noetic, or Noetic 888 and 666 the numbers respectively of God's man and Satan's man, and the great foundation numbers of the cycle of procession, 
of the equinoxes as alike marked out by the ark and the moon, two emblems which are joined in one by the symbol of the lunette. It may be as well now to try and account for the way Hipparchus came to represent this period of the procession of the equinoxes, which he calls the great year of the gods, as 25,920 years and not 25,846 and three-fourths years. The reader will have observed that 666, or 666, 777, and 888 are three great cosmic numbers, and that each is viewed as three and one, that is, severally three sixes and one, three sevens and one, and three eights and one. In these three successive numbers, six, seven, and eight, form a triad in themselves whose sum is a trine of sevens, six plus seven plus eight, equaling seven plus seven plus seven. Further, he has seen how the year Noah passed in the ark is a trinity and unity of years on the principle of avoidance of fractions. Just so may the procession of the equinoxes have been mystically viewed as 25,846, 25,847, in 25,848 years, say, 6, 7, and 8, 3 and 1. For every cycle is viewed as living, dying, and rising again. This was the principle of the phoenix, a word which the Abbey Rocher proves to be derived from the phania, Hebrew pone, or pon, pon, part of the name bestowed by Pharaoh on Joseph and which may be fa, the, ea, or ah, great, and na, Noah, thus the great Noah. The phoenix was a bird which was fabled to die every so many years, and rise again from its own ashes. Of this, anon. Now taking 25,848 as the number in its fullness, according to the phoenix principle of avoidance of fractions, we see it divides exactly into the factors 72 and 359, for 72 times 359 is 25,848. Of these, the number 359 or 359 is, on the same principle, an incomplete 360, being just one short, and 360 is the number of degrees in the great processional cycle. There are thus 72 links in the chain of 360, which actually amount to 25,848, and could be mystically represented as 25,920. Thus, too, each sign was represented as containing 2,160 years, which is a trine of sixes, say 6 times 6 times 60 years. 72 was a most important mystic number. There were 72 men in the Jewish Sanhedrin. Uh, in mythology, the greatest prominence is given to the number 72. The 42 assessors of Osiris and the 30 judges of Egypt made up 72. In the Osiris myth, the followers of Typhon are 72, who were, were represented to have cast Osiris into the Nile, or flood of waters. Higgins writes in Anachalypsis, volume 1, page 340, Iswara, or Ishwara, an Indian Osiris, is called Arga Natha, or Lord of the Broad-Shaped Vessel, and Osiris, or Isiris, as Hellenicus calls him, was, according to Plutarch, the commander of the Argo, and was represented by the Egyptians in their processions in a boat carried, carried by 72 men. Again, page 402, he says, the Persians had a title, Soliman, equivalent to the Greek Iolos in implying universal cosmocrator, who believed they possessed the universal empire of the whole earth. The ark is always the symbol of this. All the earth is mine, says the Lord in Exodus 19, verses 5 through 6. And Thamarath aspired to this rank, but the divine Argang, in whose galley were 72 Solomons, contended with him for the supremacy. This Argang was the head of the League of Argioi, and the number 72 is that of the kings subject to the King of Kings. See Herbal Hut in Boki Solomon, Nimrod, Volume 3, page 12. 
Professor Sais writes, The standard work on astronomy and astrology in ancient Babylonia was that in 72 books, compiled for the library of Sargon at Akkad, and uh, entitled The Observations of Bel in The Ancient Empires of the East, page 173. To sum up, they seem to have known that 72 times the number of days Noah was in the ark, 370, made up 26,640, the number of lunar years in the procession of the equinoxes. Hence, the probable origin of the pagan idea of 72 rowers in the boat, so common to their mythology, as well as the probable origin of the representation of the period of the procession as 25,920 years, instead of what seems to be its actual figure, viz. 25,846 and three-fourths years. For, in each case, the procession was 72 years on the principle of a year for a day. And so 72 times 359 is 25,848, 72 times 360, 25,920, and 72 times 370, 26,640. Chapter 5. The Constellations and the Shadow of the Cross Prophecy always comes in a time of evil, showing in what manner God will cause the eventual triumph of good. In this way, he at once encourages the faithful and warns his enemies of their final overthrow. Thus it was thus it was in the days of Lamech, the father of Noah. The prophecy of Enoch had been one of vengeance. Behold, the Lord came with myriads of his saints to execute judgment upon, upon all. Behold, the Lord came with myriads of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their works of ungodliness, which they have ungodly wrought, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude 14-15 Now follows consolation. A world dies, a world rises again. He called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us for our work and for the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. He called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us for our work and for the toil of our hands, because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. We are not to understand that the curse on the whole creation was removed. The earth was given its seasons in regularity, and in that sense the curse on the ground was mitigated. But there is reason to believe that a far more profound meaning underlies the word. But there is reason to believe that a far more profound meaning underlies the words of the prophecy. It seems rather to show in what way God would carry out the purposes summed up in the sentence in Eden, and in what way the heavenly bodies should be used to denote the atonement in the bruising of the serpent's head by the seed of the woman. The Lord was with Noah in the ark, the same as he was with Israel in all their afflictions, and the same as he is with us in all ours. Come thou into the ark, he says to his follower, for Noah must renounce for him friends, enjoyments, and the bright face of nature herself, and lie down as one dead in a vessel, which shall be tossed about by seas more fearful than ever mariner experienced before or since. The floodgates of heaven would be burst asunder, the earth would open, and the cosmos perishing, the abyss itself would yawn beneath. And fearful sounds and thunders, combined with the shrieks of the dying, would remind him that he was every moment at death's door, dependent on nothing but his faith in God. He thus at once enacted in emblem the first three mysteries of baptism, temptation, and renunciation enumerated in the preceding chapter. His entry into the ark, or coffin, the word thaba, used in the Hebrew means ark, chest, or coffin, symbolized his death. But as this was not necessarily an emblem of crucifixion, though the material of both the ark and the cross is the same wood, it now behooves us to show how the manner of Noah's symbolic death was connected with the cross. 
To do this, we must refer back to the subject of the previous chapter. We must turn back to the constellations. We must take our minds for a moment off the spiritual character of our investigation and examine the hard facts of science. In doing so, however, do not let us adopt all the methods of the science of the present day. We must identify ourselves as much as possible with the ancients, i.e. we must try and see nature with their eyes. And there is this fundamental difference between the ancient method and the modern, that whereas the latter is an ascent from particulars to generals, the ancients, by the light of God's wondrous revelation at the flood and tradition of creation, were enabled to descend from generals to particulars. So it happens that whereas the men of the 19th century are only beginning to see how fully number per se governs all the relations between force and matter, that fact lay at the basis of all the wisdom of the immediate descendants of Noah. They saw in God's ordinances the trinity and unity that runs through nature, and in the sun's movements through the twelve signs of the zodiac. They saw not merely that perpetuity of motion, which was emblematic of an eternal Godhead, proving the existence of that thought of eternity in space and time, which our finite minds cannot lay hold of, but also the main law of gravitation, the primary force of nature was revealed to them. The sun's circuit is divided at the equinoxes and solstices, giving rise to the signs of the cross and the circle, signs which they sometimes represented separately and sometimes presented in union, as, for instance, the crux sonsata, or looped cross, or the unk. Besides that, they knew something of the relations existing between the geometrical figures, the square and the circle, which have puzzled mathematicians for ages, as they brought the heavens, whose semicircular dome we behold, onto a four-square projection. In this world being the center of God's work in the universe, it was treated in their philosophy, whatever be the true system, as if it were both flat and still, and the heavens moving around it. As human life belongs specially to this world, the earth was viewed as the great center, and not the sun, and as death had entered into the world, the main thought in the minds of the ancients was the compassing of this great enemy. Having seen that the divine division of the heavens was understood as having been into three rows, each twelve constellations, in all thirty-six constellations, let us sketch out this division as they saw it, on its four-square projection, with the sun moving through the center, and examine the way in which their different combinations were produced. We shall see how it was they needed no telescopes, and how not only all the mystic numbers that are found in scripture were evolved from the planisphere, and which the records of paganism show us were preserved by the priest philosophers of Chaldea and Egypt, but how these actually correspond with the numbers found in all the main cycles known to modern astronomy, and which unaided observation has scarcely yet ascertained to a nicety even after centuries of patient toil and investigation. Four square projection showing the sun's passage through the heavens. There is something in locality, and it is evident that sites of certain cities and monuments have been selected with special reference to latitude. And when we consider that Babylon is in latitude north 32 degrees, Jerusalem between north 31 and 32 degrees, and the pyramids in Egypt in north 30 degrees, it is quite evident that a particular latitude, say about north 30 degrees, has been designedly employed for setting forth these mysteries. Nor are we under much hesitation in determining the reason. The 30 degrees are exactly one twelfth of a circle, i.e. one twelfth of 360 degrees. In those latitudes, the 12 signs marked in the diagram as pertaining to the upper region were always visible. The 12 signs of the lower region were perpetually invisible. While of the 12 signs of the zodiac, or intermediate region, half were visible at a time, thus giving a total of 18 visible divisions of the heavens. 
one set of six signs of the zodiac are visible from those latitudes in summer, while the opposite six are visible in winter. The sun is in the northern, sits from spring to autumn, and in the southern, sits from autumn to spring. In the diagram, the zodiac is seen bisected by the equator. The irregular line shows the passage of the sun, and is called the ecliptic. A circle marks the sun, and it will be noticed that he crosses the equator at the spring equinox and at the autumn equinox. It is at his highest point in the heavens at the summer solstice, and at his lowest in the winter solstice. In spring, the days and nights are equal. At the summer solstice, the days are longer than the nights, and this continues still at the autumn equinox, the balance is restored. Just after the autumn equinox, the rule of night commences, and the nights being longer than the days, the sun is sojourning in the lower region, or the depths of night while at the winter solstice he reaches his lowest point, and then moves upwards again, till in the spring the balance is once more restored. It will be noticed that with each sign of the zodiac which he passes through, he passes by one upper and one lower sign as well, and thus in passing through the twelve signs of the zodiac, he also passes through the whole region of thirty-six constellations. This was held to be a passage through the three rows in one, through a trinity and unity of twelves. In the constancy of this triune passage, he was the grand primeval type of Jehovah Jesus, the mediator, whom was and is and is to come. But the cycles that this movement, this combination of opposing forces, are never the one the exact multiple of another. There are not thirty exact days in a month, nor are there twelve exact months in a year. Still less does a year that is, the true solar year, consist of exactly 360 days. There are fractions over in each case. These fractions were entirely avoided by the ancients. Fractions were not necessary for their calculations. The cycle was viewed as dying in the fractional period and rising again till after so many repetitions of the original cycle, a new entire cycle had been made up of the fraction. This principle was actually represented by Noah during his stay in the ark, and was turned, as already stated, into the fable of the phoenix, which was said to live so many years and then die, the young bird rising again out of its ashes. Much interest, therefore, arises out of the balancing point of these two great forces, the great principle of gravitation is founded on the fact that there are in nature two great forces, repulsion and attraction. We see this illustrated in the course of a bullet fired straight from a rifle into the air. It speeds straight along until, by the resistance of the atmosphere, its own force is exhausted. In yielding to the attraction of the earth, it falls. The two are equalized at the equinoxes. This equalization was called the balance, and has given its name to the sign Libra, the balance, which is now at the autumn equinox. Upon this movement into and out of the balance, the whole system of mystic numbers and cycles turns. As the sun occupies six signs on each side of the equator, his entry into the seventh is the balance. And who can deny that at that moment a vital change takes place on the earth? If any doubt this, let him compare the condition of vegetation in the months between spring and autumn with that which exists in the months between autumn and spring. Dupuis or Dupois, uh, or Dupuis recognized this and saw in it the great basis of the week. He thought it was the origin of the Sabbath. And he is so far right that it forms one great basis in nature for the week. For seven, the number by which all the vital functions are regulated, is the emblem of completion and of rest. And the very thought of rest implies that there has been previous labor, previous movement. But to illustrate this thought, the cross or balance, uh, let us take a balance. First, premising the simplest of all its forms the tau, or t, itself. Let us suppose a perfectly even rod, a, b, 
C, D exactly poised upon the line at E, F, and F. I guess that means E, F, maybe G. Now uh, impart, it, impart to it a gentle motion by pressing it down at one end, say B and D, and let it swing. The end AC will swing up into the air, and the end BD, which has been pressed, will fall downwards until 7 twelfths of the rod be on the side of the balance you have pressed, and 5 twelfths on the other. That will bring the points E, F, and G all into a straight line. So yeah, I guess it means G. At this point, uh, the movement will be reversed. The scale will commence to readjust itself, and the rod will oscillate till the original force of the pressure be quite exhausted, and the equilibrium be restored. Thus, 7 and not 6 is the number expressing movement. The sun's entrance into the seventh sign completes the action both ways. The system of the ancients took full account of this. This addition of one arising out of movement was carried through the whole. Thus, the six signs became seven, the twelve signs became thirteen, the eighteen signs visible at a time became nineteen, the total thirty-six of the constellations became thirty-seven. So the appendix talks a lot about thirty-seven, and then again, the basis of the chamber numbers, or one one one, through 999 is also 37, which is also Halab, the heart, and uh, Yakita, I believe, and a few other things, Law. This appears in all the cycles. Seven is the number of the week, the primary eclipse cycle, the cycle of the revolution of the moon's nodes and the metonic cycle, which harmonizes the solar year and lunar month all completed in a 19th year. Hmm, so 19 is card for the sun, the tarot card for the sun. 19 times 19 is 361, the solar number and symbol. 666, which we saw was a number connected with the great processional cycle, and which we shall pre uh, presently see connected with the eclipse cycles, is a number resulting from the multiplication of the number of signs in the hemisphere, 18, by the new total of the constellations, 37. For 18 times 37 is 666, or 666. And by multiplying the number of degrees in the circle, 360, that is, 10 to each constellation, by the new total figure 7 acquired as above, they would obtain 2,520. Another figure we shall see connected with the eclipse cycles. So um, there's that number again. Next, let us consider that as signs belong in this way to one side of the balance, that number must equally belong to the other side when the recoil takes place. The two sevens become 14, and we have 14 signs in the zodiac in place of the 12 or 13. This idea was represented in the figuring of the zodiac itself, for all the signs but Gemini and Pisces are represented by a single figure, but two human beings mark Gemini and two fishes Pisces. Working this out further, we bring the total of the three twelves, 36, up to the three fourteens, i.e. up to 42. Both 14 and 42 are important mystic numbers. They occur frequently both in scripture and paganism. A new series of numbers develops itself out of the sun's passage through the signs in the balance in this way. Considering that the actual total of the signs is 12, and that he passes through 7 out of the 12 before the scale recoils, we may deduct 7 from 12, and 5 remain at the other side of the scale. The 5 can be looked upon as doubled for the two sides of the balance, making 10 for the number of the signs, thus mystically reckoned instead of 12, 13, or 14. Carrying the principle out further, we get the total number of the constellations viewed as 30 instead of 36 or 42. 10 is the least number at which the signs of the zodiac were reckoned, and the occurrence of 10s in the mystic numerical system is most frequent. It is thought to be the number of humanity, 
and Pythagoras viewed it as the most comprehensive of numbers. Again, the signs of the zodiac could be reckoned as 11 instead of 12 or 10, 13 or 14. Death is viewed as occurring in the solar system at the autumn equinox, for then it is that the sun's generative power passes away, and this is viewed as caused by the downward attraction uh, the constellations were viewed as attracting the sun. Thus, there was great similarity of the principle with the views of Sir Isaac Newton. I am not, however, asserting that a parabola can or cannot be converted into an ellipse. And this is viewed as caused by the downward attraction of the sign into which he will pass at the winter solstice. Thus, the winter sign of the zodiac was sometimes viewed as excluded from the system and thus the number is reduced to 11. Similarly, the total of the constellations would be regarded as 33 instead of 36. Both 11 and 33 are important mystic numbers. They are found in astronomy, in scripture, and in paganism. Thus, the period of the cycle of the sunspots is 11 years. 33 years form the great cycle harmonizing the day of four, uh, 24 hours with the solar year. So, too, the twelve apostles become eleven if we exclude the traitor Judas, and the period of thirty-three years comprised the earthly lifetime of our blessed Lord. The same idea of the faithlessness of uh, one out of the twelve, or the reduction of thirty-six to thirty-three, appears in paganism, concerning which uh, Mackay's, or Mackey's mythological astronomy contains the following remarkable passage. The Elohim, the deacons, or the symbols, which presided over the 36 subdivisions of the heavens, or more, uh, more properly speaking of the year, each month having three, were those gods whose care it was to regulate the weather in the different seasons, and who were supposed to vary it according to their will. These deacons, or Elohim, are the gods of whom it is said the Almighty created the universe. They arranged the order of the zodiac. The Elohim of summer were gods of a benevolent disposition. They made the days long and loaded the sun's head with topaz, while the three wretches that presided in the winter, at the extreme end of the year, hid in the realms below, were, with the constellation to which they belong, cut off from the rest and, as they were missing, would consequently be accused by bringing Krishna into those troubles which at last ended in his death. In the former portion of this work, in the chapter on Freemasonry, it will be noticed that the analogy between Osiris and Hiram myths comprises exactly thirteen points, and these are connected with loss and substitution. The intention is to mark the loss or defection of one of the twelve, in the substitution of that one by another. Another principle which was employed in the evolution of numbers from the constellations was that of reduplication, for as the equator cuts each of the twelve signs into the twelve portions, the zodiac came to be regarded as consisting of twenty-four such halves, and the constellations altogether became seventy-two such divisions. The important position that 72 holds as a mystic number was shown in the previous chapter. Similarly, the total 30 became total 60, and the total 42 developed into a grand total of 84, which appears to be the highest number at which the constellations are ever reckoned. Thus, Pliny speaks of the constellations as 72. 60 was the great standard number of Chaldean arithmetic while 84 is one of the most frequently recurring numbers in Hindu astrotheology. Next, let us consider the well-known symbol of the triple tau, or triple cross, in connection with the signs. As, by the law of leverage, we saw that seven and twelfths, uh, seven twelfths of the rod are on one side of the balance at the time of the recoil, i.e. seven twelfths of the bulk of the rod, and as the lower extremity of it, the line, C and D, is still divided in half, i.e. six twelfths on the one side and six twelfths on the other. It follows that the upper extremity of the line, or of it, the line, A and B, must be divided into eight twelfths on one side and four twelfths on the other. 
It further follows that a line drawn through the center will be divided according to the bulk of the rod, 7 twelfths on the one side and 5 twelfths on the other. Thus, a triple tau or triple cross is formed, displaying successively, counting from below upwards, the numbers 6, 7, and 8, or counting from above downwards, the numbers 8, 7, and 6. The orderly succession of digits in all the mystical numbers, which must appear fanciful to many persons, is one of the most remarkable features in the whole system. It depends upon mathematical laws, often recondite, but whose uh, operation is both curious and beautiful. Thus, the juxtaposition of three sixes, six at six, has a fanciful look about it, but it is not really fanciful. And, further, this number has a recondite mathematical relation to other trines of sixes, such as 6 plus 6 plus 6 is 18, and 6 times 6 times 6 to 16. The system of logarithms, which has proved so invaluable in astronomical calculations, arises out of one of these recondite laws, and it is quite likely that others might have been discovered of still greater utility had the cosmogonies of Genesis been the guide of the scientific men of the day, instead of the case being so notoriously the reverse. The triple tau, or triple cross, is one of the grandest signs in nature, and it is, like other symbols, an emblem of trinity and unity. It was a great sign at Cavill. It was a great sign at Calvary. The central cross was that of our blessed Lord, while on the one side was the hardened sinner, and the other the pardoned thief. What a beautiful lesson may be read from this picture. A spectator would first have seen sin unpardoned, the next step would have been uh, would have portrayed the means of pardon, and the third would have completed the picture showing sin forgiven. In short, the order would be from death unto life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reading the numbers from above downwards, we get 876, or 876, a number which, in lunations, comprises 40 weeks plus 70 years, or 25,846 and three-fourths days, of the normal lifetime of man, which at once reminds us also of the great cycle of procession of the equinoxes. But something more remarkable appears in this arrangement of the figures. It will have been noticed that between the two great cardinal points of the uh, processional cycle, the 666, which Antichrist will assume, and the 888, which Lord Jesus has assumed. The middle figure, 777, the very number of Storos, Staros, or Staros, the cross, is hidden. These trines being really 6, 7, and 8, respectively on the usual threefold projection from unity, we may similarly read them in this relation as 678 or 876 as above, or we may represent the middle figure by a zero, through its not being expressed. This would give us 608. And in the same way as the line drawn in the center between the upper and lower extremities of our tau is an imaginary one, and not produced from the outline of the rod itself, we may similarly represent that by a zero. Then, instead of 678, we again also get 608. This deduction of 608, or 608, may seem fanciful, but both the succession, 6, 7, and 8, was, as a matter of fact, not only represented by the ancients as 608, but 608 was one of the most important numbers they employed. It seems that the Avatar, or Neros, cycle uh, originated out of the 600 years of the age of Noah at the Flood, with which period they alternated it, for sometimes it is represented as 600 and sometimes as 608, added to the number of persons, eight, who came out of the Ark. It is, in fact, the real Phoenix cycle, the cycle of fa a nea the great Noah. I alluded to this figure, 608, in the verses of Martianus Capella in chapter 3. The letters Upsilon, Eta, and Sigma are the three letters uh, he refers to, and their numerical equivalent is 608. 
The word is der uh, derived from the ancient root meaning to save, whence come the words G uh, Jesse, Joshua, and Jesus. And the letters are commonly rendered, as is generally known, into the Latin initials of Jesus Hominum Salvator. Paganism snatched these numbers, 608, from Noah, just as Antichrist will take from him the number 666. So, Freemasonry, Freemason in Hebrew is 666. Say, F being Vav 6, R 200 or Resh, Mem M 40, Shin S 300, An O 70, N non 50, while in Greek it is Phre, Phi Rho Heta, 608. The sun in Egyptian, uh, Mesoi Renima, mid heaven, which was shown to be carrying on the mysteries of paganism, would never let go such an important number, and she has most remarkably derived it from the triple tau itself, a fact which goes to corroborate our above mathematical calculation. The grand cross of Freemasonry is thus represented. The triple tau and the double tau with the cross, which is the central figure of the Iota Eta Sigma. These are the three taus, as may at once be seen, but the form of the latter also represents above the Greek letter chi, uh, which is a cross, and below the Greek letter he, uh, eta, of which the former has, like the Egyptian cross or nilometer, 600 for its numerical equivalent, and the latter, the number 8, total 608. The ancients also apparently made 608 out of the name of Ham, or Ham, as already indicated. In the archaic Hebrew of Genesis, when Moses wrote, the last letter in the alphabet was the letter, uh, the letter Tau, which represented 400. Ham's name in Genesis, spelled Heth Mem, was therefore simply 48. But afterwards, the Mem final counted for 600, and then Ham was reckoned as 608. Ham, the youngest son of Noah, may have been named from the syllable him, or himna, or himnu, alluded to in the foregoing chapter. If so, the subtlety of Satan in selecting Ham for the new temptation is as apparent as was, uh, as was his selection of the woman in the Garden of Eden. The very zero in the center between the six and the eight was held to be an important emblem. It was the zero, or seed, the circle, or emblem of eternity. Having shown how 6, 0, and 8 arises out of the triple tau, it can also be shown that 6, 7, and 8 proceeds from the same emblem, and hence the connection between 6, 0, 8 and 6, 7, 8, i.e. between 6, 108 and 6, 78, or 8, 76. Kircher, in his Oedipus Egyptiacus, or Egyptiacus, tells us that uh, the mystic triads of letters corresponded to the divisions of the circle amongst the Hebrews and Mohammedans. In this system, he traces as far back as Egypt. These were thus 111, 222, 333, 444, 555, 666, 777, 888, and 999. He takes the crossed circle, the meaning of which I expounded in the previous chapter, and thus explains in question were formed from it in connection with the trines of numbers. Trines based, as he says, upon the Hebrew system of numeration. 27 symbols being 9 units, 9 decades, and 9 hecatontides. The first three letters result from the simple diameter, and the second three have relation to ABC, the third to ABE, the fourth to DBC, the fifth three to DBE, the sixth three to ADE, the seventh three to ADC, the eighth three to ECD, the ninth three to AEC. Volume 2, Part 1, page 380. It will be seen that the 666, 777, and 888, i.e. 6, 7, and 8, on the threefold projection give the Tau Cross. The symbol in question, which I have just shown, following Higgins, was the sign for 608. So, too, the triple tau, as explained by Kircher to mean 888, was expressed on Mount Calvary by the three crosses, 
and thus the slaughterers of Jesus actually set up a triple eight, a number indicative of resurrection throughout scripture. Unconsciously prophesying that their holy victim would rise again after his murder. There is a plate in Maurice's Oriental Trinities depicting the three-headed Diana standing over the dragon, and on each head is the sign Tau. The name of Jesus seems to be a mighty symbol, as might indeed be expected. The sign of the initials of Jesus Hominum Salvator was actually expressed with the glory or nimbus round it, and this is the circle, the zero, the letter O, whose numerical equivalent is 70. Thus get Yod 10, the triple tau is 608 as above explained, Sigma 200, and O 70, O micron. Total 888 once more. The whole spells Isu, the ancient, uh, oh yeah, with the O, Isu, the ancient Hebrew word Iso to save. It is written in Hebrew with the same letters as the word Jesu. From Iso are derived, as pointed out, the words Jesus, Joshua, Jesse, and Yes, or uh, also Isis. These letters, Iota, Sigma, Omicron, and Upsilon, uh, Eta, and Sigma, are the six that made up the, or make up the word Isus, Jesus, in which the two words are firmly cemented together. In this symbol, the letters Iota, Sigma, and Omicron are retained, while for the Upsilon, Eta, and Sigma is substituted the triple tau sign, which has the same numerical equivalent, 608. The very name Isus seems to have been shadowed forth at the time of the flood. Thus, I, or uh, Yod, was the initial of Japhet, H, or He, Ham, Sigma, or Shin, and S, Shem. Ayin, or O, was the emblem of the sun and the seed, i.e. Noah. Us, or Ush, meant man. Thus, as Noah was the sun seed man, Noah and his three sons together would have pointed out the very name of the Savior. The verses imputed to the uh, Erythraean Sibyl, upon which the great Christian symbol of the fish in connection with the cross was based, whatever their real origin, at all events show that the early church had some knowledge of the matters in hand. They comprise an acrostic, the first letters of each line of which read, Isus Christos Theoi, Eos Soter Stauros, meaning Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, Cross, giving the word for Savior, Soter, its proper spelling. These letters amount to 6,216, which is resolved into 888 times 7, or 777 times 8. Further, if you withdraw the numerical value of the word for cross, staros, but as written with the digamma, staros, uh, 777, there remains 777 times 7, or if you withdraw the first word of the sentence, isus, there remains 666 times 8, or 888 times 6. The initials ichthus, which means fish, and the whole, uh, the whole thus divides into the fish and the cross, both diluvian emblems. This system of numbers was evidently originally divine, as arising out of God's method in creation. But nearly every item has been seized by the enemy for his own purposes, even down to the I, or iota, or yod, and the O, A in omicron omega, the ten ciphers of the Arabians by which number is denominated in that in a very wicked way, as was shown in the first portion of this work. How needful, then, the study of the Apocalypse to see how God resumes his own emblems, and how he will turn that enemy's devices upon himself and his adherents. And now it is time for us to consider with what intense constancy it is pleased to God to work by number. Christ is a son, the son of righteousness, whose twelve apostles correspond numerically to the signs of the zodiac, and ruling, as they will, in the regeneration over the twelve tribes of Israel. Those tribes are almost identified with the signs in Scripture. 
The ancients often represented the twelve signs by twelve individual stars chosen from them, which were called their protagonists. Eridanus by R. Brown, page 62. The crown of the twelve stars in Revelation 12 is probably an allusion to this, and those are the stars of Joseph's dream, which are the twelve tribes of Israel. Their marching order was, moreover, based on the planisphere of a four-square projection, just as the high priest's breastplate, the Ezekiel temple, and the New Jerusalem. The whole Bible is divided into twelves of books. Mimpris, in his Harmony of the Gospels, divides the books of the Bible into five series, each twelve, in all sixty, a mystic number, the derivation of which I lately referred to, and which the wisdom of the Chaldees selected for a standard number, and which is the common denominator of the fractions used in Scripture, viz. one-half, one-third, one-fourth, one-fifth, and one-tenth. This division exactly corresponds with the twelve divisions of the first book of all, Genesis. The Chaldeans imitated the method in the Isdubar epic, which contains their account of the flood, in twelve stanzas like the blessing of Jacob. I find that Mimpris's divisions display a remarkable characteristic to which he does not, however, refer. The thought of the balance, or division, into seven and five, arises equally and naturally out of them. Thus, twelve books comprise the law in the major prophets, say the Pentateuch, five books and Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, seven books, the twelve minor prophets, the twelve books of the Hagiographa, say Psalms, Pro, uh, Proverbs, Job, Canticles, and Ecclesiastes, five books, and Ruth, Lamentations, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles, seven books. In the New Testament, the same system is apparent. Thus, the four Gospels and the Acts are five, while the Pauline Epistles, Hebrews, James, Peter, John's Epistles, Jude, and Revelation are the remaining set to make up twelve. The structure of the Apocalypse is similar. First, the seven stars, and then the five openings in the heavens. Chapter 4, verse 1, chapter 11, verse 19, chapter 15, verse 5, chapter 19, verse 11, and 21, verses 2 through 3. The twelve divisions of Genesis already alluded to as marked off by the phrase, these are the generations, are similarly subdivided, the first five being previous to Abram, and the last seven being Abrahamic. Paganism closely followed the same arrangement for the twelve gods of the Egyptians and the twelve gods of the Japanese are divided into two classes. The one class in each country comprising seven, and the other class the remaining five gods. In the science of music, the idea, this idea of the balance is very remarkably illustrated. Rest, motion, rest expresses the great law of progression in all musical composition. Dr. Marx's Compositionis Lair. Bisect a musical chord, and the number of its vibrations is exactly double, and the tone reproduced an octave higher. There is, in the scale, a tonic progression of exactly seven notes, which resolves themselves into exactly seven semitones, thus giving the number twelve divided into seven naturals and five accidentals. The laws of modulation display the same idea of the cross or balance found in the sun's passage through the twelve signs of the zodiac. For the leading note, through which the key is determined, and in which is, as it were, the door or opening of the scale, is the seventh semitone in ascending, or the seventh note in descending. Thus, in modulating from the key of C, the tonic, to that of G, the dominant, F sharp, the seventh semitone from C will be the leading note used, and in returning from the key of the dominant G to the key of the tonic C, F sharp will be the leading note employed, and is the seventh note from G. Finally, the principal chords in music are called triads, a manifest illustration of the three-in-one principle, completing the analogy between this science and the sun's passage through the constellations. The very word gamut is said to mean the husband of the mother, 
Islip, for the ancients connected the two systems. The music of the seven planetary spheres was a representation of Noah and his seven companions in the ark, and, as shown in the last chapter, our very word him is derived from Noah's name. In the Pythagorean Mysteries, music was a prominent feature. That great mystical mathematician fully perceived the use of music as an illustration of his theories. Pythagoras is said by writers of his life to have regarded music as something celestial and divine, and to have had such an opinion of its power over the human affections, that according to the Egyptian system, he ordered his disciples to be waked every morning and lulled to sleep every night by sweet sounds. See Fellows, Mysteries of Freemasonry, page 188. The Hindu mythology, the special importance of which will be referred to in chapter 12, gives us valuable instruction as to the connection the ancients perceived between music or acoustics and the constellations. Sir William Jones, volume 6, page 375-6, in his argument on the hymn to Saraswati, the consort of Brahma and goddess of harmony, writes as follows. The different position of the two semitones in the scale of seven notes gives birth to seven primary note or modes, and as the whole series consists of so, uh, every one of which may be made a modal note or tonic, there are in nature, though not universally in practice, 77 other modes, which may be called derivative. All the 84 are distributed by the Persians under the notion of locality into three classes, consisting of 12 rooms, 24 angles, and 48 recesses. But the Hindu arrangement is elegantly formed on the variations of the Indian year and the association of ideas, a powerful auxiliary to the ordinary effect of modulation. The modes in this system are deified, and, as there are six seasons in India, two springs, summer, autumn, and two winters, the original rag, or god of the mode, is conceived to preside over a particular season. Each principal mode is attended by five ragnis, or nymphs, of harmony. Each has eight sons, or genii, of the same divine art, and each rag in his family, or raj, in his family, is appropriated to a distinct season, in which alone his melody can be sung or played at prescribed hours of the day and night. The mode of Deepak, or Cupid the Inflamer, is supposed to be lost. The natural distribution of the modes would have been 7, 33, and 44, according to the number of minor and major secondary tones, but this order was varied for the sake of the charming fiction above mentioned. It will be noticed from the foregoing that the Hindus, having adopted for their map of the heavens the very highest number at which the constellations were reckoned, these 84, most appropriately assimilated to the, uh, them to the 84 musical modes, and if the truth had been left where it was originally, and no fictions, charming or otherwise, substituted, valuable results might have followed. It will be noticed that the whole arises out of the octave or seven tones in eight notes. And whereas Noah and his seven companions were uh, eight men shadowing forth Christ in the seven churches of Revelation, one to three, from which the whole mystery of God is unfolded in the book, the parody in the satanic mystery is very close, for Antichrist is an eighth king, being only one of seven heads of the dragon. The octave is moreover divided, like the week of his covenant, into twice three and a half the seven years of the latter, corresponding to the seven tones of the former. Say, from the tonic C to the subdominant F, are tone, 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 semitone, and from the dominant G to the tonic C are again tone, 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 semitone. In the first half of the scale, the notes are common to the keys of the subdominant and tonic. In the second half, they are common to those of the tonic and the dominant. The higher tonic note, C, being a repetition of the original tonic note, the whole scale is in reality built upon the seven notes, C to B. These seven constitute the original modes, known as the church modes, 
called by Ambrose and Bredry the Ionian, the Dorian, the Phrygian, etc. They are divided into four and three, as usually is the case where the number seven appears in nature. From C to F, four notes is, as already shown, the first half of the octave. In the three notes G to B, for the fourth note is not in this series, but being merely a reduplication of the tonic C, comprise the remaining portion. There are then 44 secondary modes arising from the first four, and 33 from the last three notes, and 33 from the last three notes. In these, with the original seven modes, give the total 84 modes as subdivided by Sir William Jones. The interrelation of all science by means of number, and the scrupulous care with which God has employed the same system of number in his scheme for the redemption of a fallen creation, is here strongly exemplified. The Hindus, having appropriated the 84 modes to the 84 constellations, 84 being the greatest number at which it was possible to reckon the constellations, it is remarkable that the products of this number, and that of the least number at which they may be reckoned, 30, is the famous scriptural number, 2520, that of the days of the Hebdomad of Antichrist's Covenant, the LCM of the numbers 1 to 10 and which I shall presently show has its astronomic basis in the eclipse cycles. Then 33 plus 44 is 77, the number of generations in Luke's genealogy, as the ratio 7 to 44 is the proportion, is the proportion the radius of a circle bears to its circumference, and the number 40 is divided in scripture into 7 and uh, 33. Leviticus 12 verses uh, 2 through 4, and 1 Kings chapter 2, 11. The whole series, then, of the numbers of the musical modes, 7, 33, 44, 77, and 84, is one marvelous in its far-reaching mathematical properties. A thorough comprehension of the laws of number might possibly enable men, if they would heed divine revelation regarding numbers, as they probably did in very remote days, to ascertain astronomical facts by the aid of acoustical observations, or by the laws of circulation of the blood. Nor is the idea any more absurd than would have been thought thirty years ago of a proposal to utilize electricity for acoustical purposes. Could our scientific men but grasp the law of variation of vibrations, many of these things might be turned to what is called practical utility. Oh, that their studies were made in humble uh, leaning upon God's word in place of self-satisfied contempt for the Pentateuch. As it is, it is greatly to be feared they are but furthering the development of the Antichrist, who will employ number to deceive the whole unsaved world. One of the few who have taken a step in the right direction was Professor Hay, whose work, The Natural Principles of Harmony and Form, and Their Analogy in Sound and Color, uh, published by Blackwood in 1842, proves the interrelation of acoustics with geometrical form in the seven colors of the rainbow. He points out that the circle, the equilateral triangle, and the square are the only three homogeneous geometrical forms in the plane, based respectively on the only three classes of line, the curved line, the crooked line, and the straight line. Then he shows that taking the circle as the simplest of the three homogeneous forms, the triangle arises out of it, and the square out of the triangle, in a perfectly natural manner, and in the same arithmetical proportions, is exactly as found in the tonic, median, and dominant notes respectively to the musical triad. The following figure, taken from his work, illustrates the manner of the formation of the triangle from the circle. The circumference of the inner circle is half the length of that of the outer, the former being formed from the bisection of the radius of the latter, and these two correspond to the tonic and its octave repetition. The outer circle is divided according to the twelve semitones in the scale, and the median or triangle form arises in the following manner. It has been shown that the first musical consonance that occurs in ascending uh, from the tonic to its octave is the third or median and that this sound in the number of its variations in a second is relatively to the tonic as 5 to 4, 
in precisely the same proportional quantities to the length of line forming the tonic does the homogeneous form, the equilateral triangle, occur invertedly between the two circles. This result arises from dividing the outer circle into the musical semitonic division of 12 and drawing a line from any one of these points, carrying it across the inner circle three times, thus producing between the tonic and its octave the median. It is so in every respect, not only from being in relative proportional quantity of circumference as 4 to 5, but as dividing the outer circle into the same number of parts and touching it by its sides. It also, in this capacity of mediant, forms upon the convex surface of the inner circle, the dominant, the next homogeneous form, the square, which is relatively to the outer circle as 2 to 3, and consequently is to the inner circle as 5 to 4, and therefore invertedly its mediant. This point is accomplished by repeating this mediant line from each point round the circle, says Hay, page, uh, pages 18 through 20. There thus arise within the outer and on the convex circumference of the inner circle seven angular figures, showing division in 4 plus 3, proceeding from 4 times 3 points in the circumferences, say four figures with three sides and angles, the three figures with four sides and angles. The reader will not fail to notice that the outer circle with its 12 semitones corresponds exactly to the sun's circular passage through the 12 signs of the zodiac that the common denominator of all the fractions, half, two-thirds, three-fourths, and four-fifths, is again the number 60, that the circle, the equilateral triangle, and the square are the exact geometrical forms within which the ancients enclosed all their astronomical learning. For the sun's passage was circular, yet he describes the two triangles as given at the commencement of this chapter, and the whole was projected into the four-square form. This evolution of the forms, one out of the other, is in analogy with the evolution of the three covenants into which the mystery of God is divided, one out of another, an analogy that appears to bear supremely on the subject of the regeneration or new creation of all nature. The construction of the apocalypse is similar. The seals contain the trumpets, and the trumpets the bowls, three in one. And, just as Euclid, an unparalleled ancient standard work on geometry, begins with the circle, contains twelve books, and ends with the pyramid, so does scripture tell us the earth was made at creation in circular form, a circular boundary being described upon the deep. Its books proceed throughout on the twelvefold division, and it ends with the great pyramidal city, as will be explained later i.e. a solid figure compounded of the triangle and the square. Out of these three primary geometrical forms, Professor Hay shows there proceed four secondary forms, the eclipse, the oblong parallelogram, the rhombus, and the hexagon, just as in music we have the four remaining notes of the scale, the leading note, the supertonic, the subdominant, and the superdominant, which are derived harmonically from the original triad and the process is strictly analogous to the derivation of the four secondary colors, orange, green, indigo, and violet, from the three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. The structure of the larynx itself is in exact accordance with the discovery of Professor Hay. The base of it rests upon the upper part of the windpipe, and consisting of a ring on the upper edge of the expanded uh, portion, of which are set two slender bodies of a pyramidal form, which bear the most important part in the mechanism of the larynx as an organ of voice. The Circle of Sciences, Volume 1, page 120. The ring is the circle, the pyramid is the triangle and the square. What an apt adjustment for the production of musical <laughs> What an apt adjustment for the production of musical sounds. Thus, the gravitation laws and the laws regulating form, color, and sound are all based upon the number seven, whose recurrence in scripture is so constant as to gain for it the appellation of the sacred number. The lover of scripture will recognize in these facts proof of the marvelous fitness to creation itself of the fact that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and rested the seventh day.
The infidel, who supposes the writer of Genesis to have been an ignoramus compared to modern philosophers, and that man, having emerged from a state of slavery, is getting wiser, is getting wiser every day, uh, is confronted with the question as to whether that writer knew these facts or not, and is thus placed between the horns of a dilemma. If he knew them, what becomes of the vaunted march of wisdom? If not, by what power has he anticipated by 3,500 years the discoveries of modern times? The very numbers 7, 33, and 12, which figure as dividing the 84 musical modes, i.e. 7 by 12 modes, and are seen connected with astronomy, are found in the apparently totally different science of human anatomy, exercising an equally important influence and connected, if not with 12 by 7, with 12 plus 7, i.e. 19, that science thus giving its own evidence that the system of number employed by God in creation and in regeneration is one and the same. In the human body, the spine, says Bell, is the great center of the ossuary system. In the infant, he shows that the vertebrae in it are, in five divisions, cervical, dorsal, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal, 7, 12, 5, 5, and 4, or 19 upper spine and 14 lower spine, being 33. The analogy with astronomy is so clear that the fact that human anatomy and astronomy are governed by one and the same law of number seems unquestionable. 33 years form the great cycle harmonizing solar year with the lunar year. Its epact is one year of 359 to 60 days. 33 is seen divided into 19 and 14 in the spine of the infant, 19 being the number of the vertebrae in the upper, and 14 that of those in the lower spine. 19 years comprise the well-known metonic cycle, which harmonizes solar year and lunar month. Its epact is 7 lunar months, i.e. 207 or 8 days, and 208 is the very number of the total bones in the body of the adult, according to Bell, which I've heard it's 206, but the seven months or 208 days being the period of the feasts of Leviticus in 23, uh, chapter 23, and of the sun's exercise of speed, uh, seed ripening power, i.e. of generative power on vegetation in the latitude of Jerusalem. Fourteen years are a period whose epact comprises five lunar months. Thus, the total period of 33 years, having an epact of 12 months, being divided into 19 and 14 years, shows that 12 months epact divided into 7 and 5, being respectively the 7 months of solar generative force and the 5 when the power lies in abeyance. The leading numbers are 7, 12, and 13, as in music and the consideration of the relation between the number of vertebrae in the spine of the infant as compared with those in that of the adult seems further to show how important a part the number seven divided into, divided into three and four plays in the mystery of the origin of life. The 19 bones, it will be noticed, are divided into 12 and seven, two of the most important numbers connected with the whole subject and now under specific consideration. In scripture, the same system points to life in Christ. He was on earth 33 completed years, had 12 apostles, and there are seven churches in the apocalypse. Of the 33 vertebrae, by ossification, seven disappear in the adult, seven divided into three and four, for the three which vanish are of the coccygeal and four are of the sacral. The vertebrae in the adult are unchanged in the upper spine and lumbar region and are, according to Bell, as follows. 7 cervical, 12 dorsal, and 5 lumbar, 24. The five divisions of the vertebrae no longer exist, but are replaced by a trinity in unity. Further, the number 24, which we shall afterwards have to consider more particularly, comes into prominence, say, 8 plus 8 plus 8, and we see the 12 dorsal vertebrae dividing the remaining 12 into 7 and 5. The sacrum and coccyx are now invertebrate. Each forms one bone, and they are both joined to the pelvis. But we may still consider them as belonging to the spine, though invertebrate, and that brings the number of bones in the spine up to 26, or one-eighth of the total bones in the frame. 
4, 8 times 26 is 208. How suggestive of life and regeneration. 4, 8 is one of the life numbers, and the 26 consists of a 12 between two 7s, the two 7s being a projection of 12 into 14, to which reference will presently be made, and 12 and 7 and the idea of bisection are all connected with life. Thus, these 14 bones of the lower spine of the infant are found reduced to half their number, 7, in the adult. But it is not anatomy alone that determines the functions of life. Dr. Laycock, in writing on the periodicity of vital phenomena, says that the great unit of such operation is 7 days of 12 hours, and the and as these are all in 84 hours, the number is exactly that of musical notes, and the highest at which the constellations could be reckoned. Some mysterious mathematical law seems to subtend the formation of this number, 12. It arises out of the sequence of three numbers, 3, 4, and 5. The natural division of 12 is into 7 and 5, and that of 7 itself into 3 and 4 i.e. 3 added to 4, while 3 times 4, i.e. 3 multiplied by 4, is 12. A curious mathematical fact arises out of the consideration of the properties of these three numbers, 3, 4, and 5, for the square of any number divisible by 5 without remainder will always be found equal to two squares, one of which will be divisible by 3 and the other by 4, each without remainder because the square of 5 is equal to the square of 3 added to the square of 4, and this is, moreover, analogous to the important geometrical fact that in any right-angled triangle, the square of the side opposite the right angle is equal to the square of the two remaining sides, the great foundation law of trigonometry so useful in geodesy. Certain it is that by a threefold arithmetical process, the mysterious number 666 arises out of the number 12, for 666 is the sum of the numbers contained in the square of its half. Thus, 1 half 12, 6 results, 2 square of 6, 36 results, and the sum of the numbers 1 through 36 is 666. In holy writ, the whole history of man is based upon the number 12. The twelve-fold commencement of the human family, in connection with the triad, or three and one, is thus beautifully described in Cross's Lectures on Early Scripture, page 339. From the divine head of the race, Luke chapter 3, verse 38, to his son, Adam, through the triad of Adam's sons by a chain of twelve to Shem, beginning again at the subordinate head of the race, Noah, it passes through a second triad of his own sons by a second chain of twelve to Abraham. At this point, the third triad extends itself into three successive links, and is followed by a twelve no longer extended but together. The last twelve corresponding to the zodiacal signs, the total number of twelves, thirty-six, correspond to all thirty-six signs, i.e. the whole heavens. The same twelves are also projected into fourteens in strict analogy with the projection of the twelve signs into fourteen by means of the balance, and thus a cross was formed. To make the meaning of the analogy complete, as the following figure derived from the first of these sufficiently demonstrates. Adam, Cain, Abel, and Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, and Shem. There were, moreover, five of these fourteens from the Divine Father to Jesus, his incarnate Son. From the Divine Father to Shem are fourteen, Noah to Abraham fourteen, Abraham to David fourteen, David to captivity fourteen, and captivity to Christ fourteen, totaling seventy. The number of years of man's normal lifetime, twenty-eight more than the number of generations given in Matthew's genealogy, and seven less than those given in Luke's. The sevenfold system is thus strongly emphasized in the humanity of Christ. With such facts as the above in his Bible, the Christian need not fear any arguments of infidels as to the alleged pagan origin of the sign of the cross. It could have been perceived at the time of the flood in the first of these series of fourteens, 
in the flood was representation of the salvation of the human race by the crucifixion of one man, of which the myths of Indra, Addis, and Osiris, whose body was said to be cut up into fourteen pieces, were obvious perversions. Nor is there any truth in the reduction of the number twelve to eleven by the treachery of Judas being a copy of the myth of Krishna, alluded to in the earlier part of this chapter, for the same thought is manifest in the very twelves we have just mentioned, and which seem to be divinely given prefigurements of the defection of Judas. Adam in the first, Terah in the second, and Dan in the third series mentioned by Cross plainly illustrate the defection of one out of twelve, especially Adam, whose sin caused the crucifixion of the Redeemer. In magnetism, that force which so largely enters into the constitution of everything that has life, the same idea of the cross or balance of contrary forces is evident. Thus, in the magnet, A and B are the positive and negative poles respectively, and their currents which pass up and down the magnet, AB, are crossed by the line of the neutral zone at the center, C and D. Magnetism is strong at both poles, A and B, uh, and weakens as it approaches their center, C and D, and vanishes entirely at that line. And if the magnet were broken up into several pieces, the same phenomenon of the cross or balance would show itself in each one of the pieces, for each piece becomes a separate magnet, with its two poles and its central zone. The Arabians appear to have presented the number 666 as a representation of the 36 constellations of the heavens on a four-square projection worn as an amulet, as described by Kircher, in which the cross was represented just in the form we have just seen, uh, seen it taken in the magnet. And possibly there is a connection between this thought of the amulet and magnetism, for the heavens, with their contending forces, represent the same figure of a cross, the ecliptic crossing the equator. As we have seen in the magnet, and it is allowed that gravitation and magnetism are kindred forces in all their leading phenomena. This amulet is shown as the sigillum solis, or solar seal. This was the form of it, uh, the numbers 1 through 36, expressing the numbers pertaining to each several constellation. The peculiarity of it is this. It consists of six vertical rows, each amounting to 111, crossed by six horizontal rows, each amounting to 111. Thus, there being six 111s each, uh, each way, 666 is crossed by 666. Further, it will be noticed that diagonally, from corner to corner, the addition of the columns is also 111 each way. Squares of this description whose perpendicular, horizontal, and central diagonal rows are all equal, are technically known as magic squares. The diagonal 111s, or 111s, display a peculiar uh, symmetrical character. The two central numbers are 37, the two intermediate are 37, and the two exterior are 37. And 37 is the number obtained from 36 by addition of 1 in the way already shown to arise out of the thought of movement into the cross or balance. The 11 diagonal rows each way, of course, also give the sum 666, and the number of them being 11, the missing 12th is displayed, which I have shown is a thought running through the whole system of mystic numbers. The intervals of said diagonals are 1, 8, 15, etc. 7, and 6, 11, 16, etc. 5, expressing the division of the number 12 into 7 and 5, as above shown, in the sun's passage through the 12 signs. Thus we get 14 rows of 111, giving between them both forms of the cross, the plus and the uh, multiply, the upright and the sideways, or plus and multiplication, and these crosses cross each other. Now, there are two ways of adding the two 111s or 111s last obtained, the diagonal ones, to the two 666s. Six we may either add one to each, thus making a pair of 777s, or we may add two to either, giving 666 and 888 respectively, said 666 and 888 being, when expressed in lunations as we have seen, 
the great foundation number of the procession of the equinoxes, which is precisely what the amulet seems to have been intended to express. Thus, too, this amulet appears to furnish further evidence in favor of the view that the numbers expressing all astronomical cycles were derived by the ancients from the study of the history of the flood, combined with the simple facts regarding the moon and the laws of balance, and that thus they could dispense with the elaborate instruments which the modern scientific procedure of ascent from particulars to generals is compelled to call in quest. It seems, too, that the amulet represents the physical effect of the six winter signs struggling with the six summer signs and meeting at the equinox or cross, and the same resolution of six into seven by the balance. Indeed, it will be seen that each row contains six figures, wherever the sum is 111, and that there are altogether 14 of these rows, say six vertical and six horizontal, and two which are neither vertical nor horizontal but occupy the middle position of the diagonal. The six vertical and six horizontal rows thus make up 12, which, by addition of the two neutral or diagonal rows, becomes 14, in strict conformity with the projection of the 12 signs into 14 just lately described. Mythology, indeed, followed the idea very closely, for the Titans were six sons and six daughters, whereas in the story of Niobe, equally Noetic in its origin, the sons are seven and the daughters seven, and thus, although the supporters of Osiris were twelve, his body, i.e. the whole heaven, as represented by the amulet, was cut into fourteen pieces. The cross of Christ, through which, we have, uh, through which we have eternal life, presents to us the same numbers, 666, 777, and 888. If his name was Esus 888, the cross was Soros 777, and Saros is the same as the word Saros, which is 666, and, as we have seen, the words written by Pallotti upon it amount to five times 666 plus 777, his name, Isus Christos, having six and seven letters. The period he was in the grave was completed by Nicthemera, day and nights, and Nicthemeron is represented numerically by 666 times two, i.e. 12 hecatontides, 12 decades, and 12 units. To Joseph, who typified Christ, Pharaoh gave a seal or signet ring, whose words for which, in Genesis 41, verse 42, are Oth Tibathu, whose numerical equivalent is 888. Pharaoh's name means the sun, Fe Ra. The 666 and 777 is 1443, or 1443, which seems thus hidden in the words inscribed on the cross, and which is more plainly displayed in the figuration of the creation work of the fourth day. Let there be lights, 666, and in the firmament of heaven, 777, has been adopted by the Gnostics, who devoted a great deal of attention to the concealment of mystic numbers, for their triad, in which they, moreover, connected with the thought of the spirit brooding upon the waters. Thus, Bythos, the deep, 681, Enoia, thought, 186, and Numa, spirit, 576, being 1443, equivalent to 666 plus 777. The amulet is not, in its design, any mere device of man or demon, being simply one of a series of magic squares, but is most likely an actual transcript of physical forces, that is, of the laws of gravitation, as illustrated by the sun's circuit through the heavens. Let the reader construct a board divided into 36 squares, with the numbers placed in the same order as in the amulet. Then write on 36 small scraps of paper the numbers 1, 2, 3, etc., up to 36. Now, beginning at number 1, Proceed to place all the 36 scraps of paper on the board, one by one, up to number 36 on the corresponding squares, to those appropriated to each such number on the amulet, and in doing so, watch the rows they occupy, first horizontally and then vertically. Horizontally, the following phenomena will be seen to develop themselves, in strict accord with the sun's passage from the solstice, the extremities of the amulet, toward the equinox, the center of the amulet, and vice versa, 
as explained in the first diagram in this chapter. The first six numbers he will place, he will fill up half the squares in the two extreme rows, G, G, and L, L. The next six will occupy half the squares in the two intermediate rows, H, H, and K, K. And the third six will occur in the two central rows, I, I, and J, J. At this point, the reader will have arrived at the number 18 and performed half his work. He will remember that it is always 18 signs that are visible at a time, and that the 36 lines are cut in twain by the equinoctial line, or equator, which is in the center of the sphere. He, too, has arrived at the equinox, or the balance, and as he is illustrating the movements of the sun, he will find, by continuing the process, that he must now return to the solstice, or extremities of the amulet. Hence, beginning at the number 19, Again, six numbers are placed in the two central rows, I, I, and J, J. The following six occur in the two intermediate rows, H, H, and K, K, and the process is completed by placing the final six in the two extreme rows, G, G, and L, L. Next, let him take all the papers off the board and begin again, watching the phenomena of the vertical rows, and he will see that the amulet is also a representation of the process by which, in the sun's passage, through six of the signs of the zodiac, or central region, one is regarded as doubled, and at the same time another one is omitted, thus rendering it possible, as already demonstrated, to reckon the twelve signs as either ten, twelve, or fourteen. The first six numbers placed occupy respectively a square in each of the six rows, AA, BB, CC, DD, EE, and FF. The next six numbers do the same, at the third six there is a change, and that change occurs just at the number 18, the point where we observed a change in the former process. And I have already explained that four of the great cycles of time, the primary eclipse cycle, the nutation cycle, the revolution of the moon's nodes, and the metonic cycle, all occupy a period between 18 and 19 years. This change is that the number 18 instead of being inserted in the row AA, where it would be expected, as following the precedent of the first two sixes, is placed in the row EE, which has already been occupied, by the number 13. So that this time he has omitted one in the row AA and doubled one in the row CC, as following the precedent of the first two sixes, is placed in the row CC, uh, which has already been occupied by the number 13, so that this time he has omitted one in the row AA and doubled it in the row CC. Now he has accomplished half, now he has accomplished half his task. In completing it, he will see how symmetrical his work has been. The six that follow, from the number 19 onwards, double the one in the row AA, which had been omitted in the previous six, and of course omit the row EE entirely, as the place had been occupied in the previous doubling, filling up one space in each of the other rows. The six that follow these severally occupy a space in each of the rows, AA, BB, CC, DD, EE, and FF, while the remaining six fill up each of the rows. Nutation, one of the cycles just enumerated, bears a curious analogy to these phenomena of the amulet, both numerically and its relation to the balance. During that cycle, the sun passes through 6,660 degrees of the zodiac or circle, i.e. a number of degrees equal to 666 of the amulet multiplied by 10. That is to say, he passes through the 12 signs of the zodiac 18 and a half times during the period in question. For the cycle of nutation occupies 18 and a half years. Encyclopedia Britannica. It is thus a period numerically analogous to the 6,660 6, months of the Saurus, as was explained previously. The tilting is on one side for the first nine years and three months, or half the cycle, at which point it ceases and takes the opposite direction for the remaining nine years and three months of the cycle. Thus, there is a balance or center in the nutation towards which uh, the axis at first inclines, and from which it then recoils till the whole cycle has been completed. The scales of Anubis, which figure in the great assize of Osiris, have to form the cross thus. It represented the balance of good and evil, 
into account of the soul being judged. It was in strict analogy with the cross formed by the ecliptic in the equator at the equinoxes, between the good effected by Osiris and Horus and the evil or destruction caused by Typhon. Indeed, it would seem that the cross is at the beginning and end of all great phenomena of nature. Wherever force is in connection with matter, and nature's products have been undisturbed, i.e. where no destructive hand has been at work, whether in the animal, the vegetable, or mineral kingdom, wherever nature's grand formative power has been at work, there you may find the cross, that beauteous emblem of the life that proceeds from God, that which his mercy, that endureth forever, has employed in the death of his beloved Son, as the only means of making us perfect and worthy to stand before him who was and is and is to come, the perfect and holy before all time. So again, I wish I could read this whole book, but uh, this chapter is just, I mean, it's deep too. Um, there's a lot to it. There's just a lot of little bits of data to like put into context, obviously. Uh, this number, 666, thus appears connected with the date-repeating eclipse cycles. Of the 1,260 eclipses in the first date-repeating cycle, there are exactly 666 total or annular eclipses against 594 that are only partial. 666 is often thought to be a number peculiarly suggestive of incompletion or imperfection, 6 being one short of 7, the number of spiritual completion. The remaining number, 594, suggests the same thought of incompletion. But I want to move on to, well, there's a lot to this. Uh, are we to say, but divisions so accurate are never afforded by real history. So, however, it says Godfrey Higgins, an infidel who devoted 10 hours a day for 20 years to providing in a work of 1,385 quarto pages, the connection between religion and the heavens, an unwilling witness to the truth of Genesis. Then am I to doubt the existence of the Caesars? This is impossible. Then what am I to do? I am obliged to believe that all true history has been debased and corrupted by, ju by judicial astrology and mythology. Yes, the infidel strains at a gnat and swallows a camel. His denial of the supernatural character of the harmony of scripture obliges him to deny history, and so sweep away fact for the sake of theory. Higgins and Niebuhr are alike careful not to commit themselves to anything whatever in place of what they den uh, deny. They remind one of the experienced but not too scrupulous lawyer who, on being asked by a law student to uh, the key of his success, replied, deny everything and demand proof. As there are many Christians who, owing to recent controversies, may possibly think I'm trying to prove that when the angel speaks of 1,260 days, we are not under to understand days but years, I beg at once to disclaim any such intention. The words of scripture were written to be believed, and no external facts, however beautiful, interesting, symmetrical, or harmonious, can alter by one iota the intrinsic meaning of any single utterance of God. I believe that one moment's serious thought will convince any unprejudiced person that the mysterious connection between the year and the day in scripture and in nature does not in any way carry with it the substitution of a year for a day any more than it does the substitution of a day for a year. The non sequitur seems quite obvious. Analogy is not to be confounded with identity. In this case, the former is manifest, and the latter is not only manifest, but absolutely out of the question. And now to revert to the date-repeating cycles, the great astronomic year of 651 years, the second date-repeater we have seen contained 2,520 eclipses. This is just the number of eclipses in the primary eclipse cycle, 70, multiplied by the number of constellations, 36. This at once brings us back to the thought of our last chapter. Okay, so here he goes on to break up um, 666 into 306 and 360. Um, obviously going from where he was talking about all that, but... The number 306, like 360, and 666, is astronomical and, like them, is marked out by the moon, the number. 
from two lunar inequalities depending on the non-sphericity of the Earth, Laplace determined the ellipticity of the meridian to be 1 and 306 very nearly. Encyclopedia Britannica, sub book Astronomy. It is thus the number of the circle, 360, added to the number of the phenomena known as the ellipticity of the meridian, 306, that gives the number of the total eclipses in the great eclipse cycle, 666. That the Chaldeans employed the number 306 in their astrotheological system appears from the statement of Barossus, according to Abedinus, that the antediluvian monarch Aloris resigned 306,000 years. Nimrod, Volume 1, page 343. The same division of 666 into 360 and 306 is found in the name of Nero Caesar, who for five centuries was believed by Christians to be the Antichrist, for they were expecting him to rise from the dead as the wounded head of the beast, and, indeed, as a bodily resurrection of Antichrist is nowhere expressly predicted in Scripture, it would seem that metempsychosis, i.e. reincarnation of the soul, is what is to be permitted by God when the mystery of lawlessness is unveiled and the man of sin revealed, for that has ever been the doctrine of paganism, and thus it may be that the wicked soul of the Emperor Nero will be used by Satan for the execution of his long-meditated scheme one which, since creation, he has never relinquished. So well adapted was it to his purposes. Neron, 306. Kaiser, 360. Total, 666. Higgins thinks this emperor's names are connected with, the both, uh, with both of the Chaldean cycles, the Neros, or Naruts, and the Saros, or Saruts. He gave himself out to be the tenth avatar of this Anon, or Anon. Another author deep in this class of learning, but unfortunately also an infidel, writes thus interestingly on the Naruts, which he connects with the rose of the Rosicrucians. Speaking of the Rose Cross, he says, When it can be done, it is surrounded with a glory and placed on a calvary where it is worn, appended, and made of cornelian, garnet, ruby, or red glass, the calvary and glory are generally omitted. This is the Naruts, Natsir, or rose, of Esurin, of Tamul, or Sharon, or the water rose, the lily, Padma, Pema, lotus, crucified for the salvation of man, crucified in the heavens at the vernal equinox. It is celebrated at that time by the Persians, in what they call their new rose, i.e. neros or naruts. The word new or no or noi is the Latin uh, mons and our new, which also to the word rose makes new rose of the, which added to the word rose makes the new rose of the vernal equinox, and also makes the rose of the ross, um, and RSS is 360 and the chris, or cross, or with the letter C added, the rose, 365, in short, the god of day, the ross, or raj, of divine wisdom, cross, the cross wisdom, Ethiopic, the same as the monogram which the Latin Vulgate is ornamented, mankind, their origins and destiny, pages 303-4. It is probable, however, that the origin of the word new is the knock or noah, like that of the Greek nuos, Latin mens. The word nazir, too, may be the same as nazir, the mountain. So, huh. Which, in the Chaldean account of the flood, stopped the progress of the ship, and whose nota numerica in Hebrew is 360. It may also be worth mentioning that the word Napoleonti, the dative or dedicatory case of the name Napoleon, Grecicized, shows the same number, 666, similarly divided, for the first seven letters are 306, and the last three are, are 360, totaling 666. Many persons think the Antichrist will come out of this family. 
The name means the lion from the thicket and is suggestive of Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 7. Apparently, paganism worked upon these lines. Jennings, in his Rites and Ceremonies of the Rosicrucians, refers to the ancient amulet of the Canufus serpent, an Egyptian god identical with Neph and Anubis, also gods of Egypt, where round his head are seven rays forming a nimbus consisting of the seven letters of his name, Canubis. The seven are divided, as elsewhere uh, his number occurs, into three and four. Thus, the total figuration of the word is 1,332, or 666 doubled, of which the first three letters give twice 360, and the last four are twice 306. Sar, Saris, or Usar, is, as we saw, a word of deep meaning, being the root of much of the etymology of paganism. Higgins thus writes regarding it, I believe originally the word Caesar was Asar, or in the Hebrew style of reading, Rasa. Closely connected with the Rasis, or Rajis, of India. Upon these, the word Caesar, or Tsar, was formed. In Irish, God is called Aosar, pronounced Isar. In Hindustani, it is Ieshur, or Isar, or Iswar. In Sanskrit, it is Iswara. In Arabic, Usar, El Shid, which name the Egyptians often pronounced Oishiri, Oisiri, and Usiri, Jablonski. And in the Chaldean, we find Aisra. In the Hebrew, or Bustrophedon reading, we also see the origin of Rashith, or wisdom, whence the Rosicrucians derive the first half of their name, and the Persian hero god Rustan, Ceres, the goddess of harvest, in whose honor the famous Eleusinian mysteries were celebrated, and Saturn, whose name means the sown one, from Sero, Sevi, and Satum, are like words derived from Sar. Sor, the god of Tyre, uh, Tau, Samek, Bav, Resh, totaling 666, is the same word. Sar, but uh, with but a slight difference in the pronunciation, Cirque or Circe, the Enchantress, and Sarapis, whose name means the hidden seed. By no means close the list of derivations of this remarkable word, which probably originally had reference to the redemption in Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman. It would be wearisome to name them all, even if that were possible. The Kassir Mound, the supposed site of the Tower of Babel, displays the same etymology as well as the Kassir Nimrud, or Nimrod, in the Arisoanite gnome in Egypt. There remains one more god whose name is derived from Sar, and who must by no means be passed over. The Hebrew Aish, meaning man, becomes in Chaldee, Ait. Thus, the word Aisra mentioned above would, by metathesis, becomes Aitra, and mean man's son. They frequently put the letter Mem, or M, before the name of the god, as in Manu, or Mana, etc., to signify either 40 or 600, and thus indicate two of Noah's most important numbers. Putting the M before the word Aitra, the first A, would be omitted in the writing the word and we should get Mitra, or Mithras, the famous Persian god of the crossed wafer. This god's name gives us more than one remarkable figuration, just as might be anticipated, for Persia occupied the ground of Nimrod's original kingdom of Iran, or Eden, and presented, as might well be expected, a closer parody on the truth than any other pagan theology. Thus, Mithra in Hebrew is 651. Mem, Yad, Tau, Resh, Aleph. Mithras in Greek is 360, and Mithras, or Mithras, a variant of his name sometimes found, the author of the Mysteries of Freemasonry thinks the word mysterion, mystery, was not originally a Greek word, but derived from mistor, or mistar. Mu, mut, or meut, meant death, and store is sar, the seed. 
the word mystery than would have meant originally the death of the seed. Mistar and Mitzer seem to be the same, and probably Mitra and Mithras are from the same root, and had, for one of their meanings at least, pagan gods' names usually had uh, more than one meaning, the death of the seed. In fine, have we not now the complete explanation of the mysterious crucifixion of the god Indra? Was not the wood the ark? Was not the cross, signified by the ark resting against the mountain at the vernal equinox, when the ecliptic crosses the equator? Was he not Noah, the man whose figurative death corresponded to the sun's passage through the twelve signs? Were not the five wounds of the god the five months when the fertilizing power of the sun is in abeyance, the same five when the ark floated on the waters? Surely the real type was that of Christ wounded in the five places, the hands and the feet and the side. I believe no type of Christ was ever so complete as that of Noah, the one righteous man whose complete typical death, burial, and resurrection in type saved the world. And with Noah were associated seven others, whose counterpart we find in the seven ark preserved Rishis of India, and were thus associated in paganism with the seven planets or seven stars. Thus, in the Apocalypse, we see Christ and the seven stars or churches, apparently the Noachian type, beautifully expounded. For, regarding the imagery of the temple worship, Faber refers to the following interesting exposition from Josephus, showing how God gave it uh, for a, um, an earnest of his lordship over the heaven, the earth, and the sea. Uh, the Jewish historian tells us that the sanctuary represented heaven. So it's interesting that they say that they think of Noah as the primary Christ. It's kind of interesting. Um, to compute the number 666, according to the divine injunction in Revelation chapter 13, ver uh, verse 18, shown good reason to believe that Noah is the man alluded to in that text. Was it not from the history of Noah and the flood in connection with Genesis 1 that the worship of the sun and the seven planets and the twelve signs of the zodiac, by a wicked perversion of the original truth, took their origin? Have I, or have I not, shown that the leading numbers of astronomy are introduced in the account of the flood and carried into the apocalypse by the revelations of that wondrous angel, who instructed Daniel the prophet and John the beloved disciple. Chapter 7, The Cosmic Character of the Ark Just as the cross represents a primary form of the operations of nature, so does the cube. And the ark was a cube. Speaking accurately, it was an oblong rectangular parallelogram. Hitherto, our mathematics have been mainly confined to, to arithmetic. Now we broach more particularly the domain of geometry. The formless gives place to form, and the arc, as the grand emblem of the origin of worlds, was a sign of form molded by the creator out of the formless and void. All substance comprises length, breadth, and uh, thickness, the three dimensions as they are called. Thus, the primary form of substance is the cube. The number of dimensions, three, corresponds to the number of homogeneous forms. And it is with these same forms, translated from the plane into the solid, that we have now, uh, that we have now to deal. Now, in arithmetic, the first cube is the number eight, so that eight may be called the number of substance. Thus, we find eight in its threefold projections, 24 and 888, in the procession of the equinoxes, and in the accounts of creation, renovation, and regeneration given us in scripture. The cube is a figure with six sides and eight corners delineated by twelve lines, a number corresponding to that of the signs in the zodiac. It has twenty-four angles, there being four angles to each of the six sides. This number, twenty-four, is the least common multiple of six and eight, the number of the sides and corners. If we add the number of the angles in each side to the number of the sides, we get the number 10 divided into 4 and 6, like the Ten Commandments, four of which were written on one table and six on the other. The decade of Pythagoras, 
was a triangle or plane of a pyramid similarly divided. Thus, 6 into 4. Kircher and Oedipus Egyptiacus, or Egyptiacus, Volume 2, Part 1, uh, pages 267 through 8, compares this to the Tetragrammaton of the Rabbis. Thus, the number of the constellations being the name Jehovah expressed in pyramidal or triangular form. He adds that they also uh, made 24 out of the same name in this way. Again, in scripture, we find ten patriarchs from Adam to the flood divided into six and four. Say, Adam to Jared, six, and Enoch to Noah, four. Both inclusive. Then, from Shem to Eber are four, and from uh, Peleg to Abram, six. Both inclusive. Making up the next decade. And the very history of the flood is made up of ten periods subdivided into four and six. Thus, one 40 days from the 17th to the 2nd, to 26th to the 3rd month, 40. And 2, 150 days from 26th to the 3rd, to 26th of the 8th inclusive, from 26th of 3rd to 17th of 7th, when Ark rested, 110, and 3, from 17th of 7th to 26th of 8th, and uh, end of 150 days, 40, so 150, 4, from 26th to 8th to 1st of 10th, when mountains appeared, 34, totaling 224. 5, uh, 40 days from 1st of 10th to 10th of 11th, inclusive, 40. 6, 7 days from 10th of 11th to 17th of 11th, uh, raven to 1st of 7. 7, 7 days from 17th of 11th to 24th of 11th, 1st to 1st to 2nd of 7. 8, 7 days from 24th of 11th to 1st of 12th, 2nd to 3rd dove, 7. 9, from 1st to 30th of 12th, when the ground was dry, 29. And 10, from 1st uh, of 1st to 27th of uh, 22nd, when Noah left the ark, 56, 146. 24 is the number of the extra zodiacal constellations, and the cosmic character of it is further brought out in the 24 lines, which may been drawn in the figures deriving the triangle and the square from the circle in chapter 5. It is, in scripture, the number of the courses of the Jewish priesthood and of the elders of the apocalypse. And so also 24 hours in a day, and then 24 comes up in uh, the Pistis Sophia. The ark was held to be uh, emblematically identical with the moon, hence the figure of the lunette. It was represented either as the rectangle or the rectangle in the crescent or the crescent. For just as Noah represented the sun or seed, the male principle, the ark was held to be the mother of mankind from whose womb the earth was peopled, and hence identified with the moon, held like a ship to be female. Now as the moon and the numberer, marked out the procession of the equinoxes as 26,640 lunar years, and these are a trine of 24s, 24 hecatontides, uh, 24 decades, and 24 units, multiplied by 10, and as 24 and 10 are two numbers that represent the cube, the arc, the mother, the universal substance, we can surely see ample reason for the analogy the ancients perceived between the two emblems, the moon and the ark, the sun's boat. The very word Zion, the mountain on which the ark of the covenant found its resting place, is said to mean the sun's boat, from to see, or z, ship, and on, uh, or zai, and uh, ship, and on, the sun. They regarded the ark as microcosm, the earth as megacosm, and the heaven and the world together as mega or magisticosm, magisticosm, three and one. Faber seems to be right in regarding the ark of Noah and the ark of the covenant as one emblem, though under two aspects, and in each case it was a representation of spiritual things. Thomas Taylor, the Platonist, in his Eleusinian and Bacchic, uh, Bacchic Mysteries, says the Greek mystics regarded the number eight with aversion, as being the number of the clothing of the body, that is, of substance. 
This may possibly help to explain the uh, preference of unclothed spirits, that is, demons, for 666, the number of Antichrist, to 888, the number of Jesus, for the object of Satan is still, as ever, opposition to material resurrection. It is fair here to point out uh, that their mystic word, jobulon, employed in Freemasonry, can be written as 888 in the Hebrew, and no one is likely to doubt that it is the same as the or same word as Babylon. And further, the scripture itself apparently connects Babylon with this very number 888, for the rebellion took place according to Usher's chronology just 120 years after the flood i.e. in uh, AM 1776, or exactly twice 888 years after the creation. Antichrist, however, is something different from Babylon, and his number is 666. Nor is the above any mere fanciful theory of the ancients. I shall now try to show how it comes that in very truth the cube is the primary form which substance takes, in that in the naming Cybele, the goddess who is represented as the great primordial substance, in the cubit stone referred to in the first portion of this work, Hakub or Hakaibi, as they did, this originated a great scientific fact. Of the three kingdoms, the animal, vegetable, and mineral, the last named is the primary, both as taught us in the account given in Genesis of Creation, and as allowed by science. The primary form of all minerals is that of the crystal. The laws of crystalline form are as beautiful and simple in their character as they are constant in their operation. The following is taken from Found's Manual of Chemistry, page 278. It may be laid down as a general rule that every substance has its own crystalline form, by which it may very, well, uh, may very frequently be recognized at once. Not that every substance has a different figure, although very great diversity in this respect is to be found. Some forms are much more common than others, as the cube and six-sided prism, which are very frequently assumed by bodies not in any way related. The italics are mine. In describing the rules of classification of these forms, he writes, When a crystal of simple form is attentively considered, it becomes evident that certain directions can be pointed out in which certain or straight lines may be imagined to be drawn, passing through the central point of the crystal from side to side, from end to end, or from one angle to that opposed to it, etc., about which lines the particles of matter may be conceived to be symmetrically built up. Such lines, or axes, are not always purely imaginary, however as may be inferred from the remarkable optic, uh, optical properties of many crystals, upon their number, relative lengths, position, and inclination to each other. It depends the outward figure of the crystal itself. All crystalline forms may upon this plan be arranged in six classes or systems. The first or simplest of these, the one with which our present essay is alone concerned, the monometric, regular, or cubic system. He thus describes it. The crystals of this division have three equal axes, all placed at right angle, uh, all placed at right angles to each other. The most important forms are the cube, the regular octahedron, and the rhombic dodecahedron. As we shall require to discuss the first two of these, the cube, being the form of the ark, the tabernacle of God with the men at the time, cubic like the Holy of Holies, 1 Kings chapter, 1 Kings, chapter 6, verse 20, and the eight-sided object that forms a double pyramid, I must draw them both. The letters AA, BB, and CC, he adds, show the termination of the three axes placed as stated. The very many substances, both simple and compound, assume these forms, as most of the metals, carbon in the state of diamond, common salt, potassium iodide, the alums, fluorspar, iron bisulfide, garnet, spinel, etc. 
For our purpose, I would uh, especially point out the triple tau or cross which these axes form, as apparently there are elsewhere the great formative principle that runs through nature. And may it not be in Noah's resting with the ark or cube upon the mountain, the intention was to present that fact as a beautiful concealed prophecy of Christ, the seed of the woman, bearing his own cross to the summit of Mount Calvary for the redemption of his bride. Particularly as the period when the ark rested on the mountain was during the three days, 15th to 17th Nisan, when the crucifixion took place of the Son of Righteousness, and when the great cross of the years formed by the ecliptic and equator. The mountain and the pyramid are again the same emblem, under different aspects. And, if the reader will refer back to the diagram at the commencement of chapter 5, he will see an illustration of the thought of the ancients by which the mountain or pyramid was held to be described by the sun's passage through the heavens or rather through the twelve signs of the zodiac. From spring to autumn he draws in the heavens the upper or upright pyramid, while from autumn to spring he completes the pyramid of the regular octahedron, and the inverted pyramid then drawn. Indeed, the primary crystalline forms are evolved from the circle, the form of the sun's passage, Psalms 19.6, through the twelve signs of the zodiac as seen from this circular earth. Just as the triangle and the square which constitute the planes of the primary crystalline forms were shown to arise from that same form, the circle, in chapter 5. For the cube is constructed on the plane of the square, and the double pyramid on the planes of the triangle and the square combined. The ancients attempted to carry out the idea of the double pyramid in their temples and cities, but that they may be a true reflection of the heavens, and in this the idea seems to have been to bring back paradise without the atonement, for New Jerusalem is clearly pyramidal in form, see chapter 11, and is, as uh, all allow, the restoration of Eden on a grander scale with the presence of God and the tree of life, and with the curse removed. In Egypt there was the ancient city of Crocodilopolis, uh, Arsino, a word in which perhaps we may discern the meaning Noah the man-child, for he was represented as an infant on emerging from the ark, and as placed on the mountain he ruled all the world, a mountain being the divine mystery always an emblem of rule. Arsino seems to divide naturally into Arsen, male, and Noe, or Noah, rendered feminine in accordance with the thought of Noah united to the ark, which they worshipped as the hermaphrodite god. Indeed, Noah and the ark were associated with the mother and child, as will be seen when we come to discuss astrology. The twelve gnomes, increased by Ramses II to 36, of the structure erected, of the structure erected by Amenemhat uh, III, described in the first portion of this work, in the extract from Mr. Lawrence Oliphant's Land of Kemi, were, of course, intended to copy the twelve signs of the zodiac and the projection into thirty-six would either represent the thirty-six constellations or that subdivision of the twelve zodiacal signs into thirty-six compartments, often found in paganism. It will be remembered the chambers in the labyrinth were all doubled, one underground, the others above it. The same idea of a subterranean counterpart is found in the Great Pyramid of Giza. For the initiate must represent the descent into Hades and the Abyss, before he could rise to the king's chamber above. Hence there were subterranean passages in that edifice in which the mysteries, as in other pyramids, were almost undoubtedly celebrated. The way in which the ancients connected the cube, the pyramid, and the regular octahedron together, how they regarded the cube as the symbol of earth, the pyramid of fire, and the regular octahedron of air, and how they derived them all from the geometrical figures known as isosceles and scaling triangles, is given in Kircher, Volume 2, Part 2, pages 5-6. Uh, through six. Their geometrical system followed the course of nature, for the triangles themselves they derived from the circle, as the propositions of Euclid demonstrate. 
The numerical analogy between the cube and the regular octahedron is of the closest description. The number of the sides in the one is the same as the number of corners in the other, and vice versa, six and eight, respectively. The total number of angles in both being identical, viz. 24. The sigillum solis, described in the previous chapter, is geometrical in character, for its total 666 is the result of the addition of all the numbers uh, from 1 to the square of 6. It is one of the seven planetary seals. The numbers in which added up vertically, horizontally, and diagonally are always the same. They are described at length in Kircher, and the squares referred to are those of 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. 666, or 666, is indeed found in all the three homogeneous forms, as the circle, we found it in the procession of the equinoxes, as the square, it appears in the sigillum solis, and it can be set as an equilateral triangle by simply extending the rows of the asterisks in the triangle depicted at the commencement of the chapter to a 36th row. We'll be given a total of 666 asterisks. Perhaps the cosmic character of the pyramid may now be considered demonstrated as well as the connection that exists between the various emblems for the same thing, under different aspects, the woman, the cube, the pyramid, the mountain, and the city. But the full development of the subject must be deferred to a later chapter, as other points, such as initiation, astrology, and the representation in emblem of eternal life must first be elucidated. Before passing on to them, we must, however, consider the geometrical character of astronomy in the forces known as gravitation and magnetism. Just as in God's word we have seen numbers multiplied by themselves to the second and even third power, thus presenting to us the square and the cube, so we find the same square and the cube introduced by him into his laws of planetary motion in the elliptical orbits of the heavenly bodies. The following are Kepler's three laws. 1. Each planet revolves round in an elliptic path, having the sun at one of the foci. 2. Each planet moves round the sun with such a velocity at every point that a straight line drawn from it to the sun passes over equal areas in equal times. 3. The squares of the periodic times are proportional to the cubes of the mean distances. So, in magnetism, we have Coulomb's fundamental law. The force exerted between two magnetic poles is proportional to the strength of the poles, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. In each instance, the italics are mine. My object is to show that the interchange of force and matter is based upon geometrical laws, and that Noah and the Ark was intended to show the same geometrical character as the representation of the union between force and matter, the two great cosmogonic principles. The cross seems to represent the active or formative principle in nature, force, just as the cube or arc represents the passive principle, subject, i.e. matter. Hear what Webel says on this subject, the italics are my own, all natural occurrences in the skies and on the earth in the organic and in the inorganic world, are determined by the relations of the elements and the actions of the forces of which the rules are thus prescribed. The relations and rules by which these occurrences are thus determined necessarily depend on measures of time and space, motion and force, on qualities which are subject to numerical measurement and capable of being connected by mathematical properties. And thus, all things are ordered by number and weight and measure. God, as was said by the ancients, works by geometry. The legislation of the material universe is necessarily delivered in the language of mathematics. The stars and their courses are regulated by the properties of conic sections. And the winds depend on arithmetical and geometrical progressions of elasticity and pressure. The constitution of the universe, so far as it can be clearly apprehended by our intellect, thus assumes a shape involving an assemblage of mathematical propositions. Certain algebraic formulae, and the knowledge when and how to apply them, 
constitute the last step of the physical science to which we can attain, astronomy and general physics with reference to natural theology, being one of the Bridgewater Treatises, 7th edition, pages 6 through 7. Indeed, it seems to be quite clear that all mystic numbers are geometrical in their character. The whole philosophy of the ancients was geometrical. It is by geometry that number enters in to form, and worlds are constructed. The formation of astronomical cycles is as geometrical in character as Kepler's laws, for the science of astronomy is based on geometry. The bisection and reduplication that occur in the number of the constellations arise out of geometry, and the addition of one in the place of the employment of fractions is geometrical. This last principle may be thus shown. If you divided a line into six parts, there will be seven and not six points in it. Thus, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six. The two circles, the ecliptic and the equator, crossing one another cause a division of the circle into twice six parts, thus having the power of 14 points rather than 12. This subject is further developed in Appendix D, its further elucidation being considered more appropriate for the student than the ordinary reader. Okay, so there's so much, again, to this book. I wish I could sit here and read it all. So we'll think about initiation, the seed, time. Clearly this book, for it being from 1891, is pretty advanced, and yet um, there's like little to no mention of it. The seed can only ripen by means of the generative influence of the sun, whereas man and the animal creation contain within themselves the solar or generative power. Each man is a son to himself, and hands down his vital force to his children. The vitality we have in Christ is as that of a plant, ripened by the sun of righteousness. As the corn of wheat, he, he died that he might not abide alone. As the sun, he ripens the harvest, the children of the kingdom. We are not to be independent sons, every man his own Christ or Savior, that is, lawlessness, astrology, Satan's plan. Procession, with its numbers 360 and 888, was the means of representing the great principle of life. For the Lamb, the last of the two signs, the sacrifice, became by procession the first, and thus the resurrection was represented. And what procession is to the sun in years is to the man's life in days, as already shown. It was by procession that the star of the dragon would cease to be the polar star, the foot of Angonasis crushing his head, and thus there would be in the heavens the representation of the devil cast down from his throne above. It is in this connection that there is most interest to be derived from the teachings of the ancient wisdom, now so much ridiculed, that the world was developed from an egg. The egg, or seed, represents dormant but completed vitality. The phrase used in Genesis verse 1, chapter, or chapter 1, verse 2, was brooding, is that which corresponds to the, pres is that which corresponds to the process of incubation. The study of the phenomena of the egg shows the very closest analogy with the rest of that chapter. As soon as incubation commences, the germinal membrane becomes distinctly separate from the yolk and the yolk bag, spreading and assuming the form of a central pellucid spot surrounded by a broad dark ring. At the same time, it becomes thickened and prominent and is soon separated into three layers. Of these, the exterior is a serous layer, the internal a mucous layer, and between the two is situated a vascular layer in which vessels soon become apparent. From the first, all three serous uh, structures of the future animal are developed, as from the mucous layer are all the mucous structures, and from the middle, all the vascular structures. 
the circle of the sciences, volume 1, page 82. Thus, the first point is the establishment of a three-in-one. Then, whereas the account of creation occupied one week, and is divided into two periods of three nicthamera, or a third period, so the incubation of the chick is uh, the same week triplicated, and it is likewise subdivided into two periods of three nicthamera, and a third period. The first to the third day, and the nineteenth to the twenty-first days, being each marked periods in the whole three weeks incubation. Allusion has also been made to the radical point of difference between the animal and vegetable kingdoms, in that the solar energy is self-absent in the former, whereas in the latter application has to be made to the celestial sun for that peculiar energy. The maturation of seed in the vegetable kingdom is not possible without the aid of the solar generative force from the heavens. The effect cannot be produced artificially. And when Christ is spoken of as the sun, two things must be particularly remembered. The first is that he is not said to be the seed of the man, but only of the woman i.e. he was born of a virgin. The second is that the result of his birth of Zion, i.e. his acceptance by Israel as Messiah, through their repentance, predicted in Revelation 11 and 12, is the harvest and vintage of Revelation 16. The period of the maturation of the seed of corn, as has been demonstrated, was marked out by the Great Pyramid of Giza. I merely use this as an illustration of scientific truth, not that the structure was divine, situated in latitude north 30 degrees, which is nearly the same latitude as Jerusalem and Babylon, round which places the whole controversy between Christ and Satan is shown in the apocalypse to turn. That structure with the ring or circle of the sun's passage round it and from its shape is seen to display the three homogeneous forms, the circle, the equilateral triangle, and the square. Further, viewed from the center of the circle, the sun describes around it, we get the figure of the crossed wafer. Displaying the circle, the triangle, not equilateral from that point of view, though in reality it is so, and the square. If you examine a flower fully opened, you will find at the end of the epistle, select a pea or bean by preference, a pod full of little ovules which are afterwards to be the seeds. Pollen from the stamens on the pistil will cross the flower, but the maturation of the oval into a seed only takes place by exposure to the rays of the sun, and then only during that season of the year when he exercises his generative power. The ancients, however, perceived that the tau, or cross, had three forms all of which occurred in rotation in the process of maturation of the seed of corn in connection with the circle, viz. the T, the Y, or Greek upsilon, and the cross. There was in the circle a natural division into twelfths by means of the T, or balance, depicted in chapter 5. For if you, will, if you allow the rod to swing right round, its extremities will describe a circle. Thus we get the figure which is the first tau. Osiris, the seed god, was sometimes called Esiris, or Esiris. He was said to judge the dead while hidden in the realms below. Thus, the balance, or T, on which the soul was weighed, was poised upon point C, which represents the winter solstice. A is the vernal equinox, and B the autumnal. These are the three beginnings of the year. The birth of the sun was at the winter solstice, the sacred year began at the vernal equinox, and the civil year at the autumnal equinox. The year never began at the summer solstice. It will be noticed that the drawing straight lines between A and C and between B and C, no homogeneous geometrical form can be inscribed within this figure. It therefore simply represents the first of the homogeneous forms, the circle, with its subdivisions into semicircle and quadrant. The triangles ADC and BDC are rectangular triangles, as in figure 3, and not equilateral triangles. But the original form of the triangle is the homogeneous one, the equilateral triangle, 
and such is the real form of that plane as found on the Great Pyramid of Giza. And the peculiarity of the position is that of north 30, uh, 30 degrees latitude produces out of the circle the equilateral triangle in combination with the point C representing the winter solstice. For the two branches DA and DB being elevated, each of them 30 degrees north of the equator, to E and F. Produce Y, or second form of the cross, whence Osiris was named Isiris, which is the great symbol of the cross in China, and which indicated the divided road, or leading to uh, heaven and the other to hell, one leading to heaven and the other to hell, as described in the sixth book of the Aeneid, uh, the junction of whose extremities, C, E, and F, described or gives the equilateral triangle, the second of the homogeneous forms. It must be explained that the points between the equatorial signs and the next signs on the either side of them contain the tropics now called after the two signs Cancer and Capricorn, re uh, respectively. But when the sun was in Taurus at the vernal equinox, they were tropics of Gemini and Pisces, respectively, i.e. of the two doubled signs. These correspond to the tribes of Simeon and Levi, and to Ephraim and Manasseh, respectively, where the same doubling took place, reading them off in their order. From B to E, then, are seven signs reckoned as eight, which expresses the idea of the sun being in eight distinct signs as he passes over the seven-twelfths of the circle of the zodiac to ripen seed in latitude north 30 degrees. The third form of the cross is figure 3 supra, and it is formed by the central stem of the Tau being swung, uh, swung up to G, the sign Leo, the summer solstice, and the junction of its extremities, AC, BC, AG, and BG, gives the third homogeneous form, the square. The equilateral triangles of figure 2 being once more seen as rectangle triangles. Divide figure 3. It was from this phenomena that the great strength was attributed to the sign Leo, the lion, for, being at the top, he was represented as pulling the sun upwards to restore him to life as the male child. Thus, in Egypt, the dead were placed on a couch representing the form of a lion, who, by his great strength, was supposed to raise them up again to life. And the sphinx, the monster with the lion's body and the woman's head, was a combination of the signs Leo and Virgo. In Persia and Assyria, the sun was worshipped as the lion. In Greece, the twelve labors of Hercules, just the sun uh, passing through the twelve signs, commenced with the slaughter of the Nemean lion, whose skin he afterwards wore. The lion was the figure carried on the standard of Judah, and is the title given to Christ in the Apocalypse in connection with that tribe. There are then three circles, each with its different forms of tau or cross, upon which the seed ripening power depends. It matters little whether or not they be illustrated by a stone structure like the pyramid, they exist in nature, though invisible. The three taus, treated as a three in one, the great basis of life, give the figure which divides the circle into twelfths, the so-called wheel of fortune. These geometrical emblems not merely enter into the workings of God in the vegetable kingdom, but the same law governs the origin of life in the higher, the animal kingdom. The so-called discovery of these three emblems in the circle in connection with this most wonderful of all the operations of nature is due to the experiments made in quite recent times, and could not have been ascertained but for the microscope. Even the results of the preliminary discovery of Ham uh, Lewin, Lewinhoek's pupil in A.D. 1677 were not, con were not uh, considered finally established until within the last few years, and so great an authority as von Baer, as late as 1835, disputed them. On the subject of the Tau, Upsilon, and Cross as applicable to the animal kingdom, the last great authority is Van Beneden, or Benedin, whose work was only given to the public in 1883. The reign of law in the universe is indeed perfect, and it is to be hoped that no one will be so infatuated as to deny to God the right to introduce one uniform plan for the gift and restoration of life in the highest of the three kingdoms. 
the animal as well as in the two lowest, the mineral and vegetable, nor death having come into the world through sin to appoint the very or sin, to appoint the same very good system as the means of restoration to life of a fallen creation in his word. This discovery is, thus, by no means to be confounded with any one of the three emblems carried in the processions of Dionysus. They simply arise out of the line in the circle. The workings of nature are according to the laws of God. Let us keep him in remembrance. The Egyptians employed both classes of emblems and confounded the two. Let us not do so. It would be interesting to know how scientific men today would explain their unquestionable anticipation of the researches of Leeuwenhoek, uh, Ham, Richard Wagner, and Vin, is that Richard or R. Wagner, and the Van Beneden in the Cairo emblem, and the Ark resting on Ararat on the 17th Nisan, does not explain the whole. In the ripe egg, Van Beneden or Beneden, describes new complexities within the germinal spot. This consists of two juxtaposed quadrilateral discs, each containing four chromatin globules, united by a substance having less affinity with, uh, or for coloring matter. Radiating from these two discs, a chromatin thread arises in the prothelosoma, but stress is laid on the fact that no grouping of the chromatin elements into a star-like figure takes place. The spherical shape of the germinal spot is now modified by the intrusion on each side of a large homogeneous droplet from the vitellus into the prothelosoma, so that in optical section it comes to have a T-shape, the accessory portion being mainly compressed to form the stalk of the T. At this stage, the spermatozoon usually commences to work its way into the ovum, but does not yet affect the germinal vesicle or germinal spot, which proceeds to the formation of polar globules. The T-shape uh, gradually passes into the ypsilon or ypsiliform figure, ypsiliform figure, so called for its resemblance to the Greek upsilon. Its study, its steadily diverging branches, which are formed from the prothelosoma, prothelosoma move upwards till the Y reach the surf, uh, surface of the vitellus, their fibular, fibrillar structure already noted, meanwhile uh, becoming well marked. Each bundle bears one of the next groups of four chromatin globules which compose the germinal spot. Next, the vertical branch of the ypsiliform figure swings upwards to the surface and a new branch is formed, uh, a continuation of the same line. The whole figure is thus cross-shaped with the prothelosoma in the center, but this cross soon disappears, leaving the prothelosoma with its two chromatin groups. Um, so, There is a remarkable passage in Luke in which the loaf, the fish, and the egg, the very three things we have been discussing, are contrasted with the serpent, which a little earlier in that gospel had been described as the part of the power of the enemy. Of which of you that is a father shall his son ask a loaf, and he give him a stone? Or a fish, and he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he give him a scorpion? Chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. And the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan falling as lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. Chapter 10, verses 17 through 19. The loaf, the fish, and the egg are all things good for food, and are associated with the gospel, the wondrous lesson of the loaves and fishes. How unthankful to confuse these things with serpents and scorpions, and all the power of the enemy. Yet, no sooner has this lesson been taught then we find the precise same confusion on the part of the multitudes. And he was casting out a demon which was dumb. And it came to pass, when the demon had gone out, the dumb man spake, and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of the demons, casteth he out demons. Chapter 11, verse 14 through 15. This passage will be again referred to uh, when we come to discuss the great secret of the mysteries. 
God is silent both as to the class of image Nebuchadnezzar set up in the plains of Dura, and as to the abomination that maketh desolate. But there are not wanting hints in Scripture to enable us to infer what both of them are. And one thing is certain, God contrasts the abominations done in Jerusalem with a tau, thus the original Hebrew, set on the foreheads of men uh, that sigh and that cry for the abominations that shall be done in the midst thereof. Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4. The ground plan of the Jewish temples had this precise shape of the tau, i.e. the cross. And what is remarkable is that the magnificent set of three rows of each four steps added by Herod to one in, uh, to the one in which the Lord ministered, gave to it the exact shape of the conventional cross. Read Ferguson's Temples of the Jews. Infidels confuse the Tau and the Phallus, and it is at least possible that the ultimate distinction between the wise and the wicked will turn upon the understanding of the contrast. There seems to me... Uh, an elusive contrast of the deepest import in the words used in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Whoso readeth, let him understand. The secret of the mysteries was not for whosoever, but only for the initiate. Thus, it seems, the Lord not only exposes the secret, but declares that the exposure is made to anyone that reads the book of Daniel, if he be among the wise. Science, whether astronomy, geometry, or physiology, is by no means to be confounded with obscenity. In the two preceding chapters, I had to show that initiation and astrology were both perversions of one common truth. By splitting the truth into two branches and then perverting them both, the ancients managed to lose the remembrance of God. The purport for which the signs had been given uh, was lost to the world till John's visions brought it once more to the fore, and, alas, for the way in which it has been dealt uh, with since the days of Clement. Surely, if one thing is clearer than another in the Apocalypse, it is that the heads of the earth tribes, the animal creation as shouted forth in the four points of the zodiac, the third form of the cross, the zoa, i.e. the bull, the lion, the eagle, and the man, representing the cattle, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and man, are now being redeemed. Yet the ancients saw the animal kingdom as though it required no purging, the need for which uh, what passed at the orgies themselves distinctly demonstrated. Fellows, in referring to the representation in all systems of mythology of the Great Father, the creative or male generative principle by the solar uh, circle and point, gives one instance worth mentioning here. The Celtic temple at Clasernus in the island of Lewis was constructed in the form of a circle, a cross in a circle, the cross being indicated at the four points, east, west, north, and south, in a circle composed of 12 stones, one stone larger than the rest being placed in the center. Mysteries of Freemasonry, pages 238 through 39. The following diagram presents the scheme as a whole, and it will be noticed that the curves of the figure Upsilon, the doubling of the signs of Gemini and Pisces, and their corresponding tribes is indicated. In the myth of Osiris, or Isiris, the body of the god being cut into fifteen pieces, the same is here represented. It is intended to illustrate the various phenomena detailed in the chapter now concluded. So, and then this chapter on the mountain is also interesting. Mount Zion, the mountain of initiation. Chapter 12, the Apparita. Alas, we must leave the delights of the contemplation of the new Jerusalem and turn to a far less agreeable subject. We must do this because we are coming to the great climax of our theme. Up to the present, the analogy between the machinery employed in the mystery of God and that in the mystery of lawlessness has been mainly dwelt upon. We now come upon the great broad line of demarcation, and the very previous analogy uh, heightens the ultimate contrast. 
The mysteries contained one great and important secret, always withheld from the public cognizance, and as it was at the time when the mysteries had been revived that the Apocalypse was handed to us, as the early Christian fathers were mostly ex-initiates, and as paganism was the stronghold of Satan's system, if we are to hear and keep the sayings of that book, it is necessary for us to look at it in its true light of God's armory against all that paganism has ever taught or has yet to teach, and especially as the revelation of an omniscient Lord to his children of the nature of this awful secret. It is necessary here to advert to and lay stress upon a point that has escaped the notice of even the most advanced interpreters of the Apocalypse, which is vital to a right apprehension of the book and has a most serious bearing on this part of my subject. John testified the testimony of Jesus Christ, which Paul tells us was to the circumcision only, Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 through 3, Romans chapter 15 verse 8, and chapter 16 um, verse 25, and a distinct testimony to his own, which was a mystery hidden from the prophets, and in no way the spirit of prophecy, announcing the union of Jew and Gentile in one body. There is no reference to the one body in the Apocalypse. It is not once specified. The nature of the testimony of Jesus is published in Isaiah 61 and 62. The chaplet in the Lord's right uh, hand therein referred to is the wrath of seven stars of the Apocalypse and is pronounced to be Israel. The promise of the new name is there said to be made to Israel as well as to the glory of the bride, the new Jerusalem. A special locality is emphasized in the seven epistles of the Apocalypse, and the whole is said to be prophecy, thus presenting a double contrast to the epistles of the Apostle Paul. That locality is the dominions of Attalus III, the then headquarters of the secret society that was established at Babel, and which has manipulated empire from that day to this, regulating by its dictum every great change that it has experienced, the harlot riding upon the beast. The work of Christ was to destroy the works of the devil, who, we learn, had his throne in Pergamos, where he was worshipped in propria persona under the name of Asclepius, the serpent god, the man instructing serpent. The secret was called Apareta, a word whose figuration, by the way, is 660, like that of the Hebrew Sather, or Setar, to hide. Whence Mistar, the word, uh, the original word for mystery or thing hidden. This much is known and acknowledged regarding it, viz. that it taught the worship of a deity superior to all gods worshipped by the masses. Some have assumed, therefore, that the one god was the creator. But that is surely a most hasty conclusion. Was it for that that the ten plagues afflicted Egypt and Pharaoh, uh, his hosts, were drowned in the Red Sea? Does the Apocalypse predict still greater plagues for such doctrines as that? Contrast Revelation 14.7 Another view is that the hermaphrodite god, Noah, in the ark is the deity in question. But what great secret was there in that to guard so jealously with frightful oaths and terrible threats? Wherein does such a god differ from the common idols worshipped by the masses? The writers who have put forward the above views seem to have concentrated their attention on the symbols. The true and only sure method is, however, to read the Apocalypse in general and study in particular the great enigma of Revelation chapter 13 verse 18, looking to the symbols for illustration only. The only unfailing method of interpreting scripture is the structural. What is the structure of the great mystery of evil in scripture? Where do we first hear of Satan's activity, and where do we read of the end of it? These are the questions we have to ask ourselves. Then we have to compare the beginning and the end in order to get a for then we have to compare the beginning and the end in order to get a firm grasp of the general character of all that intervenes. Now, surely the great poles of Satan's action are Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 and Revelation chapter 13 verse 18 for Revelation 17 1 to, uh, to 19 4 is explanatory of God's judgment upon evil and Revelation 20 is God's judgment of Satan and not the evil itself. 
Let us then compare Genesis 3.1 and Revelation 13.18. First, we notice that Satan never appears in any other book in the Bible under the name of the serpent. He reappears in Revelation under this emblem, given as one of the signs, one taken from the Garden of Eden and written in the heavens. But in the Revelation, he has developed a feature not found in Genesis. He is seen in the character of the guardian god of the fourth empire, of Daniel's vision. For he has the ten horns upon his head which identify him with the fourth beast. Every schoolboy knows that the name of the guardian god of Romans is Janus. It was Janus that stood up for the people at Rome, just as the angelic prince of Israel will stand up for Daniel's people at the very time of this vision. It was Janus that usurped the offices of Christ that held the keys, the opener and shutter, Petulius and Clusivius, and the gates of the passage of Janus were never closed except on the three occasions when Rome was at peace, for all the rest of the time he was with them in their wars, doing battle for them. Janus was represented as the god of the year. He presided over the four seasons, i.e. the four gates of the zodiacal square. The month January, which opened the year, was named after him. And on New Year's Day, it was customary to make presents of a medal uh, of of this god, on the obverse side of which was his bust, consisting of two heads back to back, the one an old, the other, the other of a young man, while on the reverse side was a ship. The idea, therefore, presented to us is an identification of the devil and Noah, worshipped as the great solar serpent, and as Noah was the great uh, grand emblem of the son of righteousness, and the seed of the woman. If this be indeed the secret of the mysteries, it must awaken suggestions in the mind of every Christian, which his whole being cannot but regard with the utmost abhorrence. But to proceed. From Genesis, we learn that the mischief perpetrated was linguistic in character. Chapter 11, 6-9. through 9. From Revelation, that it is mathematical. Chapter 13, verse 18. And these two characteristics are really one. For every letter of the ancient languages expressed a number. The reader who has so far followed my argument will see that it has been all along mainly a combination of the etymological and mathematical fields. The reader who has so far followed my argument will see that it has been all along mainly a combination of the etymological and mathematical methods. If, therefore, the key to the secret lay in the name of Janus, we should expect to find it unlocked the door of both the etymological and numerical methods pursued. An inquiry, therefore, into the origin of the word and its numerical equivalent is imperatively demanded. Let me endeavor to discharge the task. The author of The Two Babylons, who sees the noetic or noetic na uh, origin of the name and identifies it with that of the famous aquatic god Oannes, or Oannes, or Owens, thus writes, Janus was publicly known to all Rome, to the uninitiated and initiated alike, as the grand mediator, the opener and shutter, who had the key of the invisible world. Now what means the name Janus? That name, as Cornificius and Macrobius shows, was properly, uh, was properly Iannus, Saturnalia, Liber 1, chapter 9, page 54. And in ancient Chaldee, Iyanush signifies the man. By that very name, the Babylonian beast from the sea was called when it first made its appearance. The name, as given by Greek in Barosis, or by Barosis, is Oannes, page 48. But this is just the very way we might expect he, Anesh, the man, to appear in Greek. The name Ianush, or the man, was applied to the Babylonian Messiah as identifying him with the seed of woman. Page 445. The small capitals are mine. Now, while there cannot be much doubt that the late Mr. Hislop here proves this case, there appears the strongest reason for believing that the Ha-Anesh, or Hanesh, has a still more important meaning than the man, even than the fallen man, which he gives as the idea of Anesh on the next page, but one where simply substituting the Egyptian for the Chaldee definite article, he shows that Janus, or Hanesh, or Ianus, 
is Phanesh, who is Fanes, Phanes, Phanes, Pan, Fan, Van, Phenu, Phoenix, Bennu, Venus, Et hoc genus omni. The common Latin word for door, Janua, Bryant says, is derived from Janus. Bryant also shows that he was sometimes called Janus, uh, whence it was, whence it seems probable that the Latin word for uh, year, Anus, Anus, sprung, if indeed it did not come from the original Anesh or Hune or Hanesh. As the Hebrew letters proceeded from the signs of the zodiac. There can be but little doubt that the Hebrew was the most ancient of languages, as it is the Hebrew only and not the Phoenician that have been formed from the signs. The Phoenicians were, therefore, innovators, and their innovations descended to the Greek language, in which the grand key to the secret is given in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. It is interesting, and indeed most important, to, to consider some of their leading innovations, as well as the general career of that remarkable people. They instituted the method of expressing every sound by a letter. They may have been impelled to do this after the confusion of tongues, or they may have concluded that the omission of vowels in the original Hebrew was a defect. At all events, they adopted pretty nearly the pronunciation of all the Hebrew consonants and gave to the aspirates, which form the fifth and eighth letter in the Hebrew, so closely resembling each other in shape, the character of the vowel E. Then the sixth letter, the vowel, or digamma, which in the Hebrew is both a vowel and a consonant, like the Latin V, which corresponds to it, was used by the ancients as a breathing and placed at the beginning of every word commencing with a vowel. Mr. Hargrave Jennings writes, The Eolic digamma is the crux of philologists. The ancients pronounced every word which began with a vowel with an aspirate, which had the sound of our W, and was often expressed by B or uh, Y or Epsilon, and also Gimel or uh, Gamma. For the figure of the double Gamma, Digamma or F, was invented whence the name Digamma. The Latin language was derived from the Aeolic dialect and naturally adopted the Digamma which it generally expressed by V. BF, PF are interchangeable letters. The Rosicrucians, page 287. The I and B were also occasionally interchanged, as in Iacus and Bacchus, Jabulon and Babylon, etc. Following out these principles, the word Hanesh is the Hanahash, the serpent, of Genesis 3, 1, thus showing the very name of Janus, the guardian god of the Fourth Empire, to correspond with the emblem of the devil in the apocalypse, that old serpent. Nahash, or Nakash, is thus changed into Nesh, which, with the article of Ha, is Hanesh, or Janus, and, converting the aspirate of the article again into E, it is Ianush, or Ianus. This would be expressed by the letters Eta, Nu, Eta, Sigma, Ines, and prefixing the letter Upsilon as the equivalent of the U, or Digamma, or Vav, it becomes Ianes, uh, that is, Janus, or Janus. If it be objected that one of the aspirates in this word should naturally be converted into the short E, or Epsilon, and not the long E, or Eta, I would reply that the question is not one of the conversion, but of perversion, and that after so radical a change as that from H to an E, the question as to whether it should be a long or a short E would be determined according to the object the perverters would have in view, and we know from the scriptures what that object was. In the letters, Upsilon, Eta, Nu, Eta, Sigma have the numerical equivalent, 666, the very same letters as Ha, Navis, or Naeus, the ship. Uh, the same ship that appeared on the above-named metal. It so happens that this very letter, the U, or Digamma, occurs in the very text we are considering, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, being in the Hebrew the copulative that introduces the subject. The word, Va Nakash, is thus three words in one, a trinity in unity. Now, the serpent, having the numerical equivalent, 666, meaning at once Janus and the devil. 
It is the first word that introduces the subject of the activity of evil into the Holy Scripture. And Enuth and Janus, or Janus is the name of Noah, nay, in the midst of yes. That is, Noah and his three sons, Japhet, Ham, and Shem. Or still better, Noah in the midst of IHS, the, same, the root of the name Isus. For, so the innovators apparently set to work. The U in Hebrew is used to express the sound O, hence Uhanesh, Uanes, or Oanes. The ending of the subject of the activity of evil in its uh, is in precise analogy with the foregoing, except that in the place of putting Christ's name in Noah's or the Ark's within the serpents, it puts the serpent within Christ's in the Ark's. For the last word on the subject is Chai Zai Sigma, or Christ, at the Trinity and Unity of Letters expressing numerically 666 and presenting a serpent erect as if defiant of the curse on it, in the midst of the root of the name of Christ and the root expressive of the ark or chest in many languages. For the Latin sista, the Greek siste, hista, uh, the Scotch and Dutch kist, the Spanish sesta, and the chest of Freemasonry are all the same word, and Romans, Greeks, and Freemasons all connect the serpent with the ark or chest in which the emblems of the pagan mysteries were deposited. And as our text uh, uses the word nuos, uh, it is probably originally uh, it was probably originally Noah, perverted into identity with Nahash, the second syllable of the name of Janus. While the allusion to wisdom is probably in opposition to the pagan doctrine that the serpent was the divine wisdom or logos. The great satanic device, then, was to bring about a mysterious union between the serpent and the Redeemer, the devil in Christ, and Christ in the devil. Take the structure of the account of our Lord's ministry, the subject to which allusion was made in chapter 10, the terms that Nimrod had accepted in the execution, uh, which was interrupted, were apparently the same ones that were offered to the Lord, and which he indignantly refused. The offer seems to have been made on two occasions, for the temptation initiated at the outset of his ministry, and which then only ceased for a season, seems to have been brought to a close only at the end of the same when Satan obtained Judas in Gethsemane and on the cross, Satan's hour and the power of darkness. Those who would wish uh, to see the exposition on which this is based are commended to the Outlines of Prophecy by Robert Brown pages 593 through 9. Having been foiled in that great effort, the next development of the scheme was a setting up of a pretense that it succeeded. Immediately after this refusal, we find evil spirits giving their testimony that he is the Christ, Luke 4, 41, and learn that Jesus showed that this pretended connection between them and him was what he was expressly laboring to prevent the world from believing. So, the portable commentary expounds the passage, which it connects with Acts uh, 16, where Paul, acting for the first time under the direct commands of the Holy Spirit and attacking the strongholds of paganism on his first entry into Europe, in its triune aspect of spiritualism, pseudo-philosophy, and idolatry, is immediately after his conversion of the woman, for it was by the woman that the divine seed was to come, Confronted with the seed of the serpent in a woman, the Pythoness, the spirit of the Delphic oracle, professing unity of source of inspiration with Paul and the whole of his evangelistic mission, a doctrine which has now reappeared amongst modern spiritualists whose mediums are mostly women who work like the woman Paul encountered for money, who suffer from prostration like the Pythoness at Delphi, and to blaspheme against the Holy Ghost by teaching that the Lord Jesus, the apostles, and the prophets were but mediums like themselves, thus preparing the way of the Antichrist, that precise abomination that he and his apostles indwelt by the Holy Ghost labored to suppress. Pitho, or Pitho, was the ancient name of Delphi, and Python was shown in chapter uh, 9 to be the great polar constellation Draco. The python was fabled to have been found in the mud left by the deluge. Nor are indications wanting that this Janus, the devil, was uh, held to be the supreme god by the Romans themselves. 
Janus, while manifestly worshipped as the Messiah or God-man, was also celebrated as Principium Deorum, Terentianus Maris in Bryant, Volume 3, page 82, the source and fountain of all the pagan gods, the two Babylons, page 446. Indeed, as the prayers of the heathen ascend to demons, the very word they themselves used for their gods, and as Beelzebub is the prince of the demons, the chain of evidence as to Satan being the supreme god of the mysteries looks very complete. Yet that is not the whole secret. The word Anesh is man as well as serpent, and the man-serpent, the man of sin, is the Antichrist. The idea seems to be that Satan's production of a man in union with himself in the word of God distinctly tells us that this man of sin must emerge out of the mystery of lawlessness, that is, out of what the mysteries taught. So, in Revelation 12 and 13, we have the picture of Satan, the serpent or dragon, in union with the beast, the Antichrist. Writing of the Gnostics, Mr. Hargrave Jennings says, The Ophites are said to have maintained that the serpent of Genesis was the Logos and the Savior. The Logos was divine wisdom and was the Buddha, or Buddha of India. The Rosicrucians, Volume 1, page 273. In India, the great Abad is Buddha, Buddha, or Bada. There is a connection here suggested with Abaddon of the Greeks. In the same way, a relation may be traced with Buddha's spiritual teacher, who was the mythic Pythagoras. Thus, in Sanskrit, it is Buddha Guras. Uh, in English, it is Pythagoras. The whole is Buddha's spiritual teacher. The three most celebrated emblems carried in the Greek mysteries were the phallus, or I, or Yod, the egg, O, and the serpent, Phi, or otherwise the phallus, the yoni, or umbilicus, and the serpent. The first in each case is the emblem of the sun, or a fire, is the male or active generative power. The second denotes the passive nature, or feminine principle, or the element of water. The third symbol indicates the destroyer, the reformer, or the renewer, the uniter of the two, and thus the preserver or perpetuator eternally renewing itself. The I and the O were originally simply the line in the circle, the very basis of all geometry in the origin of the ten ciphers of arithmetic. But, as will be seen from the quotation from The Perfect Way or The Finding of Christ by Anna Kingsford, not, alas, a finding of him in the flesh. In the first portion of this work, they are perverted by men who put God out of remembrance into objectionable emblems. If geometry is of God and all that proceeds therefrom, infinitely more so is his holy and beloved Son. The writers of that book and their proselytes are exalting woman above man, prohibiting marriage and proclaiming abstinence from meat and wine, as necessary to the development of the particular class of sorcery, which has this effect of cauterizing their consciences to make room for evil spirits, as predicted in 1 Timothy 4. Nothing but a cauterized conscience in man could derive such conclusions out of the doctrine of Christ and God's workings in the universe. Once let the Noachian covenant lapse, society is lost. The book actually ends with a hymn to Bacchus, and that, with all the double entendres that run through the same, proclaims what they mean by the finding of Christ. The Pitha, or Buddha, is plainly the python, the spirit of the Delphic oracle, that which appears in the acts in the woman in a pythonic spirit. It is the serpent with whose powers Apollo was endowed. Apollo seems to be Apollyon, Abaddon possibly, as Groves suggests, Ubadon, the lord of the serpent. Pitha may also be Ta, the father of Asclepius. The phallus was the emblem under which Noah was worshipped under this system that Mr. Jennings finds it possible to speak of with respect. The egg was the ark, and the serpent the devil. And he is one more witness in favor of our argument that the devil and his man are coming forward, and the Savior will utilize the Noachian imagery for the purpose. As to the identity between Janus and Buddha, Indian mythology absolutely determines this. Higgins quotes the following from Faber's Pagan Idolatry, Volume 2, page 369, 
showing that at least two or three of the greatest authorities on the subject regard this as demonstrated. One of the names of Buddha is Jain, or Jainisa, and it has been clearly shown by Sir William Drummond that the mythology of Italy was substantially the same as that of Hindostan. If we omit the Hindostani uh, terminal A, we get Jainese, a word, a word nearly approaching to the Yanes above mentioned. Can there be any question that this Janus, uh, or Buddha, represents the union between the dragon and the beast? In the first volume of Asiatic Researches is a very able article in the Gods of Greece, Italy, and India, in which the writer establishes the identity of the Western and Eastern pantheons god by god. And as Janus and his Eastern counterpart, this Jainesa, or Ganes, as he calls him, for it seems hardly possible to doubt the esoteric identity of Jainessa and Ganesha, were always invoked at the beginning of every enterprise. He commences his account by proving the identity of the two. Thus, says he, is Ganesha the god of wisdom in Hindostan, painted with an elephant's head, the symbol of sagacious discernment, and attended by a favorite rat which the Indians consider a wise and provident animal. Janus was imagined to preside over infants at their birth or at the beginning of life. The Indian divinity has precisely the same character. All sacrifices and religious ceremonies, etc., are begun by pious Hindus with an invocation of Ganesha, a word composed of Isa, the governor or leader, and Gana, a company of deities. Few books are begun without the words salutation to Ganesh. And so I was just, again, reading the Kanda Yoga, Kanda Yoga Upanishad, uh, volume one of the Sacred Books of the East. And it also talks about how Om, like everything should be started with Om. And Ganesha is essentially like identified also with Om. So that comes to mind. Essentially the Om, if Om is Ganesha and Janus, the beginning, then it's so many, it's all these things. It's so crazy. Uh, the elephant is the same symbol as the serpent, both signifying wisdom. So, and also the hold, like the encompasser or the enveloper, or in some way, like what is holding the universe. Uh, the presiding over infants, infants at their birth is the same thought as the uh, phi. Uh, o Yod of Greek, and seems to have a more specific allusion to the birth of the child of the year of the planisphere, the Isa or Esa, that appears in his name seems disguised to mean simply leader, but really to the Isa, Iesa of the Arab, Iesa of the Ar uh, Arabians, the Iuso of the Hebrews, the Yes or Es, by Sir William Drummond, page two, uh, 278. In being invoked at the beginning of every pagan enterprise, we are reminded that this very name, uh, Janus, Yanes, or Ganesh, is the very first word that begins the scripture account of the whole enterprise of evil. The company Yeza, we shall presently see to be uh, the four seasons, and to represent severally Iao, or Bacchus, uh, Helios, Zeus, and Hades, or Pluto. But as a single instance of the identity of the Hindu with the Greco-Roman Greco pantheon, none is more interesting than the Hindu version of the story of Perseus and Andromeda, one which is, moreover, germane to our subject because connected with the Cassiopeian polar or kingdom group of constellations. Wilford gives an account in Asiatic researches of a, common, or of a conversation with a pundit or astronomer representing respecting the names of the Indian constellations. Asking him, he says, to show me in the uh, heavens the constellation Antarmada, he immediately pointed to Andromeda, though I had not given him any information about it beforehand. He afterwards brought me a very rare and curious work in the Sanskrit, which contained a chapter devoted to Upana, uh, Upana Chatras, or extra zodiacal constellations, with drawings of Kapuja, Cepheus, and Kasyami, or uh, Cassiopeia, 
seated and holding a lotus flower in her hand, uh, of Antarmada, charmed with the fish beside her, and last of Parasha, or Perseus, who, according to the explanation of the book, held the head of a monster which he had slain in combat. Blood was dropping from it, and for hair it had snakes. Some have inferred uh, from the circumstance that the Indian charts thus showed the Cassiopeian set of constellations, but that the origin of these figures is to be sought in India. But probably both the Indian and the Greek constellation figures were derived from a much older source. Proctor's Myths and Marvels of Astronomy, pages 353 through uh, 354. The following list of identifications of the names of the gods, goddesses, and heroes, etc., of the Greco-Roman with those of the Hindu pantheon, as suggested by Colonel Wilford in, the, uh, in Asiatic researches, will probably be regarded as sufficient proof that the pagan establishment of India is precisely the same as that of the Fourth Empire. It is an important point, as if it can be demonstrated, uh, it is clear that the Greco-Roman religion has never passed away, and as India is now under the rule of uh, those powers where Roman law prevails, it may be that uh, that plague spot that the canker of paganism will once more overspread Europe. On the one hand, England is treating her religion with the utmost respect, which is one source of danger, and on the other, there is the most painful contrast between the dealings of the other church with that pantheon in the methods of modern missionaries. The former, as ex-initiates of the mysteries, were fully acquainted with the purport of the apocalypse, whose machinery they treated as the same as that of the mysteries. They plainly told the advocates of paganism that their great serpent was the devil, and that their gods were demons, and everywhere bore witness to the fact that their great expected logos, or tenth avatar, would be a reality but that he and the dragon would finally be utterly broken to pieces by the Lord of Glory. And perhaps the most deplorable feature in the whole position is that no effort is being made, or seems at all likely to be made in the near future, to instruct our missionaries in even so much knowledge of the machinery of the contents of the Apocalypse as is shown in the former portion of this work. The poor benighted Hindus that they have been sent to convert actually possess. It is a healthy sign, it must be admitted, that the discovery has been made that the Christian religion is making no way in India in comparison with population, and that this has taken the place of the old self-satisfaction on the subject. But when the apostles were passing away and the church was left alone to wrestle with uh, the world, the Lord knew that she required some weapon against paganism and should replace them and give us the apocalypse. The neglect of this book, and what is worse, the determined maintenance of a system of interpretation which blunts the edge of it in dealing with the Aryan religions, cannot but hinder missionary effort from bearing fruit in those regions. So, D Spider, uh, D Spider, Jupiter, Devispitir. Janus, Ganesha, Saturn, Satyavrata, Saturn, Satyavrata, Dionysus, uh, Deva, Nahusha, Ceres, Ceres, or Ceres, Rhea, Re, Cerberus, Sabura, Cepheus, Capuja, Cassiopeia, Cassiope, Perseus, Persea, Andromeda, Antarmada, Cadmus, Cardama, Semele, uh, Siamala, Prometheus, Pramata, Pramatesa, Deucalion, Deocalion, or Deo, yeah, Deocalion, Dardanus, Dardanasa, Titan, Daitya, Etna, uh, Aitni Devi, Cetus, Setu, Python, Pythonasi, and Argonaut, Argonatha. Let us call another witness. In Waring's Ceramic Art of Remote Ages, Plate 48, uh, numbers 1, 2, and 3, may be seen an illustration of a gem concerning which the author writes, page 101, The sacred serpents, which were employed in the celebration of the ancient mysteries, especially those of Bacchus, were kept in a cista, ark, or basket, as shown in number 2, which some sacrilegious youths having opened are attacked by them, whereas the initiate could handle them with impunity, as seen in number 1. 
and another is being fed on the altar, probably with honey, whilst an attendant eraphant watches apparently for some omen and holds the divining rod or lichus in, uh, lichus in his hand. The testimony of the myth of Erechtheus is to the same effect. The name means the Ark God, from Erech, Ark, and Theus, God, Faber's Mysteries of the Kabiri. Athena, or Minerva, reared the child without the knowledge of the other gods and entrusted him to Agralos, Pendrosos, and Herse, concealed in a chest which they were forbidden to open. But, disobeying the command, they saw the child in the form of a serpent, or entwined by a serpent, whereupon they were seized with madness and threw themselves down from the rock of the Acropolis. This seems to point to the identification of the archite child, Noah, the type of the Christ, as the man-child, with his enemy, the man-serpent, as the secret of the mysteries. The great infidel writers of our time mostly seek to derive Christianity from serpent worship. And we learn from the second epistle to the Thessalonians that the result of all this attack upon truth will be belief in the lie itself. One of the above given quotations from Faber, chapter 4, refers to the wearing of the golden serpent, which was the mark worn by the initiate to express his regeneration. In Egypt, Pharaoh wore the serpent on his forehead, the very place indicated for the mark of the beast in Revelation 13. And the seven-headed serpent, the same apparently as described in Revelation 12, is even now worshipped in India. In Moore's Hindu Pantheon, page 171, is a plate of a seven-headed Buddha. And against page 12 of the same work is a plate described as Vishnu and Lakshmi on Shesha, or Ananta, contemplating the creation, with Brahma springing on a lotus from his navel to perform it. It is, in fact, a couch on which they recline, and Vishnu is Ushnu, the man Noah. Uh, Vav 6, Yod 10, Samek 200, Nun or Nu 50, Upsilon 400, totaling 600. So, Fisnu, Vishnu, reposing on the waters. So, not only is Sesha Naga 666, but Vishnu. The serpent swimming and leaning his seven heads over Vishnu's head as he sleeps. The seven he which also brings kind of an, the whole idea of Vishnu's omniform, or the Vishvarupa, being all the other gods, and then also all the gods being 666, according to uh, Higgins, kind of all comes to mind. And it's all like overlapped... Over so it's all overlapped once again in the egg. The seven-headed serpent was also worshipped in ancient Egypt. It has been traced back to Akkad, one of the cities of Nimrod. Akkad is the original home of the many-headed serpent myth, and so we read in a, a very ancient Akkadian myth, the thunderbolt of seven heads, like the huge serpent of seven heads I bear, like the serpent that beats the sea which attacks the foe in the face, Records of the Past, uh, three, chapter 3, 128, page 128. Uh, M. Lenormand well compares the Akkadian serpent with the seven-headed Indian serpent, Vasanki, which was doubtless derived from it. Brown's Great, Di Brown's Great Di uh, Dionysiac Myth, volume 1, page 120. The Indian seven-headed serpent is sometimes called Naga, which certainly appears to be derived from Nahash and the Akkadian, Egyptian, and Indian are doubtless the same as the Lernian Hydra, one of whose heads was supposed to be invulnerable till Hercules attacked it. And most probably, all three people simply copied from the star domes the Hydra pursuing the Ark, as described in Chapter 9, Ante. In another portion of Waring's work, uh, may be seen two plates representing the Great Serpent as encircling the air, the earth, and the sea the one of Jormungand, the Scandinavian god, and the other of Brahm, the supreme god of India. Is not this again the picture described in Revelation 10 to 13? The angel descends from the air with the rainbow, the emblem of the everlasting covenant made by God, with all the inhabitants of the air, the earth, and the sea, to take possession of the earth and the sea, the female elements, of which the ark, or mother, was the emblem. 
There is war in heaven, the serpent disputes possession, descends from the air and enters into combination with the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. But it must not be forgotten that we are distinctly told that the dragon's great object is to devour the child. The enclosure of the letters, Upsilon, Eta, Sigma, which mean the Savior, within the word Ha Nahash, by perversion of language, is in accord with this. The child in the planisphere was, as has been explained, actually called Yishu, or Yo, uh, Isu, by the Hebrews, Yeza, by the Arabs, both of which appeared to be the Yesh, or uh, the Savior, and the very name of Jesus. He was hailed the anointed king, says Sir William Drummond. The evidence seems pretty clear that Satan tried to make Antichrist out of Nimrod, and the following passage from Herbert's work, page 403, may perhaps show us how Satan will proceed with the Antichrist. His, or Nimrod's, infancy was indeed, as it is said of Erichthonius, another name of Erechtheus, Smith's Classical Dictionary in Loco, so closely swathed in the serpent's folds that he could not move a limb. Cecrops, the father of Agralos, Pendrosos, and Herse, or, as some say, the son of Erechtheus, is described as an Atakthon, and is accordingly called a, uh, a word suggestive of Ganes, uh, but uh, literally earthborn, and as Mr. Pembrum explains, the same in origin of the, or as the Gigantes, or children of the Nephilim, or fallen angels, the upper part of whose body was man, or human, whilst the lower was that of a dragon. Hence he is called uh, Diphuse, or Geminus, Smith's Dictionary Greek, uh, Greek and Roman Biography and Myth. Diphuse was esoterically twice born, and the initiate of the mysteries had this light. But esoterically it seems to be a three-in-one. D, or Di, the bisection of Phi, the serpent, and Yes, or He's, Upsilon, Eta, Sigma, the man-child. Janus was also called Geminus. The Titans, in Titan is 6 at 6, were represented as men down to the groin, their legs being serpents, wearing ceramic art. Paganism associated Janus, the ship god, with the number 300, that which, expressed in cubits, gave the length of the ark in connection with the number expressive of the year. Lamprier, or Lamprier, says Janus is represented with two faces because he was acquainted with the past and the future, or, according to others, because he was taken for the sun, who opens the day at his rising and shuts it at his setting. Sometimes he holds the number 300 in one hand and 65 in the other. As 300 is the number of the ark, so the total, 365, is the number of the year. It will not be by accident that this accords with the fact that the 365 years of Enoch's earthly life are divided into 65 and 300 as well, in Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. Nor is 65 standing by itself a meaningless number. It's also um, Adonai, or Adonai. For the figuration of the words written on the cross, 7,215, is a trine of 65s, say, 65 hecatontides, 65 decades, or 65 units, just as 666 is 6 hecatontides, 6 decades, and 6 units. The reference to past and future is again suggestive of Buddha, who is spoken of as past, present, and future. But the omission of a third uh, head to express present tends yet more strongly to identify him with the Antichrist, the beast that was, is not, and shall be present. The name of the ocean god of the Romans seems to support the same view, for Ne, or N-H, is Noah, P is the Egyptian definite article, and Tanin is the Egyptian word for, uh, Egyptian for dragon, the whole being Neptanin, or Neptune, Noah the dragon three words, and one actually calling Noah by the name of the dragon. And one of the epithets of Poseidon, Neptune, was Genesius, the father. Uh, whence it would appear that Ganesh, Ganesh, and Genesis were intentionally connected. 
Ganesh or Ganesh presiding over the beginning of life. In Egypt, whose religious system instructs us better as to the intention of the rebels of Babel than perhaps any other, as more immediately following the times of Nimrod, this idea of the serpent in the ark or sun's boat was constantly claimed. Space does not admit of my giving many instances of this, but I can boldly say that no Egyptologist of note would dream of denying that this was an influential character or a characteristic of the Egyptian religion. A visit to the British Museum will give ocular demonstration as to this. The Pyramidions and Papiri there show the sun's passage in his boat, and the head of the cobra on the statues may there be seen on the forehead or seat of wisdom of gods, pharaohs, and queens. One of the most interesting illustrations is to be found in Mr. Stuart Villiers' book, uh, Nile Gleanings. There is the serpent, Agathodamon, enshrined in his ark in the center of the boat, in the prow of which stands Cirque, i.e. Circe, the woman of enchantments, taming the great serpent of the deep, Cacodamon. This division of the year into two halves, the one dominated by Agathodemon, the good demon, and the other by Cacodemon, the evil demon, writers have tried to explain in various ways. But it is important to notice that no such distinction is found in the sphere. The attempt to find Agathodemon in the spirit, or the serpent, lifted up by Moses. The attempt to find Agathodemon in the serpent lifted up by Moses is based on anachronism nor is the seraphim a plural word. It seems more consistent to find in Agathodemon the perverted thought of the man-child become a serpent. Similarly, the serpent with his tail in his mouth is not in the sphere. In the typical celestial globe in the British Museum Library, where the outline of the figures is drawn exactly in accordance with the true position of the stars, the great serpent of the pole is seen to uh, subtend exactly five of the divisions of the zodiac, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius, 150 degrees, corresponding to the 150 de uh, days prevalence of the waters at the deluge. For when they were visible, the sun was in the opposite signs, and the destructive power of the dragon was held to be fully developed. In the Egyptian and other planispheres, however, where the stars are not appropriated to the signs with due accuracy, they have drawn him out over seven and even nine signs, so that by a slighter further stretch they could bring his head and tail to meet in accordance with their idea that through the man-child the serpent is one with that child full-grown, i.e. the polar constellation, Cepheus, the crowned king or dominus soul that stands upright by the side of his recumbent form. The two serpents, Jormungand and Brahm, given by Waring as encircling the three regions, are each represented by its tail and its mouth. And there is a third picture in the same work described, uh, described as a representation of the Hindu cosmos, or three worlds resting on a tortoise supported and enclosed by a serpent with its tail and its mouth. That the child was in some way to be made uh, the seed of the serpent and the woman, all paganism seems to teach. Thus, again, the Eleusinian Mysteries, by far the most famous at the time of the, uh, the Apocalypse was written, describe Persephone, or Proserpine, as emerging from hell begirt by a serpent. Taylor's Eleusinian and Bacchic Mysteries, page 111. In Nimrod, there are two interesting passages which, when placed in juxtaposition, have a decidedly ominous character. Attila, king of the Huns, represented himself as the man-child, uh, as that man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. His mother was a woman clothed with the sun and standing on the moon and crowned with the twelve stars of Israel, and the effect was that he offered himself to Christendom as the new messiah. He added to his titles Nepos Magni Nembrod or Nimrod, Nutritus in Engadi, in Engadi. Pho or Buddha was brought forth from the right side of the Virgin, whom a ray of light made uh, had made pregnant, and he was washed by nine dragons who descended from heaven. In the mystery of Antichrist, the serpent or dragon plays a distinguished part. 
The most memorable and important circumstance connected with this subject is the imposture of Alexander, who, before he undertook the conquest of Iran, or the Kingdom of Asia, and the restoration of Babylon as the capital of the world, procured an oracle to declare that he was miraculously uh, begotten by Jupiter Haman, or Amun Re, 686, in the disguise of a dragon. Volume 1, pages 364 through 65. Thus, the pretensions of those who aspire to the world kingdoms in this age of Satan's supremacy are always to be at once the man-child and begotten of the dragon, that is, the seed of the serpent. There must be, in the Antichrist, the mouth speaking blasphemies. And this thing is blasphemy of blasphemies. The child Jesus was incarnate by the Holy Ghost, by him who at creation's dawn brooded upon the waters. Indian mythology shows us that blasphemy against the Holy Ghost of that precise character, but perhaps worse in degree, recorded against the Pharisees in Matthew uh, 12, when they were denounced as a brood of serpents, has been meditated. And Pharisees is 666 as well. In the article on volume one of uh, the Asiatic Researches, the serpent, or the supreme god who moved the ark in the myth of the Matsya Purana, is spoken of as Narayan, or mover of the waters, or mover upon the waters. So Narayana. The waters are called Nara since they are the offspring of uh, Nera, or Ishwara, and thence was Narayana formed because his first Ayana, or moving, was on them. From the Hindu mythology, the serpent encircling the ark, or woman, and its seven heads peering over it as it moves along the waters, and Buddha emerging from the side of a virgin, the testimony to the most blasphemous intention on the part of the workers of iniquity seems incontestable. In Persia, the stamp of the system of Nimrod, the great Iranian monarch, may also be read from the monuments against plate uh, XLIX, number 10, on his work, wherein remarks, uh, the, present situ the present subject represents Mithra, the lord of heaven, with a lion's head, symbolic of the sun, the serpent twined round his body and resting his head upon him. He holds in his hand a key, sometimes two, as having power over the entrances to heaven or hell. His wings typify his celestial character, and he stands supreme upon the earth, and in his left hand holds a scepter as king of the celestial regions. Ceramic Art, page 103. If all this be not the man of sin, spirit, soul, and body in the gra uh, grasp of the devil, what is it? In the same work, plate 1, number 7, is the copy of a gem shown, uh, showing how Satan was not satisfied with paganism, but started his system amongst the Gnostics, a nominally, a nominally Christian sect. It is, says Waring, an Abraxas amulet containing the name IAO, uh, within a serpent, the emblem of eternity, King's Gnostics, page 86. The serpent has its tail in its mouth, in the name of Jehovah, the Alpha and Omega, lies within it as uh, altered into the I and the O, which the serpent Phi denoted the three graceful emblems carried in the processions of Bacchus. Clement of Alexandria writes, And the mysteries of the dragon are an imposture. What are these mystic chests? For I must divulge things not fit for speech. A serpent, an emblem of Dionysus, Basarius, or Basarius. Dionysus was the seed of the serpent, begotten by Zeus in that form. And Mr. Br uh, Robert Brown, in his erudite work, The Great Dionysiac Myth, adds to our store of facts on this branch of the subject. In Phoenicia, again, the serpent appears connected with the sun god Iao, who is uh, identified with Dionysus. Dionysus, we shall presently see, is the same word as Janus, which is Hanesh, the serpent. And Mr. Brown also identifies Dionysus with the serpent and both of them with Iao. We shall now see that he proves that paganism identified Dionysus and the serpent with Jes, or Yes, or Aiza, in the name uh, by which the Arabian astronomers called the man-child of the sphere, in which Albumazer uh, identifies with Christ. Macrobius quotes Aristotle, Euripides, Aeschylus, and others as showing, by many arguments, 
that Apollo and Liber were one and the same god, and alludes to the use of ivy by the Lacodamians or Daemonians at the sacreds of Apollo and Bacchic Manor, and to the joint worship of Apollo and Dionysus by Boeotians at Parnassus. He then says that the sun was Liber, as Orpheus plainly lays down in this verse. The sun, whom men call Dionysus as a surname, and again, one Zeus, one Hades, one Helios, one Dionysus. The authority of which verse is founded on the oracle of Apollo, uh, Apollo Clarius, in which another name also is applied to the sun, who in the, uh, the same sacred verses amongst other names is called Iao. For Apollo Clarius, being asked which of the gods should uh, he who was called Iao be considered to be, replied thus, Much it behooves that the wise should conceal the unsearchable orgies, but if thy judgment is weak and thy knowledge is quickly exhausted, know that of gods who exist in the highest of all is Iao. He is Hades in winter, and Zeus at the coming of springtime, Helios in summer heat, and in autumn graceful Iao. The force of which uh, oracle and the signification of the deity of the name by which Liber Dionys uh, Dionysus is plainly meant, while the sun is intended by Iao, Cornelius Labes, or Labes, Labes has explained in his work uh, concerning the oracle of Apollo Clarius. In the Orphic verse, the four variant phases of the one great divinity are Zeus, Hades, Helios, and Dionysus, and in the oracle of Apollo Ciaris, Zeus, Hades, Helios, and Iao, who is thus represented as the equivalent of Dionysus. Now, if we take the initials of the four names, Hades, Zeus, Helios, and Iao, given in the verse of the oracle, they are A-Z-H-I, and red, in, uh, inverted, or what they here perhaps uh, be called processional order, by the Boustrophedon method, they are the very word Aiza, under which Albu Mazar identifies the child in the constellation with the Christian Z, uh, Jesus, or IHS, with the terminal and omissible A. It is uh, Upsilon Eta Sigma, or 608, of Martianus Capella, seen in the very same aspect of Janus Quadrophons, or Ianus, i.e. Uh, Janus, who presided over the four seasons of the year, which begin at the winter solstice, and who watched over the birth of infants. As the oracle of Apollo was a Pythonic spirit, this is an illustration of the teachings of Acts uh, 16 above its founded. It is hardly possible to imagine anything more important to a spiritual comprehension of the apocalypse than the contemplation of Revelation 1, 17 through 18, or 17 and 18. And I know of no verse in this badly treated book which has so uh, been so shape, uh, shamefully served. In the authorized version, the phrase "the living one" is not only written in ordinary type, but taken out of its true connection, translated "he that liveth." and placed at the beginning of the phrase referring to the resurrection, just as uh, if it had no further meaning. The revised version rightly translated the living one, but the small type is retained. Dr. Trigelli's, uh translation, based entirely on the ancient Greek text, where the emphatic character of certain words is maintained, a circumstance which pre uh, preserves a most important feature to the lover of the book, puts these words in large capitals, the only instance of their being used for the titles of Christ throughout, and this must be compared with the titles, the Word of God, and the King of Kings, and Lord of Lords, in small capitals, and all the rest of his titles, uh, his many titles, for it is a book of titles of Christ, are in ordinary type. Here, then, is a vital consideration. If we simply think of this book in relation to ourselves, our egotism is sure to stand in the way of our comprehending it. But if we look at uh, all scripture as testifying of Christ, we are on the road to a spiritual comprehension. Yet in the apocalypse, Christ is something different to each class of men. Thus, to the world, he is the word of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. To the seven churches, he is he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, he that walketh in the midst of the seven lampstands of gold, 
and uh, that is their upholder and their judge to each individual church, he defines his relations more nearly. But it is to John alone, the beloved disciple, privileged to lean upon the bosom of the Lord, that he is the living one. And what is that to us? It is this. The book is God's great book of judgment. No nearer relation was possible than what is here described. He gives John the reason of his judgment, one that calls for vengeance, and strengthens deeply our sympathy with him. It is a relation that every reader should aspire to. Remember, it is the very beginning of the re uh, revelation made to John. He had seen, it is true, the great king priest walking amidst the lampstands and holding the, uh, seven stars in his right hand, but now the explanation is coming. If we want to understand what this means, we must unquestionably throw ourselves back in imagination to the times in which John lived, not in AD 32, but 64 years later, and see how the servants of God understood the book. History at that time was singularly translucent, and no book of scripture nor any text in it can be fully grasped without, respect, uh, without regarding in its historical connection that being the great basis of the canon. Those were days when in the kingly, the Latin portion of the civilized world, the worship of Janus was at its height, and in the spiritual aspect, uh, or Grecian contribution to civilization, the mysteries of Dionysus were influencing the whole development of thought. And if etymology proves anything clearly, it proves that these two are the same god. For the ancient name of Janus is Dionys, surely the same word as Dionysus, or Deonaus, or Deva Nahusha, god of the serpent of India, while the former name, the interminable wordplay uh, of paganism being considered, is Ja or Daya, Sanskrit Nahash, the serpent, the living one. Now, as Dionysus was the god in whose mystical procession the phallus or life emblem was assigned a prominent place, the one whose salutation was Ten Bachi, or Io Bachi, the one who was uh, called Iao, just as ecclesiastical writers translated Ja into Iao, and just as Janus was the god who claimed the keys, so does Christ tell John that he, for the word I is emphatic, is the Ao, or Alpha and Omega, the living one, and that he is the one that became dead, and behold, he is living forever, and has the keys of death and Hades, and not the God-man serpent. Thus do I understand that if I would assimilate to myself those profound mysteries with which John was imbued, I must place myself as nearly as possible into his relations to the Lord at that time, viz. AD 96. If I fail to do this, I may indeed understand much of the book, but an approach to a complete grasp of it as a whole must remain hopeless to me while yet in the flesh, to my great loss, as I would know of it even now. So it must be with you, my reader. Here is the outset uh, of what the Lord is going to tell you and me, and it constitutes the very key to all the rest of what concerns us as workers for him. If we understand this verse, then we can apprehend more vividly the awful picture of Revelation 12 and 13, the man-serpent. Compare the thought of Revelation 1.8. There it is, God, who is Alpha and Omega, because the address is to the churches. But in addressing John, Christ is not regarded as the same comparative distance from God in their case, nor is he placed at the same distance from the apostle as from them. A study of the first five verses of the book will show what is meant by distance in this sense. The comparison is further instructive as a peculiarity in the full-length title of Jehovah therein given uh, has been noticed therein given has been noticed by commentators that the phrase who is preceding the phrase who was indicates the title uh, the Hebrew title Jah the I am that which liveth of itself in other words the living one in the instance of the Clarion Oracle, we have clear proof of the employment of initials in paganism, and as the word Aiza, so spelt out as the very name of Jesus, derived from the well-known ancient root Isa or Iso, 
it is only reasonable to suppose that this use of initials is no invention of the devil or man, but arose naturally out of the zodiacal alphabet, that the initials of the three sons of Noah correspond to the same thought, the IHS, or uh, Iota, Eta, Sigma, used by the early church to express Jesus hominum salvator, is interesting evidence none will gainsay. We have also the remarkable example of the acrostic of the Erythraean or Erythraean Sibyl, already referred to, which also goes to show the prevalence of the system. Even if the scriptures had not directly authorized us to employ initials in this way, that class of authority could not, nevertheless, be considered wanting, seeing that it is known that the letters of the zodiac spelt out words and that it has been shown that the scriptures themselves refer to us in examination and, and consequent interpretation of the celestial signs. Man, having indeed had no other Bible for about 2,500 years, creation to flood, 1656, then uh, thence to covenant with Abraham, 430, thence to Exodus, 430 years. But, fortunately, the labors of Dr. Bollinger have just produced actual scriptural uh, authority for the method of procedure. He has published a pamphlet, The Name of Jehovah, in the Book of Esther, 7 St. Paul, uh, showing, that two pairs, uh, showing that two pairs of acrostics exist in the Book of Esther, in which yad heh vav -Heh, the name Jehovah, is treated in the same way as the word Isa has been treated in the, the uh, Declaration of the Oracle. He compares it with the English word Lord, uh, to which it corresponds, in which being also composed of four letters, in his English translation, he works into a similar acrostic. The acrostics in Esther, he shows, are worked backwards as well as forwards, and this, my readers, uh, know corresponds to the backward and forward movements of the sun through the twelve signs of the zodiac. The parallel between the two is exact, for Isa is also a word of four letters, and the acrostic is formed by reading the initials in backward uh, order. The acrostics in Esther are so perfect that whereas one pair is formed by the initials of words, the other is formed by the finals. If we take the finals of Iao, Zeus, Helios, Hades, uh, we get the O, or symbol of a seed, and S, the serpent symbol, triplicated, the whole giving the blasphemous phrase, uh, phrase, Jesus, seed of the serpent. If you write them all together, they give the word Isaios, or Isaos, which according to the Greek uh, rules for contraction becomes Isus, i.e. Jesus. Another acrostic, occurring in a most important passage in scripture, gives us a hint that the system of wordplay in paganism was what was hindered at Babel and meditated by Satan in his introduction of the Antichrist, and that it comprised distortion of the name of Jesus Christ. I, heard, I refer to the great riddle of Revelation 13.18, where the acrostic of four letters, chi, o, arithmos, autoi, introductory of the chi, xi, sigma, or 666, is simply isu distorted into iosu, just as the Chi Psi Sigma is a distortion of the name of Christ, the whole being Jesus Christ distorted seven letters divided into four and three, Eso uh, Chi Psi Sigma, Eso Christ. Now the O was the Sistrum, and the SSS or Triple Sigma represented its frets, being moreover the symbol for Isis. Gerald Massey, in his Book of Beginnings, thinks the Gnostics signified 666 by the sign Sigma Sigma Sigma, and S was the initial of six in Greek and other languages. Then, Aiza being the male and Os the female, the intention of the demons who inspired the oracle will have been to represent Jesus as seed of the serpent, 666, and the initials of those two being I and O, the remarks on page 108, 9, 116, and 336 and 7 should be studied in this connection. The framework of the Apocalypse marks out the same four points in processional order, just like the IEZA, or Hades, Zeus, Helios, IAO, of Clarion Apollo. But it begins at summer instead of winter. 
When the throne is set for judgment in chapter 4, Judah, who carried the emblem of the lion, is named in that connection with Christ. The Diluvian emblem is put forward, the rainbow, and the 24 elders, 24 is a number of the ark or cube and of the letters of the Greek alphabet, are seen standing on the sea. The door has been opened. The seals are opened, as it were, under the sign Leo, summer, Revelation 4 and 5. Then a great sign is seen in heaven, the travailing woman, uh, and as shown in chapter 9, ante, the aspect of the heavens then is the great panorama held in, uh, beheld at Easter, spring, Revelation 12, 1 through 2. But the seed of the woman is born in winter, Revelation 12, 5, see chapter uh, 9. Lastly, we have the gathering of the fruits of the earth, harvest and vintage, autumn, Revelation 14 through uh, 19. The Great Pyramid of Egypt, says Mr. C. Staniland Wake, in his work on that structure, was erected not only as a tomb for its founder, but as a monumental temple in honor of the deity whose special symbol was the serpent. When the constellation Draco occupied its elevated position, it supplied the pole star of the heavens, page 79 and 80, and he shows that the building uh, was so constructed that at the time it was built, it was made to point to then uh, pole star to the then pole star in the tail of the dragon. Anglo-Israelites little know of the mischief they are promulgating, at least we must hope they are only ignorant. Uh, it is now time to try and trace out how all this terrible evil developed and how the flood was made to subserve the purpose. To understand this, we must turn to scripture and keep to proper rules of interpretation. We must ask ourselves where and with whom the trouble commenced then we ought to get truth and not mere opinion. Canaan was the man. He it was that first resisted God's ordinances proclaimed through Noah. Now Canaan is a historical character, and that very much assists the investigation. Bryant shows that the ancient name of Phoenicia was Canaan, from the founder of that people, Cana, or Canaan. And Professor Sace writes the Greek alphabet, and as the forms and the names of its letters declare, was a Phoenician gift. Tradition ascribes it to Cadmus, the ancient or eastern of Thebes, the son of Cana or Canaan. His wife, Harmonia, is the Semitic Charmon, the holy mistress of the harem, and the serpent into which he was changed is the Charon uh, or Geron uh, Ophion, Geron Ophion the serpent god of Tyre. Remember, Zar, or Sir, to Sir, uh, Zer sits at six, whose image, is a carved, whose image is carved on one of the rocks of Thera. Cadmus himself was worshipped not at Thebes only, but at Sparta as well, just as Melikertes, or Melkarth, remained uh, the deity of the Corinthian Isthmus into the historical age. The sacred emblems of the Greek divinities, the myrtle, the pomegranate, and the olive, are plants that the Phoenicians must have brought with them. The rites with which Demeter Achaea was worshipped bear a Semitic stamp, and the attributes of the Hellenic Aphrodite are really those of the Assyrian Ishtar, the Phoenician Astarte. Astarte, too, is Europa, the daughter of Phoenix, brought to the continent to which she was given a name by the bull-formed Phoenician Baal. The Babylonian prototype of the myth of Aphrodite and Adonis, the Phoenician Adonai, Lord, has been discovered. So have the Babylonian Hercules and his twelve labors in the great epic of early Chaldea. Ancient Empires of the East, page 189-190. through 190. Thus, Canaan and Cadmus, his son, are connected with this same conversion of a man into a serpent. The thing originates in Phoenicia, and that origin is adopted by the Greeks, representing the eastern half of the Fourth Empire. We shall presently see that the Latins in the western half did the precise same thing. But we must not anticipate. Let us proceed. For the man who was associated with the dragon, they provided a numerical figuration that corresponded with that of to Arnion, the lamb. Kana is the simplest way of expressing 651, the number in question, 
and which corresponds with the number of years of that majestic eclipse cycle that forms the foundation of all astronomical computation. Cadmus was said to have slain a dragon and sewn its teeth into the ground, out of which armed men grew up called Sparty or Sewn Ones, who killed each other, with the exception of five, who were the ancestors of the Thebans. Cadmus and Harmonia, his wife, were changed in the end into serpents. This slaying in mythology was never an unfriendly act. Apollo slew Python, Mercury slew Argus, Perseus slew the monster, but it never meant any harm. Faber, in his Mysteries of the Kabiri, explains that Argraphontes, the title given to Mercury, exoterically slayer of Argus, is from Arg, Ark, and Font, priest. Then, the bruiser of the serpent's head would be made to simply uh, mean simply priest of the serpent. For the word Tashufanu, or Tashufanu, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, probably the derivation of the word Typhon and Zephon, i.e. Baal Zephon, equals 666, the Phoenician deity, contains the root Phen to slay, and by metathesis this was apparently explained away into priesthood, the delusion being strengthened by the fact that a priest is a slayer of the sacrifice. The great figure in the star picture of Eudonassus, the serpent crusher, fied the two Babylons, placing his foot on the head of the great polar dragon, could thus be explained as an act of priesthood, and good thus overcome and devoured by evil. But how was it that a Canaanite took his name of Phoenician, and why did he prefer it? First, turning to scripture, we notice that it was among that people that the dreadful Nephilim and their sons, also Nephilim appeared, men of gigantic stature, those whose advent called the flood, uh, caused the flood, the Anakim were descendants of the fallen angels. What if the Phoenicians took the name of Ha-Nahash, the devil? The name is commonly derived from Fosh, Phos, uh, light, and Nek, or Nike, victory. A very good exoteric blind, as they were worshippers of the sun god. But Pho and Nike seems rather to be victory of, or perhaps initiation into, Phoe, i.e. Phi, O, and Iota. The three emblems carried in the mystic processions. The Phi was not one of the original letters, but we do not know what were the motives that brought about it, uh, this addition to the alphabet, or how long the priests had it in preparation. If this be correct, it meant victory or initiation of the dragon, the harlot, and the beast. Those three emblems seem to have had their uh, those three emblems seem to have their origin in a very common mistake about the fall. God instituted marriage before the fall and gave the injunction to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth before the fall. Yet, in spite of these plain facts, it is commonly thought that the history of the forbidden fruit is an allegory covering the secrets of the continuation of the human race. The author of Mankind, Their Origin and Destiny, takes that view and proceeds to show from the Egyptian monuments that the system of language that resulted from the pronouncing of every letter of Hebrew, which he supposes to be the original Hebrew, but which the Phoenicians appear to have introduced, or which may have arisen out of the confusion of tongues, that the first three chapters of Genesis can be read in two, explaining the, orig uh, the origin of initiation. Indeed, it would appear that as soon as this view of the traditions of the fall had become universal, it was found that real allegories would better fit the intention of the initiates, and the whole system of mythology spread the earth in lieu of the truth. He says that the first three words of Genesis 3.1 are thus you and ek, and mean now the initiator, the neck being the uh, functionary who put the initiate through the tests of his bravery, endurance, faith, and patience by buffeting him. The sha he marks like cha, pronounced in an English, uh, as in English, owing to its frequent substitution in the Chaldean by a t. The cha in modern languages has an often guttural or ka sound. In the French, it is a pure sibilant. In Spanish, it is mixed with the lingual as in English, 
In German, it is uh, half sibilant, half guttural. In Scotch and Dutch, it is more, uh, it is a pure guttural. If we commence hunek with the commonest form of a didyma, we get fenek, and the last letter may become the guttural ch, thus fenek, i.e. fenex, whence uh, w with the following numerical result, which Godfrey Higgins also points out that phoenix is six at six. Fenek is then the name of the devil, and like Yanes or Janus, it is 666. The didyma, as we have already seen, might be represented either by I, G, F, F, or PH, F, or B. Apparently, we have it in all possible ways in connection with this Ha Nahash, Hanesh, or Anesh, the man serpent. Thus, I Anesh, Janus, Ga Anesh, or G Anesh, uh, Ganesh, V Anesh, Venus, Fa or PH Anesh, Fanes, F Anesh, Faunus, B Anesh, ben, uh, Benu, and A Anesh, or with nothing, Anus. Indeed, the wordplay on this word, Anesh, the man serpent, was as extensive as that as uh, that of its counterpart, Sar, the sun seed, and both meant the cycle. Benu was the Egyptian word for phoenix, and Phene was Coptic for a cycle, or age, Greek uh, ion, or anu, anna. Pone of Genesis 41, 40 through 45 is the same word, and very likely, Pharaoh thought Joseph was an, uh, the avatar of or Phoenix, as the Abbe Rocher and Higgins suggest, certainly that he was one of twelve and had been in a pit. Jerome uses the Coptic Fene as the interpretation, and the LXX gives Penex. The wordplay seems interminable. Spelling, pronunciation, and meaning were constantly interchanged, always concealing a number, generally 666, but sometimes 360 or 365, sometimes 600 or 608, and sometimes 651. They seem never to have named a god without preparing for that name various possible derivations, and some of these numbers, sometimes they appear, uh, they appear to have resorted to a certain straining or resting of language and letters, the better to conceal the number which was confided only to the initiate. The real phoenix cycles, Higgins seems right in thinking, were 600, 608, and 666, and that the 500 and 1460 and others were mere blinds set before the masses. Janus was in Etruria, Dianus, the god of day and husband of Diana and Jana. Um, so that Dionys, Deonaush, uh, Dionys, uh, Dionysus, Dionys, and Danavas are all, uh, again, the phoenix or man serpent. Was the original word Dionys, uh, total sits at six. There are seven letters divided into three and four, say, Dia, Dia, that which liveth, and Nos, the ship, Navis. The metal referred to on um, page 330 and 331 uh, uh, represented the solar or male generative power on one side, father and son, the female on the other, the ship or mother, and so then also the ocean. Compare Clement's Revelations quoted on page 104. Nor is it uninteresting in this connection to notice that Phineos, in northern Arcadia was a temple of Demeter Eleusinia, where the same mystic ceremonies were performed as at Eleusis. The ceremonies of Phineos and Eleusis were similar, a fact of which Pausanias himself and Epopt was well qualified to judge. Brown's Great Dionysiac Myth, Volume 1, page 297 and 98. But perhaps the clearest identification of all this series of names with the devil appears from the fable of the king Deva Nahusha, or Deo Naush, related by Wilford in Volume 3 of Asiatic Researches, page 450 and, uh, through 452. For it seems impossible to doubt that Nahusha, or Nahush, is the same word, of, uh, the same word as Nahash, 
especially when we consider the subject of the fable itself. Deva Nahusha, falling in love with the Sachi, or Pulamaja, the, uh, consor the consort of Indra, became a serpent. This fable of Deva Nahusha, uh, he adds, who is always called Deo Naush in the popular dialects, is clearly the same in part with that of Dionysus. This clearly proves that Dionysus is the Divus Serpens, or Antichrist, in Dionysus Basaris, whose mysteries uh, were the most important of any, means the archite seed of God the Serpent, for Basaris is clearly the same as Uasar, or Osiris, and Ua means boat, and Uas is Thebes, or Theba, i.e. the Ark. The Phoenicians were clearly the people of the Phoenix, and Bruch, no mean authority, thinks they had this very name of Phenech, as the following passage from uh, his Egypt under the Pharaohs shows. The only allusion to foreigners, and this has nothing to do with any destruction by them, is found on the rock tablets of the 22nd year of King Ames. It runs thus, word for word, This stone was drawn by oxen, which were brought here and entrusted to the care of the foreign people of the Fenech, these Fenech, uh, or Fenech, to whom we shall uh, afterwards return, appear most clearly to be the most ancient representatives of the Phoenicians on Egyptian soil. Volume 1, page 296. The Canaanites were not all descendants of Canaan, but they followed his principles and established in Palestine what is known as the Hittite Confederacy, ten nations in federation. They were there in Abraham's time. They ought to have been turned out by the twelve tribes, but that was not done. And one of the great promises to Israel is that she shall occupy the whole land as far as the Euphrates, one-third with God's people, Egypt and Assyria, the work of his hands, and there shall be no more the Canaanite there. The people among whom the Nephilim appeared are abhorrent to God. But before God's kingdom can be established there, we know this ten-kingdom confederacy will be set upon a still grander scale than existed when God gave Abraham the land. This task is reserved for the fourth empire, for Janus, the ten-horned man-serpent. The traditions of the Romans themselves on this subject distinctly corroborate prophecy, and their boast is a connection with the very family of Jezebel, the Phoenician woman. Greke uh, Phoenicia, Phoenicia, a word whose figuration is also 666. We may be thankful that he whom Ahab called the troubler of Israel will again resist this evil system. After a reign of 34 years, Hiram died at the age of 53. His grandson, Abed Ashtoreth, was murdered by the, th uh, the sons of his nurse, the eldest of whom usurped the throne. For a while, the legitimate dynasty returned to power, but Feles, a brother of Abed Ashtoreth, was put to death by Ethbaal, the priest of Astarte, and with uh, him the line of Hiram came to an end. Ethbaal, or Ethobal, had a long and prosperous reign of thirty-two years. His daughter Jezebel married the king of Israel and attempted to break down the barrier of religion which separated that country from uh, Phoenicia. The great-grandson of Ethbaal was Pygmalion, whose sovereignty in Cyprus caused his name to be familiar in Greek story. Seven years after his accession at the age of sixteen, he murdered the regent, his uncle, Sikar Baal, a name corrupted into uh, Aerbis and Sikaeus by classical writers. His sister, Elisa, the wife of Sikar Baal, fled with other opponents of the new king, and found a home on the coast of Africa, not far from the old Phoenician settlement of uh, Itais or Utica. The site they chose was named Cartha Kadasha, the new city, a name which has been famous under the name of Carthage. Legends soon gathered round the foundress of the city. She was identified with Ditto, the title under which Astarte was worshipped as the consort of the fierce and cruel Moloch. Sace's Ancient Empires of the East... Subvoke the Phoenicians, page 191 through 193. 
it is this far from respectable origin of the latin kingdom that is the boast of virgil in his great epic the poem is written in twelve books six of which are in imitation of the style of the odyssey and six in that of the iliad rings aeneid um, notes on the seventh book this is clearly following the plan of the division of the twelve signs of the zodiac his hero's name, Aeneas, is not free from suspicion of a derivation from Ha Nahash. The sixth book has been shown by Warburton, Fellows, and others to be a disguised account of an initiation scene. In the reference uh, in it to an ancient pagan prophecy of the coming of Caesar, is probably no mere piece of flattery of Augustus than an actual fact bearing ultimate reference to the coming of Antichrist, the last great Caesar. Nor is Virgil satisfied with pointing out that the, uh, the relations between Aeneas and Ditto, the Phoenician, as the origin of the Latin kingdom. Ha Latine Basilia is 666, but he derives her monarchs from Faunus, i.e. Phoenix, or Ha Nahash, still more directly. Latinus, or Latinos, 666, long imperial sway maintained, and long in peace the hoary uh, monarch reigned, from Faunus and the fair Laurentian dame, a lovely nymph the mighty monarch came. From Picus Faunus drew his birth divine, from Saturn he, great author of the line. Rings Aeneid, Book 7, 57-62. The very alphabet of the Latins was so constructed that its total numerical value should be 666. For Dr. Milo Mahan's mystic numbers, to which I am indebted for the information, points out that the M was originally two Ds back to back, and was not among the original numerals of the language. The remaining numerical letters are DCLXVI, i.e. 666. It is furthermore remarkable that by a slight change in the order, uh, or in their order, we get DIC LUX, or DICLVX, meaning speak light. And who knows but that when the Ave Maria and Pater Noster are banished by the Antichrist, these two words may not form the commencement of the prayer to the speaking image. To sum up, from every point of view, the secret of the mystery seems to be the presentation of Satan as the serpent in the ark, which Peter compares to Christ in 1 Peter 3, 18-22, thus frustrating the atonement. It is not merely Satan's system of working through a false church, such as popery, but the very essence of it is a compromise between good and evil, the fruits of commercial latitudinarianism. True, he got into the Garden of Eden, the first paradise, but he never gets into the ark, only appears to the carnal man, to the world, to do so. He never got into the ark at the flood. The star picture represented him as hotly pursuing the ship in his efforts to do so. God would not have blessed all Noah's sons had not man at the flood begun with a perfectly clean slate. Ham was included in God's blessing after the flood. Genesis 9.1 A few centuries later, the Egyptians were parading the emblem of the serpent in the ark as if firmly believing he had succeeded. The Chaldean account of the flood, too, apparently shows that, through spiritualism, the divine patriarchal teaching had been turned into a lie. In Chaldee, the termination U corresponds to the Hebrew Im, and Elu is thus Elohim. The ancients, then forgetting God's covenant relationship as Jehovah, blasphemously reversed the teaching of the Bible, the hero of the deluge, being represented as saying in column four of the tablet, May the gods come to my altar, may Elohim not come to my altar. For he did not consider and had made a deluge, and my people he had consigned to the deep. From of old, also Elohim in his course saw the ship and uh, went Elohim into ang or in anger filled to the gods and spirits. Let not anyone come out alive, let not a man be saved from the deep. Again, in column three, we read, I built an altar on the peak of the mountain. By seven herbs I cut. At the bottom of them I placed reeds, pines, and spices. The gods collected at its burning. The gods collected at its good burning. The gods, like flies over the sacrifice, gathered. 
With Israel, Satan apparently makes the same attempt. The seventy wheats belong to Daniel's people and holy city, and not, uh, not then fully owned of God. The Ark of the Covenant is not in the sanctuary when Antichrist uh, enters it. But the world know nothing of such distinctions and have never heard of a future 70th week, for one of Satan's greatest deceptions, uh, the so-called historical interpretation of the apocalypse, has successfully obliterated the prophecies of Daniel. Neither does the world distinguish between the Church of God and the nominal Church. The former Satan never touches, the latter is presided over by his vicar upon earth at the Vatican. I emphasize the thought that the secret is an intention to bring about the worship of Satan as the serpent in the ark. The worship of the serpent in the ark is not of itself the secret. It is Satan's identification with that serpent that is the main point. It is an open question to how many of his followers that secret has ever been completely communicated. The secret lay within the mystery. It was there, no matter who knew it. To my mind, it is clearly deducible from Scripture that God restrained the mystery of lawlessness to the end that the Antichrist should not appear in times of ignorance, which he overlooked but wait for times of knowledge. Antichrist could not represent himself as God, according to the lie of Genesis 3, in days when God was out of remembrance. To the great riddle of the Sphinx, God replies with another to which the answer is similar, a man. Oedipus, uh, the slayer of his own father, is the child bruising the serpent's head, i.e. Antichrist, priest, or slayer of the dragon. Compute the number 666, or 666, and you get at the riddle covered by Satan's mystery. The Sphinx was the torturer, the guardian of the secrets of the mysteries, and the great animosity against Christians has always been with Satan's people, due to their opposition to the doctrines of the mysteries, and above all, their possession in the apocalypse of the clue to the secret. The subject could be further extended, but here I lay down my pen in the hope that enough has been said to make my point clear. Will the reader, then, consider whether the following points have been established? that the celestial signs were formed by God, that they might predict in indelible characters. Uh, A, the destruction of the earth by waters in Genesis. B, the meditorial work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels. Psalm 19, quoted in Romans 10, 18, brings this out very wonderfully. For full exposition, see A Key to the Psalms, edited by Dr. Bullinger. And C, the assumption of the kingdom of the world by him and the destruction of the earth by fire in the apocalypse. That by the use of number in, uh, as, laying as, the, as laying at the basis of physical science, an attempt was made at Babel by means of a perversion of language to hand the creation glory of God over to Satan. That that attempt was restrained by God that that restraint will shortly be completely removed when the logos of that satanic mystery, no other than a personal antichrist, will appear in unity with Satan himself and procure for both the adoration of the whole unsaved world to the eternal damnation of themselves and their worshippers. That the statements in Daniel in the epistle to the Thessalonians that this antichrist will exalt himself above everything that is called good and sit in the temple of God as God, are as completely corroborated by the evidence drawn from mythology of the purport of paganism as in the scriptural representation of those two beings in unity in the 12th and 13th chapters of Revelation as the embodiment and personification of the Fourth Empire, the one which now prevails, the so-called European concert, the outcome of the principles that it represents." That the mind of the enemy of Jehovah Jesus, as set forth in Psalm 7, was not only to tread, his, uh, tread down his own life upon the earth, but to, lay, uh, but to lay his honor in the dust, is borne out by the pythonic utterance of the clarion God, and in modern times by the less oracular statements of the theosophists, while the emblem actually placed in Hindu temples 
is a standing monument of the great conspiracy between men and demons to put upon him the greatest uh, dishonor the mind can conceive. In this day of grace we are exhorted to patience, and should the more earnestly preach the gospel of peace, seeing how near at hand the last great delusion seems to be. Let every child of God say, Hallowed be thy name. But the day will come when prayers for vengeance must go forth from the altar. So the psalmist adds, verse 6, Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. Lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies, and awake for me to the judgment of that thou hast commanded. Praise to Jah. All right, so I'm going to read Appendix D on some further developments of the geometrical philosophy. Arithmetic, or the system of counting, so enables us to generalize repetitions in geometry that we are apt to forget that any given number of equal planes are in a latter science seen by the eye, and that in it they are also localized, from which localization interesting phenomena are developed, of which arithmetic can take no account, while the sight of them in those positions gives rise to our perception of the elementary forms of beauty the primary geometrical form being the circle. It is not to be wondered that uh, wondered at that in Euclid's elements, it's, uh, it figures throughout the work. Its chief use is to express equidistance or equidistance, which not only lies at the basis of all symmetry, but determines the leading phenomena of the force or physical forces of nature. Now, these forces, as is well known, are also largely guided by laws of contact. If, therefore, we describe circles of equal size and place them in contact with one another, and regulate their number accordingly, we shall be in possession of some of the leading laws that govern the relations of geometry to the cognate sciences. Gravitation and electricity being kindred forces, we may regard the sun's passage through the heavens as if it were a galvanic battery consisting of 37 cells, or circles, each with its copper and zinc corresponding to the two forces of attraction and repulsion, joined by conductors, as in this diagram. For the ancients divided each sign of the zodiac into three parts, one to a constellation in each of the uh, three zones or regions, which is in exact accord with the passage of the eclipse through the year 36 times, or 36 times 10, already referred to. The total points dividing a line into 36 parts are 37. Every one of the above circles represents a point in the center, equidistant from all the points of contact it has with the other circles. And the point within a circle was the common representation of the sun, a symbol carried down to the present time by the Freemasons. The diagram is in the form of the hexagon, and arises in the following manner. It is a curious geometrical law that if you surround a circle of any given dimensions by other circles of the same dimensions in contact with it, these outer circles will number six, giving a total of seven. And will all be in contact with one another in the shape of the whole figure arising out of lines drawn uh, uniting their centers will be hexagonal. Equal circles in contact run in lines, hence the union of the line and the circle, or I and O, or IO, or 10. The force of electricity is measured by distance, but its essential condition is contact of two opposites, positive and negative, such as copper and zinc in an acid medium. Now, if A be the central circle, BBBB is a hexagon of seven circles having 12 points of contact, of which six are the points of contact of the outer circles with one another, and six those of the outer circles with the inner one. Then here are the leading divisions of the year, the number seven, with a bisected 12. If we joined the center of the inner circle to all the points of contact, the inner circle would be divided into exactly 12 equal compartments in strict analogy with the sun's passage through the twelve signs of the zodiac, doubtless one of the bases of that phenomenon. 
A second hexagon, CCCC, is formed in the same manner by placing another set of circles in the same dimensions around the seven first drawn. These will number 12, bringing the total number of circles up to 19, the number corresponding in years to the first eclipse cycle, the nutation cycle, the, uh, the revolution of the moon's nodes, and the metonic cycle by the principle of exclusion of fractions. The points of contact number in all 42. The third hexagon, DDDD, is formed in a similar way. 18 circles are added, which, with the last 12, give 30, the number of degrees in a sign, with the inner 6 giving 36, the number of the constellations, and, with the original circle, bring the total number of circles up to 37. We have now reached the number of points the sun traverses in its journey through the heavens, i.e. through the 36 deacons, v's 37 for there are 37 points dividing the 36 spaces. Throughout the process, there has been doubling and trebling from 6 to 12 and to 18, and there has been the same addition of 1 from 6 to 7, from 18 to 19, and from 36 to 37, all just as described in Chapter 5 with reference to the constellations and the formation of cycles of time and of the so-called mystic numbers. We have arrived then at the three hexagons in one, a trinity in unity, and the process is concluded, the central circle, moreover, being in the center of seven in every row, for A is in the center of D, C, B, A, B, C, D. Now, as there are in nature, according to Hayes' figure, the last diagram in chapter five, 24 straight lines in each circle, and the circles in all being 37, if we drew these lines, for which there is not space, there would be in the whole of our present figure just 888 lines. This number, 888, is the greatest of all cosmogonic numbers. We find God freely using it as creation, uh, at creation in Genesis 1-3, to when, by geometrical laws, he gave form to that creation. He again employs it in the account of the flood, when he renewed that same creation, and we have seen it expressed in months as representing one degree of the circle in the great period of precession of the equinoxes, the sun receding through the twelve signs, and lastly, most important of all, the Lord Jesus, in whom a renewed creation is to head up, has not disdained to adopt it as the number of his own blessed name. The curious law of contact illustrated primarily by the seven circles in the inmost hexagon is further set forth by consideration of the geometrical character of the division of that number into three and four, so frequently found in scripture and in nature. You may place in contact with each other three or four circles of equal dimensions. These are the first two numbers of circles that will yield this phenomena or phenomenon, so as to result in the construction of rectilinear homogeneous forms by straight lines uniting their centers. And these give, respectively, the equilateral triangle and the square, and are the first ones that can enclose a space. Now, the square corresponds in arithmetic to the result of the number expressed by any one of its sides multiplied by itself. The arithmetical significance of the equilateral triangle is equally clear, it contains the sum of all the numbers from one to the number expressed by any one of its sides. By bringing the baseline up to 36 circles, the total number would be 666. The baseline in the figure represents two. A combination of the two forms is obtained by translation into the solid, that is, treating the circles as spheres, we get the true form of the pyramid, four equilateral triangles upon a square. The primary form of the pyramid is, however, made up of five spheres, hence perhaps the name Pyramet. Before closing the subject, let us examine the phenomenon of the points of contact. The twelve such points of hexagon BBBB correspond in number to the signs. The 42 of CCCC correspond in months to the period of the ministration of the two witnesses, the completion of the mystery of God in Revelation 11, verses 1 through 4. 
the 90 of DDDD form the number of degrees in the quadrant, and the LCM of all three, 12, 42, and 90, is 1260, the number of days of the ministration of the two witnesses in the completion of the mystery of God, and the number of eclipses in the cycle of 325 to 6 years. The number 10, which Pythagoras, the great geometrician, thought the most perfect of numbers, will be seen to represent each of the six equilateral triangles found in the figure, e.g. alpha, beta, gamma, delta, digamma, zeta, eta, theta, iota, and so forth, on for six times, each of them containing ten circles placed in the precise form given by Pythagoras, equally divided into six and four, and into seven and three, and there being six such triangles, bringing out of the 37 circles the number 60, the standard number of the Chaldeans. 30, the number of degrees in each sign of the zodiac, arises out of the addition of the two outer rows of circles 18 and 12. Now, from the triangle formed the three circles whose centers are united by straight lines, a series may be constructed up to the hexagon in the same way. In the next figure, the square, there will be four circles, then follows the pentagon with five circles, and then finally the hexagon with seven circles. Within the three circles out of which the triangle has been constructed may be placed another circle in contact with each of these three, but it will be smaller thus. The same may be done in the case of the four circles, the junction of whose center forms the square. In this case, the inner circle will be larger than in the case of the triangle but still not yet of the same size as the outer circles. Following up the method of the pentagon, the inner circle still increases in proportionate size, but it has not yet attained the dimension of the outer circles. Thus, in the case of the hexagon, the inner circle, similarly formed, alone attains the exact dimensions of the outer circles. Thus, these four figures, the triangle, the square, the pentagon, and the hexagon, form a complete series. The investigation of their arithmetical phenomena will be found of great interest to all who love to penetrate the character of numerical design found alike in scripture, in music, and color, in archaeology, in ancient philosophy, in anatomy, and in the periodicity of vital functions, as bringing us further evidence of the geometrical character of the whole system. The first of the series, the triangle, shows a line uh, A to C divided into exactly seven parts. Each of, uh, each of these, A and B, uh, one such seventh forms the radius of the inner circle. The remaining six, B to C, making up the radius of the outer circle. The last of the series shows, similarly, the number seven divided into six and one to six outer circles in the one inner circle. Compare the fourth commandment. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, or that in, in them is, and rested the seventh day, seven divided into six and one. In the Pentagon, the line A to B, similarly drawn, is divided into twelve equal parts, of which A and B contains five, and B, C, the remaining seven. Here is the same division of twelve as found in the twelve signs of the zodiac, into seven and five. A similar line connecting the circles of the hexagon shows the great principle of bisection so often alluded to in the foregoing pages. Four in line A to C is divided in half at the point B. But it is when we come to the study of the numerical phenomena of the circle that we find the most interesting figures in the whole series. The proportions existing between B and C and A and B are of exceedingly intricate character, involving long rows of figures and thus contrastingly remarkable with the other three forms whose numerical phenomena were so strikingly simple. It will be remembered that the square is the great basis of Kepler's and Coulomb's laws and its, S uh, and its astronomical and magnetic character being thus established, it will be hardly matter of surprise that the subdivisions of the line A and C or A to C, correspond in number to the phenomena of the eclipses in their cycles. I submit the proof of this. A, B, C, and E is a square, and we know from Euclid's uh, 47th problem 
that the square of AC is equal in area to tr uh, twice the square of C and D, or C to D, and therefore of B to C. Let x equal BC and y equal AB. Then 2x squared equals x plus y squared, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, as it is impossible to resolve this equation into integers as the 10th book of Euclid demonstrates, the next method of procedure must be by experiment nor is it necessary to apologize for the step as the ancients whose system we are following found it necessary to exclude fractions. Two approximate ratios, however, offer themselves, uh, and as 29 to 12 as 70 to 29, then we get x squared equals y squared plus 2xy. Uh, Let x equal 29, y equal 12, etc. 70 and uh, x equals 70 and y equals 29. You get 841 to 840, 490, 4900 to 4901. Uh, showing an error by excess of 1 over 840. Showing an error uh, by defect of 1 over 4900. Both these errors display a fraction of infinitesimal value. Both their numerators are 1. Both their denominators are multiples of 70, and the error, uh, the one error is by excess and the other by defect. In the two ratios, the number 29 is common to them, and the series of numbers therein, uh, therein found is 12, 29, and 70. To these may be added the differences between the, so wait, 29 is the path of uh, cough, and then 70 is a n, so I don't know, it just makes me think of the moon and light and time. To these may be added the differences between the number uh, numbers in ratio, these 17 and 41 respectively, for 29 minus 12 equals 17, and 70 minus 41 equals 29. Thus, the complete series is 12, 17, 29, 41, and 70. Let us compare with these the numbers of the eclipses in the primary eclipse cycle commonly called the Saurus. The 70 eclipses that occur in that cycle are thus divided. Divide Dimbleby's uh, All Past Time in Almanac for 1882, page 38. Partial eclipses of the moon, 17, total uh, 12, uh, 29. Eclipses of the sun, 41, total 70. This is the same series, 12, 17, 29, 41, and 70. The very numbers which display the ratios, or ratio between the diagonal of a square and its side. Further, the numbers resulting from the errors in the two equations, these 840 and 4900, have a distinct uh, connection with the number of eclipses found in the larger eclipse cycles. First, the 2520 eclipses found in the cycle of 651 years are three 840s in one are the three 840s in 1 for 3 times 840 is 2520. And the bisection of that number, 1260, which is the number of eclipses in the cycle of 325 to 6 years, was shown in the previous chapter to have been divided by God into two numbers, of which 490, or the tenth of 4900, uh, was 1, the 70 times 7 of his toleration of man's hardness of heart. At the conclusion of Appendix C, it will be shown how all the homogeneous rectilinear geometrical forms have their peculiar arithmetical expression. From a series in my possession, I have noticed that only on rare and striking occasions is any number expressive of any more than one of them. The number 4900 is one of these rare instances. It is at once the square of 70 and the pyramid of the number 24, concerning with so much was written in chapter 7, uh, ante. Further, it is remarkable that, like the other numbers above cited, say 12, 17, 29, 41, and 70, it is connected with the eclipses. In the same Appendix C, it will be found an allusion to a solar, uh, solar lunar cycle of 1260 years. If such cycle be commenced at the proper place, the starting point of the great astronomic year or eclipse cycle of 651 years, it will be found to contain exactly 4,900 eclipses, 
The proof of this can be worked out from the facts given on page 59 of Mr. Dimbleby's All Past Time in Almanac for 1882. The numbers 12, 17, 29, 41, and 70, which constitute the divisions of the eclipses in the first eclipse cycle, and which arise out of the relations subsisting between the diagonal and the side of a square, further appear in connection with that marvelous mathematical phenomena, the magic square, out of uh, one of such, the sigillum solis, the central of the seven planetary seals, it will be remembered just out of the eclipse cycles, there arose the number 666. The five numbers above cited appear in the diagonals of the seven planetary seals, or uh, magic squares. The following comprise the series of seven seals, as taken from Kircher. The seal of Saturn, 492-357-816. The seal of Jupiter, 414-15-1-976-12-511-10-8-16-2-313. The seal of Mars, 1124-723-412-25-8-16-2-3-13. Seventeen five thirteen twenty one nine ten eighteen one fourteen twenty two twenty three six nineteen two and fifteen the seal of Venus twenty two forty seven sixteen forty one ten thirty five four five twenty three forty eight seventeen forty two eleven twenty nine thirty six twenty four forty nine eighteen thirty six twelve thirteen thirty one seven 25, 43, 19, 37, 38, 14, 32, 1, 26, 44, 20, 21, 39, 8, 33, 2, 27, 45, 46, 15, 40, 9, 34, 3, 28, the seal of Mercury, 8, 58, 59, 5, 4, 62, 63, 1, 49, 15, 14, 52, 53, 11, 10, 56, 41, 23, 22, 44, 45, 19, 18, 48, 32, 34, 35, 29, 28, 38, 39, 25, 40, 26, 27, 37, 36, 30, 31, 33, 17, 47, 46, 20, 21, 43, 42, 24, 9, 54, 50, or 55, 54, 12, 13, 51, 50, 16, 64, 2, 3, 61, 60, 6, 7, and 57. So if you notice, obviously, the place, the arrangement is pretty unique with regards to the, uh, how it's like one less, and obviously it would make the mathematical patterns, but it's interesting how these things, again, when you consider what he said about 666 being that sort of solar map, in a sense, 37, so the seal of the moon, 37, 78, 29, 70, 21, 62, 13, 54, 5, 6, 38, uh, 79, 30, 71, 22, 63, 14, 46, 47, 7, 39, 80, 31, 72, 23, 55, 15, 16, 48, 8, so when I see the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 right here, 40, 81, 32, 64, 24, 56, 57, 17, 49, 9, 41, 73, 33, 65, 25, 26, 58, 18, 51, 42, 74, 34, 66, 67, 27, 59. So really there's 57, 58, 59, 60, 10, 15, or 51, 2, 43, 75, 35, 36, 68, 19, 60, 11, 52, 3, 42, 75, 77, 28, 69, 20, 61, 20, uh, 12, 53, 4, and 45. The arrangement of the figures in them all, uh, in them all is this. The seven numbers, 3, 4, 5, 7, 6, or 6, 7, 8, 9, are severally squared. Uh, and then all the numbers from one up to such square are placed in such an order that the sum of the different rows, whether vertically, horizontally, or the central diagonal, is always the same. From the seven, the following table appears. The total in uh, the rows of Saturn, 45, Jupiter, 136, Mars, 325, 
the Sun, 666, Venus, 1225, Mercury, 2080, or 2080, and the Moon, 3321, totaling 7,798, the total of each row being 15, 34, 65, 111, 175, 260, and 369, and the resulting square being thus from 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, totaling 42. 7, which is the grand number expressive of geometrical completion, shows itself in the mathematical mystery of the seven stars, or days of the week, in a manner peculiarly em emphasized. First of all, the four totals, V's 42, 280, 1029, and 7798, are every one of them divisible by 7 without remainder, that is, they are all sevenfold numbers. Then, again, 42 is a number frequently appearing in Scripture. 280 is the number which, expressed in days, comprises the 40 weeks of gestation in the human race, and 1029 is just 7 times 7 times 7, the figuration of the creative words, and God said in Genesis 1, the, uh, the grand cube, on the usual threefold projection, for uh, 3 cubed of 7 times 7 times 7 is uh, 1029. The 7 magic squares are divided into 4 and 3. The 4 are formed upon the numbers 3, 5, 7, and 9, which are all odd numbers, and the 3 arise out of the numbers 4, 6, and 8, all even numbers. The 4 former have central spaces occupied by a number, the 3 latter have not. Now, the rules for the formation of magic squares turn upon the arrangements of their diagonals. A work published on the subject shows that there is one rule for the, uh, those formed upon odd numbers and another for those arising from the even numbers. In the four formed from odd numbers, the numbers formed in the central spaces, as may be seen from the foregoing diagrams, are as follows. 5, 13, 25, and 41 totaling 84, being 7 times 12. The numbers in the diagonally opposite spaces uh, added together are always exactly double the number occupying the central space. Thus, in number 7, the seal of the moon, the central space is 41. The opposite diagonals, 5 and 77, 14 and, six, 14 and 68, 23 and 59, 32 and 50, and 37 and 45. 38 and 44, 39 and 43, and 40 and 42, being all of them equal to 82, which is its double. In the three remaining magic squares, which, being formed upon even numbers, have no central space occupied by a number, the series arising out of the opposite diagonals is 17, 37, and 65, totaling 119, or 7 times 17. Adding together the opposite diagonals in all the seven seals, the series is 10, 17, 26, 37, 50, 65, and 82, totaling 287, 7 times 41, all multiples of 7. We have then three mar uh, remarkable multiples of the number 7, arising out of the above series in the diagonals of these magic squares. These are the totals 12, 17, and 41 sevens, respectively. Together, further, adding together the totals of the first two series, 12 and 17 sevens, we get 29 sevens. And adding together the totals of all three series, we arrive at the sum 70 sevens, the famous number of Daniel 9 referred to in chapter uh, 11. The whole series of sevens then runs 12, 17, 29, 41, and 70 in exact analogy with the division of the 70 eclipses and in relations subsisting between the side of a square and its diagonal. Amongst the 11 numbers in the above three series, say 5, 10, 13, 17, 25, 26, 37, 41, 50, 65, and 82, four are found in the divisions of the 70 eclipses and seven not. The four are 1725, 37, and 41. There are 17 partial eclipses in the moon, 25 central eclipses of the sun, 37 central eclipses, and 41 solar eclipses. From these four, we know how many partial and how many central eclipses there are severally of the moon and of the sun. It is worthy of note that the number 666, appearing both as a phenomenon of the magic squares and as a phenomenon of the eclipse cycle, 
the numbers of eclipses in the cycle are thus seen too. The numbers of eclipses in the cycle are thus seen to be based upon the properties of magic squares, and the whole mathematical argument regarding the number which God has himself singled out for the computation is thus brought to a focus. The Great Pyramid of Giza, that great early monument of human perversion to the adoration of the serpent, of the doctrine and science inculcated by the history of the flood, exemplifies many of the geometrical phenomena above alluded to, besides the pi proportion and others already named. If we take the cubit of 25.2, common to the Israelites, the Assyrians, and the Egyptians, and we seem fairly well entitled to do, as the probable standard measure of the early descendants of Noah, it is at least remarkable that the Great Pyramid measures in height exactly 360 such cubits. Here are the division of the circle into 360 degrees, and the 360 days of the calendar of Noah and of the old Egyptian year, signalized in the oldest of all the pyramids. Actually, I think the Djoser Pyramid is, but the following is extracted from the Pyramids and Temples of Giza, pages 220-222 by W. Flinders Petrie. 1883, the latest and probably the best work on that subject that has been written, my italics. The form and size being thus fixed in the pi proportion, the floor of the main chamber of the building, the king's chamber, was placed at the level where the vertical section of the pyramid was halved, uh, where the area of the horizontal section was half that of the base, where the diagonal from corner to corner was equal to the length of the base, and where the width of the face uh, was equal to half the diagonal of the base. The queen's chamber placed at half this height above the base and exactly in the middle of the pyramid from north to south. Note the principle of bisection. The floor of the chamber, the king's chamber, is raised above the base of the walls, a peculiar arrangement for which some reason must have existed. It gives, in fact, two heights. The wall height, which uh, we have just seen, is required for the pi proportion. He shows this to exist in the king's chamber as well as in the outline of the whole edifice, and the actual height from the floor agrees to another system, which is found to run throughout all the chambers. After the attention is uh, shown to square measure in the various levels of the pyramid, it is not surprising to find something of the same kind in the chambers. The employment of square measure, which appears to furnish the best solution of the pyramid design, is singularly parallel to the use of square measure mentioned in the Solva Sutras. From those writings, it appears that Hindu geometry in its origin sprang from the religious building of altars, differing in form but equal in area. See Professor Thabao, uh, Thabao in the Second International Congress of Orientalists. Though the idea of making the square of the lineal dimensions of a chamber to be integral areas may seem peculiar, yet the beauty of thus making all the diagonals of a chamber to be one uh, on one uniform system with its direct dimensions would be perhaps a sufficient inducement to lead the builders to its adoption. Practically, it is the only consistent and uniform theory which is applicable to all the chambers and coffers, and even to the second pyramid chamber. By this theory, then, the squares of the dimensions of the king's chamber, the antechamber, and the subterranean chamber are all even numbers of square cubits. This is not the same cubit uh, as the above mentioned, but a special pyramidal cubit of 20.62. The Egyptians seem to have employed at least two different cubits. We have analogy for this in our employment of the mile. We have both the English mile and the geographical mile, uh, and nearly all multiples of 10. From this, it necessarily follows that the squares of all the diagonals of the sides of these chambers and their cubic diagonals are likewise multiples of 10 square cubits, and the king's and queen's chambers are so arranged that the cubic diagonals are in even hundreds of square cubits, or multiples of 10 cubits squared. This number 10, the decade of Pythagoras, in the tetragrammaton formed by the rabbis out of the name of Jehovah, or yad heh vav -Heh, which Mr. Hargrave Jennings interprets into I.O., um, the phallus in Catias, or Yoni and Wienum, um, will be shown in Appendix C, 
to be the representative number of all the magic or of all magic squares. And on pages 382 through 3, the, connect, the connection between them and the ratios subsisting between the side and the diagonal of a square by means of that other celebrated so-called discovery of Pythagoras, uh, these Euclid's uh, 47, has been already demonstrated. Ten is a wonderful number, and we cannot be surprised at the worshippers of Draco requiring it for the pyramid, with its division into two fives, pyramid, so that they might get the serpent, phi, and uh, by perversion the umbilicus, o, and the phallus, i, all together into that edifice, and set forth the mysteries of the dragon, the harlot, and the beast. Ten was the original number of nations in Canaan, and Antichrist will have it back similarly divided. The Indian god Rama has ten heads, five facing to the right and five to the left. See the plate in Moore's, uh, see plate in Moore's Hindu pantheon. When he comes into his kingdom, and will use its I and O to insult him out of the letters of whose name the rabbis manufactured their tetragrammaton. Ten were the commandments on the tables within the ark, and the facts detailed on page 251 through 3, read in this connection, prove how terrible the cunning of the enemy in the wickedness of the Kabiri, referred to on page 104. The following table is interesting as bringing the points of correspondence between the 70 souls who went down with Jacob into Egypt, as detailed in Genesis 46, and the 70 eclipses of the common team to a focus the four mothers of Jacob's children corresponding to the four classes of eclipses. A. Reuben and Simeon, twelve central lunar eclipses, Levi, Judah, and Issachar, or Issachar, seventeen, partial. C. Zebulun, Gad, Asher, and Naphtali, twenty-five central solar eclipses, Joseph, Benjamin, and Dan, sixteen, partial, seventy. Further, as uh, A. A to A and B is to A um, plus B to A plus B plus C plus D within a very slight fraction, these two ratios as 12 to 29 and 29 to 70, being each of them approximately the proportions given on page 376 and 7. The eclipses in the table comprising an orderly arrangement of nature, while among the 12 sons of Jacob only one, Naphtali, is displaced from the order given in the text, for which there may be a purpose, for which there may be a purpose not yet clear to us. A and B contain together five names divided into two and three, the usual uh, subdivision of that number, and C and D together seven names divided into four and three, again the usual subdivision. Thus, in all, twelve names divided into five and seven, the usual subdivision of twelve. Dividing the twelve sons of Jacob into seven and five in the order given in Genesis 46. Uh, the division of the 70 is again 41 and 29. For Reuben and Gad, inclusive, give 41 souls, and Asher to Naphtali, inclusive of the remaining uh, 29. Again, dividing these same 12 sons of Jacob into 5 and 7, in the same order of this text, the division of the 70 is once more exactly 29 and 41. For Reuben to Issachar, or Issachar, inclusive of number 29 souls, and Zebulun to Naphtali, the remaining 41. Thus, God has selected, for an all-wise reason, the approximation as 41 to 29 to express the relations between the diagonal and the side of a square. There are many other such subdivisions of the 70 souls agreeing with similar ones in the 70 eclipses, but the above may suffice to thoroughly establish the grand truth that the whole plan of Scripture regarding Israel beginning at Moses is in accord with that wonderful part of the plan of creation. So far as regards astronomy, the division of Lay's uh, 33 descendants corresponds equally plainly to the division of 33 bones in the spine of the infant, see page 218 through 20, which is the basis of all anatomy. Simeon, seven cervical bones, Levi and Judah, twelve dorsal, Reuben, five lumbar, Issachar, five sacral, and Zebulon, uh, four cockageal, totaling thirty-three, the upper and lower spine. The series of approximations of AB to BC in the second diagram on page 376 runs 1, 2, 5, uh, 12, 29, 70, and 169, 
and 2, 5, 12, 29, 70, 169, and 408, and so on to infinity. To continue the series, double the lower figure and add the uh, upper figure. Set down the results as the following lower figure. Uh, set down the last lower figure for the following upper figure. It is of deep interest to note the frequency of the occurrence of this proportion in the pi proportion in God's word and in his providential dealings with man as both relate to infinity and are therefore emblematic of his eternal Godhead and unapproachable perfections. Surely it is clear then from all this that, uh, that though modern philosophy with its appliances of history and scientific discovery may be great, the wisdom of the Egyptians was far greater, while immeasurably greater than either is that inculcated by the facts related in the Pentateuch, and the much despised cosmogony of Moses, which treats even the great discovery of Pythagoras, upon which which treats even the great discovery of Pythagoras, upon which trigonometry depends, and with it Huh, and then so Moses being 345, it's also the 3, 4, and 5 ratio, or Moshe in Hebrew. Who would have thought that the figures given in Genesis and further elaborated in Daniel and the Apocalypse even trench upon the domain of ratios incommensurable to man, such as that between the radius and circumference of a circle and the side and diagonal of a square? But what of Israel's Messiah? The crucifixion occupied six hours exactly bisected at noon precisely when the sun was darkened. The Lord spoke seven times, three times before noon and four times after noon, uh, seven divided into three and four as usual. If the very hairs of our head are all numbered, how precious to the Father the forty-one words then uttered by him who delighted to do his will. Note their number in subdivisions. First utterance, Luke 23, uh, Verse 34 contains eight words. Second, John 19, verse 26, nine words. Third, Luke 23, uh, verse 34, ten words. Fourth, Matthew uh, 27, verse 46, and Mark 15, verse 34, four. Fifth, John uh, 19, verse 28, one. Sixth, John uh, 19, verse 30, one. And seventh, Luke 23, verse 21, or in seventh, Luke 23, verse uh, 46, 8, totaling 41 words. Working out these figures on the same principle as set forth in the eclipses, explained in the table on page 235, only the extremes make a pair. We set then the first and seventh, eight words each, 16 words, the second and sixth, inclusive, 9 plus 10 plus 4 plus 1 plus 1, 25, totaling 41 words. Compare the partial solar eclipse 16 and central 25, totaling 41 solar eclipses. How God suits facts in his works to the words of scripture. It is, it is as easy for him to do this as to write in poetry. God cannot lie, cannot change, cannot do anything by accident, or do anything imperfect or wanting in beauty. But what a thought. The sun of righteousness eclipsed during that awful hour when he became a curse for us. Galatians 3, verse 13. The faithful witness in the sky, Psalms 88 and 89, darkened to mark the event. Ah, uh, indeed, paganism may worship its sun god and speak of its crucified sun seed man immersed in the waters of the great abyss of Abaddon. But Jehovah, the eternal unchanging one, declared his faithfulness even in the lowest pits, in the dark places, in the deeps, cf. Roman, uh, Romans 10, 7, and established it in the very heavens. An evil generation murdered the son of David, but God will not lie unto him, but send Elijah the prophet, and unto those that fear his name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Appendix E of evidence of design in the composition of the number 666 or 666 and its relation to the number 2520 or 2520. The philosophy of Tao Tse or instruction by reasoning, which we have seen Zadkiel has connected with the number 666, enunciates the following as its leading principle. Out of one, so I guess he's meaning Lao Tzu, uh, out of one proceed two, out of two proceed three, and out of three proceed all things. 
It starts with number as the great basis of all creation and makes two in one and three in one contain the germ of all nature. It would seem more correct to insert out of three proceed seven and out of seven proceed all things, but possibly seven was looked upon as the representation of all things being the number expressive of geometrical completion. I find that throughout the whole geometrical system of number shown us alike in scripture, in nature, and in paganism, certain leading principles develop themselves. One, there is a principle of bisection and reduplication constantly running through it. Thus, six is the bisection of twelve in the twelve signs, clearly marked out in the hemisphere, or twelve is reduplicated as in the twenty-four lot or twelve is reduplicated as in the twenty-four lines in the circle divided into twelve parts. Two, there is the addition of one to form links in a chain formed upon any one number, in the place of the use of fractions, other than half, one third, one fourth, or one tenth. As a writer to this, we have what is known as inclusive or oriental reckoning, which often, though not always, involves the addition of two instead of one to the original number. Three, there is the principle of trisection and triplication by which a trinity and unity is evolved. Four, there's the elimination of tens, hundreds, and thousands. The ancients added together the digits of numbers by which some curious results were obtained. Thus, 666 could be reckoned as 6 plus 6 plus 6, i.e. 18. And in the evolution of the eclipses from their cycles, we have seen how 666 eclipses arise out of the cycles whose basis is the number 18. 5. There is the principle of squaring and cubing. 6. There is another principle of subdivision found in nearly all of these numbers, and most prominently marked in the larger and more important numbers, to which, as I have seen no allusion to it in any previous works on this subject, I must give a name, and I will call, I will call it its harmonious break. I must explain myself by examples. Seven breaks harmoniously into three and four. Twelve breaks harmoniously into seven and five. Ten has two harmonious breaks. The commonest is into six and four, but seven and three is also found. Twelve sixty or one thousand two hundred and sixty has also two these 770 and 490, and 666, or 666, and 594, 594, of both of which are given, or examples are given in chapter 6. I propose, therefore, as a help to the student towards the distinction of solutions of the number 666, that are the mere result of either accident or the ingenuity of men unversed in the system of mystic or geometrical numeration, from those which have a real bearing upon the subject in hand, that he may put them to the test and see if they are based upon the above principles, particularly in reference to that most rigid test of all, the harmonious break. Take Zadkiel Tau Se. Uh, it is a three in one, but it has 13 letters, and its break is into 80, 371, and, two, and 215. I have therefore found either in scripture or in nature any such I have nowhere found either in scripture or in nature any such break. To my mind it is therefore meaningless. Now contrast Nero Caesar or Neron Kaiser, there are seven letters harmoniously broken into four and three. The two divisions three hundred and six and three hundred and sixty are both astronomical and both composed of the same three digits, the O, the three, and the six. I turn to the scripture, and lo, I find Sekem ben Hamor, the name of the man who is the great type of the last seducer, is also 666, divided into 360 and 306. I perceive evidence of design, and that the figuration of Nero's name accords with the whole character of the system. I incline, therefore, to the belief that this is one of the solutions which has a real bearing on the subject of Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. I have seen more harmonious breaks in this number than in any other, viz. four primary and two secondary breaks, and all are to be found in Scripture. The primary breaks are 
1. The break into 600, 58, and 8. 2. 600, 60, and 6. 3. 555 and 111. 4. 360 and 306. These again may be classified. The first two consist of a number of three digits, one of two digits, and one of one. Uh, the last two are not a division into three, but into figures, and these two figures have three digits each. The two derivative or secondary forms of harmonious breaks to this number are based upon the first two, by which the three figures are reduced to, uh, to two. Five, the break into 608 and 58, and 60 and 66. Of number one, we have in scripture the 600 years of Noah's age added to the figuration of his name, 58 and the number of persons that entered the ark. In conjunction with this comes the fifth form of break, found in the association of the figurations of Ham as 608 and Noah 58, the Greek Hanu, the Greek Hanaeus, uh, the ship, we have seen divided in uh, the same way, and most curiously associated at once with Noah and his sons, i.e. Ne, or Naha, and Yes, or uh, Upsilon, Eta, Sigma, um, the monogram of pretty much the Jesuits, I believe. And with Ha-Nahash, the serpent, making apparently the very name of G uh, Janus, the god of the ship, Janus, or Janus, Janus. Of number two, the instance is given in Revelation 13, Chai, Zai, and Sigma. In paganism, the word fenek, or phenek, phoenix, breaks into 660 and 600 for vav, 60, ene, uh, for vav, 6, ene, 60, and ke, or chai, uh, 60, or 600, and chai, 600. Of number three, we have the word ipusia, uh, wealth, given in Acts 19, verse 25, in connection with paganism. There are seven letters divided into four and three, for the first four amount to 555, and the last three to 111. Uh, the sons of Cush are divided off in scripture into five and one. Nimrod, the great type of Antichrist, being the one separated off from the five. Then paganism gives us amun Re, two words comprising seven letters, of which the first three are 111, and the last four are 500, and the last four are 555. Also, Amonif, six letters in Greek, bisected into two threes, the first three letters being 111, and the last three being 555. Another most remarkable word is worth mentioning in this connection. It is the Latin name Ludovicus. It is rare for a Latin word to be made up uh, almost entirely of numerical letters, and this, with the exception of the O and the S, are found in paganism to represent severally the sun seed and the sistrum, and the serpent divides exactly seven Latin numerical letters into three and four, the first three amounting to 555 and the four, and the last four to 111. Of number three, we have in scripture the case of Sekem ben Hamor, just referred to. Then we have in paganism the name Canubis, again seven letters divided uh, into three and four, the first three being 360 times two, the last four, 306 times two, and the total, 666 times two. So you could think of that as like the double-headed beast also, the double-headed serpent, or the double serpent. There is uh, the instance of Nero Caesar just mentioned. Oh, and the double serpent, I'll get, again, I'm putting it off, but I'll get into the various things about the serpent and the tables of the Cabal of Nine Chambers but rattlesnake and cobra is 666, which are like the primary snakes, I guess you could say, of the East and the West. There is the instance of Nero Caesar just mentioned, and there is the word uh, Napoleos, Napoleosi, Napoleo, I can't really see what that letter is, but uh, consisting of 10 letters harmoniously broken into seven and three, the first seven being 306 and the last three amounting to 360. Should the final bearer of the number 666 be a man of the name of Louis Napoleon, uh, at, or Louis Napoleon, 
As it is at least possible he may be, the combination would be most remarkable, as he would represent with the former name in Latin and the latter in Greek the two divisions of the last great empire, to which indeed the first Napoleon aspired. Hmm. See the great see the great prophecies by G. H. Pember, and would show the great uh, and would show the number representing both the nominative case and the dative or inscriptive dedicatory case, both words being full of evidence of design. These harmonies, however, cannot establish who the Antichrist actually will be. He will only be known by the fulfillment of the scriptures regarding him, exactly as was the case regarding Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah of the Jews. But no harm whatever ought to arise from a statement of these facts regarding the Napoleon family, when coupled with a caution that they cannot of themselves in any way prove that the Antichrist will be a Napoleon. As all efforts to predict who the Antichrist will be are of necessity presumptuous, I appeal to the candor of my readers neither to fix upon me any charge of turning prophet, nor to make any unfair use of my words in support of predictions. Lastly, there is the word Saras, the first three letters of which amount to 360 and the last two to 306, totaling 666. But perhaps the most important of, uh, of all the properties of this number, 666, is the fact that it is a dominant number in all the three homogeneous forms. In chapter 4, we found it in The Circle, the sun's passage through the twelve signs of the zodiac. In chapter 5, it appears in The Square in the form of the sigillum solus, or four-square projection of the heavens, the quadrature of said circle, and in chapter 7 we saw it in the form of the equilateral triangle. The shape which Professor Hay associates with the median of the musical scale occupying a middle or mediatory position between the circle and the square. The number 666 is the tenth in a continuous series of twelve breaks, each into two numbers, from 1 up to 2,520. 666 or 666. 666 or 666 has been shown to be the magic square of 6. 10, which is the decade of Pythagoras and the tetragrammaton of the rabbis, is the magic square of 2, and thus the representative number of all magic squares, whence possibly the division of the Hebrew alphabet into 10s. These breaks I have not invented. I could not have invented them. I found them in nature and in scripture. The arrangement I'm about to tabulate, I did not invent. I found it. And every one of these breaks will be seen to be exemplified in the body of this work. So 3, 5, and 4, 12, 2520, the number of the hexagon or seven circles, i.e., 7 times 360 is bisected, giving 1,260. 1,260 breaks harmoniously into 666 and 594. 666 breaks into 360 and 306. In 360, the number of the degrees in the circle and the angles of the square is bisected, giving 180. 180, the number of the degrees in the semicircle, and in the angles of the triangle breaks harmoniously into the well-known pi proportion, or relation between the diameter and said semicircle, say, 70 and 110. 70 breaks harmoniously into 33 and 37, 33 into 19 and 14, 19 into 12 and 7. 12, the number of signs in the zodiac, breaks harmoniously into 7 and 5, 7 into 3 and 4, and 3 into 2 and 1, and 2 bisected gives 1. The above division is as natural as its evolution is continuous. Bisections mark the beginning, middle, and end. The remainder are harmonious breaks. The whole is a trinity in unity marked by the signs of the zodiac, the number 12, the year, the number 360, and the week of years, the number 2520. Its bisections are three, which read inversely are reduplications and give the cube in the number eight, i.e. two cubed. In the astronomical period of 2520 years or 2520 years mentioned by Mr. Guinness is not only seven 360s, but eight 315s, 315 years being a solar lunar cycle, 
so exact that its error is only three hours, and whose epact comprises the remarkable period of 7 times 7 times 70 days. The evolution of the number 12 from the series in arithmetical progression 3, 4, and 5 has already been pointed out, and the position in which those three numbers are found here is a harmonious one, as the central set of 5 is so placed as to divide the remaining 7 according to the harmonious break of that number into 3 and 4. Thus, indeed, out of 1 proceed 2, and out of 2 proceed 3, and out of 3 proceed all things. Much more could be said about the beauty of this arrangement, but the discernment of this I leave to the student. Suffice it to notice that 666 is the tenth in the series. We are living in a commercial age, and some countries are even now using the 360-day year, which was revived at the French Revolution. Holland, for instance, treats the year as regards bills of exchange in consisting of 12 months each 30 days. In seven years is the usual term of partnership covenants. It appears from what we are told of the Epha of Zechariah, chapter 5, the emblem of commerce and agriculture, that this will be the nature of Antichrist's contract with the Jews, the cleverest and most covetous merchants on the earth. How strange that the hexagon should be the form of the cell in which the bee, the logos, Debar, is developed, that she uses the pyramid and a trinity in unity for the bestowal of generative power on the neuter insect. If the Antichrist should turn out to be a Napoleon, the coincidence would be most remarkable, as the bee is one of the emblems of that family, the Great Prophecies by G. H. Pember. The pagan name Baal Barith means, according to Hislop, Lord of the Covenant. No blasphemy ever surpassed that of Napoleon. At a feat uh, given by the city of Paris to the emperor, the, the repertory of inscriptions being exhausted, a brilliant device was retorted, or resorted to. Over the throne which he was to occupy were placed in letters of gold the following words from the Holy Scriptures, I am that I am and no one seemed to be scandalized. Madame de Remusat, Memoirs, Volume 1, page 336, quoted in The Great Prophecies, page 164. It is this very assumption of the title of Yah on the part of the Logos of paganism that formed the subject of chapter 12, as the reader will recollect. It is not generally known that God has actually determined a period of 2,520 years as the term of his dealings with the Gentiles, or man as man, outside the law and the gospel, that is, without the Bible. Thus, from creation to the flood, 1656 years, or 1,656 years, from the flood to the Exodus year, 860, allow for the change in the calendar, commencing the year in spring instead of autumn, interval from uh, giving of the law to its passing away at the completion of the mission of the two witnesses with the result of the, the ejection of Satan from heaven and uh, period of manifestation of the Antichrist, the restraint being withdrawn and human ministration of the gospel ceasing three and a half or 2,520 years. Thus we see how perfect is the threefold scheme of the Lord God and the three covenants. Their several economies do not follow one another but form a compact whole. The Jewish dispensation is contained within the Gentile, filling up is uh, in the offer of their Messiah, the great gap in the presentment of Christ as the seed of the woman. From Pharaoh to Antichrist, the church dispensation, wherein Christ is the head and we are the body, in its turn fills up a similar gap. The offer of Jewish Messiah or deliverer being for that time withdrawn. The above 2,520 years and the 490 years or 70 hebdomads of Daniel uh, 9.27 are thus conterminous. Indeed, this number, 2,520, apparently the most perfect of numbers, seems to be equally perfect in its manifestations in the cognate science of astronomy. A further instance of its employment is that mentioned by Mr. Gruton Guinness in his approaching uh, end of the age. The most perfect solar lunar cycle known is that of the three, uh, 33 year, 7 minute, 7 day, and 75 of these cycles are 2,520 years, thus equal to 8 of the cycles of 315 years. 
Our interest in this fact is heightened when we consider that 33Y, 7M, 7D comprises Mr. Uh, Guinness gives the calculation in extenso, the earthly lifetime of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this very number, 75, is placed by the prophet Daniel in connection with this very number, 2520, as comprising the days added in chapter 12 to the 1260 days, or half of the hebdomad of 2520 days. It may not be amiss at this point to show how God has blessed number as expressed in geometrical form, and how he sums it all up in that grand number emblematic of perfection intensified, 2,520. For the week of years, or the sun's passage through 2,520 degrees of the zodiac, divided into two halves, i.e. twice 1,260 degrees, is the period of the offer of the kingdom to the Jews by the Lord Jesus Christ, and their acceptance of it under the ministration of the two witnesses. I can best illustrate my meaning by means of marbles or globes of any kind, the globe being the primary form of a solid body, i.e. the circle translated from the plane to the solid. If the reader will collect a few marbles, he will see how the number 2520 is the sum of the leading geometrical forms. Three marbles placed together form the first triangle. Therefore, three is the representative number of the triangle. Four marbles placed together form the first square. Therefore, four is the representative number of the square. Five marbles placed together form the first pyramid. Therefore, five is the representative number of the pyramid. Seven marbles placed together form the first hexagon. Therefore, seven is the representative number of the hexagon. Eight marbles placed together form the first cube. Therefore, eight is the representative number of the cube. There are altogether seven homogeneous geometrical forms, the circle, the triangle, the square, and the hexagon in the plane, and the globe, the pyramid, and the cube in the solid. Thus, four in the plane and three in the solid. The pyramid is not strictly homogeneous, but it is compounded of forms that are homogeneous in, this, in the plane. The dodecagon and the like are mere derivatives of the hexagon. It will be noticed that six is missing, that being the number of the oblong parallelogram, which is not homogeneous. Now, the least common multiple of 3, 4, 5, 7, and 8, i.e. of the triangle, the square, the pyramid, the hexagon, and the cube, is 840, which, on the usual threefold projection, is 2520, the number of the seven circles, 7 times 360, or grand hexagon. The adaptation of this number, 2520, to divine purposes is unique, being the product of the four members emblematic of perfection, 10, 3, 12, and 7. God has aptly apportioned these factors to his grand divisions of time. The reader will remember how the eclipses, whose grand cycle of 651 years, the grand astronomic year, contains 2,520 of them divided into twice 1260. Divide the month of 30 days into three decades. Thus, there are 10 days to the decade, three decades to the month, 12 months to the year, and seven years to the week of years, giving respectively all the factors of the number 2,520, say 10, 3, 12, and 7, marked out in unerring order by the eclipses in their cycles. On the year and day principle, there are seven days of creation, and embody the divine ordinance of the week, whose great significance comes out directly when we see that giving a year for a day, it constitutes the exact period of the establishment of creation under the headship of Christ, who upholds all things by the word of his power, who in the beginning laid the foundations of the heaven and the earth, and whose feet are all things put in subjection. Hebrews chapter 1. And how in accordance with this law of the universe, modern philosophers are fond of this word, law, let them know that then that Christ is law, is the fact that when the uh, Spirit uh, of God was brooding upon the waters, it was decreed by him, the living one, that the great typical periods to which the origin of life is appointed in man, birds, beasts, and fishes should, as measured by days, the great units of time, 
be the exact aliquot parts of this same number, 2,520. Tell us, then, ye stargazers, ye recorders of eclipses, ye chemists and physiologists, who strain at the gnat of the resurrection, for uh, which ye have a positive witness, and swallow the camel of modern geology, for which witness is impossible. Did Moses, Daniel, the four evangelists, and John wait for your observations through the telescope and microscope to enable them to hand down to us the periods and periodicities which they record? Just as it resulted from careful and learned investigations into the numerous books of the law and the hagiographa, that a chain was formed showing a wonderful harmony of geometrical numbers in the Gentile and Jewish dispensations. The compilers of those facts, not having uh, before them any intention to produce any such harmonious results, but simply to declare what God has said in his word. So here a precisely similar work has been brought to bear upon the four gospels, without the Christians who were engaged on it having the slightest idea that they were establishing the fact that the joint ministrations of Jesus the Messiah and the two witnesses would occupy a wondrous week of years, the symbol of the hexagon, as it were the work of the bee, or debar, when the sun passes through twice uh, 1,260 degrees of the zodiac, or circle, in exact analogy with the divisions of the eclipses. And it may be as well to point out that there, uh, that whereas the infidel attack on scripture, to which Niebuhr uh, so largely contributed, formerly embraced the proof of design through figures in order to demonstrate collusion, starting from a petitio principii of alleged impossibility of miracle in the face of that miracle acknowledged of sensible men, the creation, they were compelled to abandon that position and their latest efforts are in the direction known as the higher criticism. But they are now driven back to admit design uh, that there is no remedy left to an honest mind but to see that the design that runs through the figures of God's word, embracing almost every writer from Moses to the Apostle John, a period about twice as long as that between the reigns of William the Conqueror and Her Most Gracious Majesty, could have been arranged by no other being than the one who arranged the order of the eclipses. Two, giving a year for a day, there are results, one week of years, for the completion of the mystery of God evangelized to the prophets, the implanting the kingdom in the Jewish nation through the mission of Jesus and his two witnesses. Three, giving a year for a day again, there are results, one week of years, uh, of years, 2,520 years, for the world's trial under its own wisdom i.e. without the Bible, 2,516 and a half years from creation to the Exodus, and three and a half years of angelic preaching during the time of Antichrist's manifestation. The End